Good morning. A few people are walking into the room. I would encourage anyone to come to the front of the room. We could make it a little bit more on team. Good morning. Well, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and a welcome to this plenary session on women, climate, agriculture, and food security. 
I'm delighted to be the moderator of this morning's session. By way of background, my name is Eleanor Tabby Huller-Jordan. I'm the president and CEO of the Paradigm Forum, which is a global think tank and consultancy that works at the intersection of social justice and innovation. So today's event is very much in line with the kind of work that we look at, which is how do you ensure equity of access and opportunity and use that equity of access and opportunity to draw new ways of working, new ways of being, both in the public and the private sectors. This morning's session is going to explore three very interesting permutations on agriculture and food security. The first two are really tied to what I call gender differentiated impacts, not only on and as they're related to climate variability and change, but also the ability to access, engage with, and understand weather and climate information. So we will have two very specific areas of focus this morning. Successfully addressing these, however, is critically tied to creating more inclusiveness around training, decision making, and so forth. So as much as we will focus today on these critical challenges, as they are applied and related to gender differentiated impacts, we also want to spend a great deal of time trying to address what are potential solutions in this same space. One of the reasons why I think these questions are so critical is that by most, most estimates, women are represented at the global level in food production or agriculture between 50 and 70 percent. So clearly addressing these gender impacts is of critical importance if we do believe, as I do believe everyone here has confirmed, that there is critical alignment between considerations of social equity and environmental sustainability. On that note then, I think one of the interesting issues that we will have to address is um, the concern around access to this information. And a critical question I would want to pose is do we believe we have the technical capacity and competency to provide on a timely basis the necessary information and furthermore, is there an adequate level of awareness of that information and the ability to access it at a local level? So these are critical challenges for us today, and I'm joined by a very esteemed panel to help us grapple with these challenges, and as I said, not only get a more granular sense of what those challenges are, but create a bias around execution and intervention in the solution space. So let me very uh, briefly introduce my esteemed panelists, and apologies in advance for not probably doing full justice to your incredible range of experience and so forth. Um, to my left is Dr. Evelyn Nagluleka, a veterinary doctor by profession who obtained her education from the University of Zambia. And she also holds an international diploma in poultry husbandry from the IPB Varneveld of the Netherlands. She practices and offers services in poultry disease diagnosis, treatment, and control. She is also a small-scale farmer, and she raises poultry and goats and other farming activities. She has also served as the first vice president and director of commodities on the Zambia National Farmers Union Board. She is a current president of the Zambia National Farmers Union and is the acting president of the World Farmers Organization. Welcome, Evelyn. Next to Evelyn is Ms. Shangdun Yao, who holds a BA in Agricultural Engineering from the China Agricultural University, Beijing, and an MPA from the China University of Political Science and Law, also in Beijing. Ms. Yao started her career as Director of the Institute of Energy and Environmental Protection at the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Engineering, where she worked from 1998 to 2004. Before her appointment to FAO, Ms. Yao was Deputy Director General, Department of International Cooperation at the Ministry of Agriculture in China. And she is currently Director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. To my right, Dr. Federica Rossi is a Senior Researcher at the Italian National Research Council 
Institute of Biometeorology, where she's leading the team on micrometeorology, ecophysiology and productivity of natural and agricultural systems. She's been an active member of the WMO Commission of Agricultural Meteorology of, for many years. She was an expert team leader and chair of several focus areas of the commission. She's currently VP of the WMO Commission for Agricultural Meteorology, where she was reelected this past year. She is currently engaged with several climate smart agriculture projects. Dr. Rossi represents Italy in the International Society of Horticultural Science, a member of the editorial board of the Ital Italian Journal of Agrometeorology, web editor, and founding member of the International Society of Agrometeorology. And Gib Bulach, to um, Dr. Rossi's right, founder and global managing director of Accenture Development Partnerships, which is a corporate social enterprise hosted within Accenture. Since 2003, ADP has brought Accenture's business and technology expertise to the international development sector on a not-for-profit basis and has championed the concept of cross-sector convergence. I'm sure we'll hear more. ADP has gained recognition as a pioneering new business model through various prestigious awards and is featured in an INSEAD MBA teaching case on social innovation. Gibb is a regular blogger and speaker on the role of business and development, cross-sectoral partnerships convergence, and has played a key role in promoting the emerging concept of social entrepreneurship. In 2008, he was named as the Sunday Times Sponsored Management Consultant of the Year in the Best Partner Director category. Congratulations. Excellent. Um, the format of this session is such. Um, clearly, I would like to pose some very targeted questions to each of our panelists, but please rest assured that we will be turning to all of you for supplementary questions, examples, and so on. I was reminded this morning of how powerful individual stories can be as well in terms of our own experiential frame of reference. Um, so I'm looking forward to a lively and uh, most likely provocative discussion. Um, let me begin then, Evelyn, with a question to you. Um, as a woman farmer, I think you bring some very unique perspectives to this issue. Can you give us some information in terms of how you very concretely obtain um, weather and climate information in Zambia? And what, um, from your standpoint, are the most critical success factors tied to your ability to access that information? Thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege to be here. And yes, being a, a farmer in Zambia, I will give how I get my information and probably give you a little bit of insight of how somebody else who's not Evelyn would get information about weather. I get information about weather through mainly uh, two sources, and that will be the news bulletin. And I can't see our metrologist, but she's supposed to be seated somewhere here. It is broadcasted mainly at about 19.30 after the main uh, news service. And I was chatting with her actually uh, a few days ago, and I was asking her, have you ever considered where Evelyn is when you are giving that information? Because at that time, if you visited Zambia, as an African, I am in the kitchen. I'm preparing food. So most of the time, I will miss that part of the news. I will not get the news. So I will get it from somebody who has heard the news. But I'm more privileged because I'm a member of the Zambia National Farmers Union. That means, apart from the news that I get nationally from our news forecaster, the farmers organization makes sure that I get the news through my phone through my email and uh, through what we, uh, we have put together as a farmers union because we have found it necessary for our members to access that information. So it might not be a blanket uh, kind of information that everybody will get, but I'm more privileged, I think, being a member of the farmers union and secondly, being literate, that I can be able to read my emails I can be able to access my phone and be able to get information. So um, I can tune in into the radio and get information also about weather. 
but most of the time it will tell me most likely, yeah, the season this year is going to be normal to abnormal. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me as a farmer. <laughs> so so that, that's, yeah, that's the kind of information that I will get from any meteorological uh, station. It will be normal or not normal. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. No, and, and I think your point, I mean, there's information and there's information, as you said. Yeah. Um, Jun, I'd like to build on that because through your work of the FAO, um, how would you either build on Evelyn's example or give um, a different perspective on how you access and leverage um, climate and weather-related information? Um, okay, good. Uh, very uh, interesting uh, question. So to me, I mean, uh, in short, I think women have uh, less access to information and the knowledge. Uh, actually, they, they should be uh, empowered with the more capacity and also more accessibility to all this knowledge than even the men, because in the rural areas and also for the agricultural production, as you said, our 50% of the agricultural labor forces are female. So they play a very critical role for the food security and also the rural poverty. But they are not empowered with the same capacity and the same possibility as a man to all these accesses. And also talking about the access to information and knowledge, I should say that there are more accesses relevant with this specific uh, access. For example, if women does not, do not have the same and equal uh, power to make decisions for family and for the, for the local community, then how they can have the tools to, to, to all this I mean, information and knowledge. I, I can take the mobile as example, as <laughs> my colleague said that. If a woman at home does not have the decision right to say, I need a mobile phone. But instead, only the, the man, the husband, have a mobile phone, but the wife does not have a mobile phone. Then even the information is there. She does not have the, the devices for this knowledge and information. And also, the basic education is also very essential. And even the information is there, but if they cannot understand, all this information, then how they can use them effectively. So, so to me, I mean, it is very fundamental to have women very much engaged in the decision making and the policy making at all the level, even at home. And uh, for FAO, we have done a lot of survey and also done, done a lot of uh, normative work and also field activity on this. I think I want to also to highlight the importance of agriculture extension system. So we, FAO, did a survey in about 95 countries. It shows that only 5% of the extension services were directed to women. And only, more importantly, only 15% of the extension staff are female. So this can tell the differences I mean, on, on, on all these things. And also the right to tenure is also very essential. And also the right to, to the credit is also essential, also relevant with the access to the information on weather and the climate services. Yeah, thank and you. Something that you're both bringing up that I think is critically important is access to relevance of engagement with these different categories of information, you have to start from a premise of empowerment. Because at the end of the day, this then is, is sort of a cosmetic consideration unless there's you know, core empowerment vis-a-vis -vis at least the element of choice. Um, and Federica, I'd love to, to build on that. In terms of what you've heard from Chen Chun and, and Evelyn, are there opportunities for enhancement in your mind? I mean, how can we be as practical as possible and pragmatic as possible in terms of what is required to make a step change improvement in the quality of an access to 
this weather and climate related information. In your experience, are there any any promising developments in that? Uh, yes, I hope there are promising development, but I think that this development must come necessarily from the contribution of all of us and also of the half part of the world population that are female, that so far are the weakest voice. In fact, I think that we are dealing with a very complex problem and we are in a puzzle. As Laura said yesterday, we all own a part of a puzzle. So all of us should do our part, the part that we are able to. So from our uh, scientists and academia and research point of view, we are in charge to develop uh, products and tools that are uh, science-based, but they, are, they can be translated to become operational so really useful uh, to be translated. And uh, this is up to a part of the community. Another part of the community, so uh, services and extension and um, farmers association should modulate, take this product and modulate and tailor them to the local needs. And then uh, local extension and uh, even uh, um, farmer consultant, uh, but first policy uh, and the local authority should help to facilitate uh, the adoption because sometimes it's not easy mm, to make some example to have access to help to uh, insurance uh, to some aid that can support uh, the adoption of certain technique uh, uh, and also is up to farmers uh, to open the mind and try to understand the true meaning, the true value of the uh, agmat information that may really help them, if it's well communicated, of course, to carry out their ordinary activity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a chain of uh, uh, value that must be created that see the cooperation of all the actors, either in active or passive way, of course. We cannot play the same role, mm -hmm. but we can establish this... Uh, virtual way of communicating that can be good. So, of course, there are many ways that we can uh, use to, to, to help. I think that uh, education is the first. Uh, we should really try to, to understand that education is, uh, is a must. Uh, of course, education not only allows uh, people to, to know more, to have more uh, knowledge or competences, but education uh, um, uh, enhances the brain capacity and also allows to, to um, go to problem solving skills and also to influence the perception of risk uh, so that they, they, it helps to assess to more information, so it stimulates your curiosity. So I think this is very important. And also we need to facilitate the woman confidence, maybe trying to um, improve the woman to more woman uh, conversation about uh, uh, how to use uh, practices um, because uh, you know we can also transmit the spirit of emulation so maybe a woman thinks if she does that I can also do that if she understands that I can do the same and also I think that women are really propensed to be risk adverse in some way. So they, 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 they tend to protect uh, uh, the landscape uh, while men tend to, to, to put hands on that. So usually there are more men prone to uh, have a sustainable way to farm. There are most women uh, who are growing biologically are increasing in the world, uh, in all the world. So they are more prone probably to uh, accept uh, weather and climate information because they are sustainable under a certain point of view. And also there, there is a sort of uh, uh, help that women farmers do if we think to multifunctional agriculture that is now is really important and would be very nice uh, to have um, somehow the ecosystem service paid because if you make sustainable agriculture you can really uh, help the environment also help the rural development women stay uh, usually tend to stay uh, in the farm while men tend to migrate to have additional income so they keep life in the rural environment so i think this is also very important so we can really use our biodiversity in this sense. And also, of course, a simplification of the information, make them 
very, very few technical and very easily accessible and understandable and respect illiterate people because uh, they have the right to, to look at information, to have the same information. So there is some interesting example of uh, kiosks that uh, are present in some part of India, and the colleague told me. There are uh, voice interactive kiosks in which you can ask a question, and there are, of course, uh, already, uh, uh, ready uh, answer to question, but uh, the, 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 the person is driven to having the right information, and also they can catch the images of leaves that are spot by disease, and so you can have the solution and the diagnosis about this disease. So I think this is an interesting tool. <coughs> and of course, there are many. Mm -hmm. We could talk no, hours on that. No, but that's a, a perfect segue um, give to my question in terms of um, sort of the delivery of this information through potential technological platforms. Um, and it sounds to me as if it's a combination of not only what form does that information take, but to build on the other examples, the ease of access to that information. What, what are some of the promising developments you see in that arena from this standpoint, building on Federica's example of more interactive technologies that might be both more user-friendly and, and more accessible? Sure, thanks, uh, Eleanor, and uh, good morning, everyone. I would just start off by saying it's uh, congratulating the WMO on their uh, lack of diversity on this panel. It's a great pleasure to be the only man for a change on a uh, panel of women, so I think that's, uh, that's great. And the other, I'll also start with a bit of a disclaimer as well, in that uh, I am not uh, a farmer or an expert in agribusiness at all. Uh, I grew up on a Scottish island and I was beside a farm and I looked out in fields and cows and things, but that's as far as it went really. I've gone down the business route and uh, working in this uh, quirky bit of Accenture, if you will, but that's given us exposure to really working at this interface between business, technology, innovation, uh, and, and development uh, actors. And yes, we talk a lot about um, the term convergence, I suppose, and um, uh, just uh, produced a paper on this at the UNGA around uh, the role that big disruptive forces such as innovative financing, but particularly technology, is going to have on not just blurring the boundaries between uh, the, the development sector and the private sector and the for-profit and the non-profit. But actually, we, our hypothesis is it's going to actually fundamentally redefine where these boundaries exist and redefine what players are active in issues such as the one that we're discussing this morning. And I really think this interesting nexus between climate and gender and agribusiness and food security, and you can go on and talk about water and energy as well, I'm sure we will this morning, is, is, a, is a fascinating um, uh, nexus to, ex to explore. And we are seeing um, new players start to emerge uh, in this area with the technology. Um, the mobile phone is obviously uh, one key tool, but not the only one. It's one amongst many. Uh, personally, I think, I think we haven't even scratched the surface yet on the potential that technology and this digital revolution are going to have on the sector that we all work in in this bit of uh, Geneva and elsewhere. Um, so yeah, microinsurance, um, uh, microbanking, payments, access to weather information that you talked about is all there. The challenge, I think, is um, on the access um, when it comes to gender. 300 million fewer women in the world have a mobile phone. Um, that's a challenge. And also mobile phones, if women farmers are predominantly in rural areas as opposed to urban areas, there is also a differential between um, access in, in, in rural areas. Penetration is more like 25% versus 80% in urban areas. So some of the really fancy and interesting examples that we'll probably no doubt go on and talk about um, there is a limitation, there's a limitation around cost and access, there's cultural barriers to using phones, there's literacy barriers to using phones. So uh, my hypothesis is that we need really to have sort of more systems type solutions that take account of, of these different issues. There's no one silver bullet, it's not a case of handing out mobile phones and the problem will be solved. It's going to be a much more holistic approach that we're going to require and maybe we can go into some of these uh, uh, these examples at the moment. There's one um, 
particularly good example, I think, there's a, a, a project called M Kisan in uh, in India that's been really about uh, delivering services, farmer helplines, information, weather information over mobile. But they did a survey recently, and only 11% of their users were women. Um, so how do we address this gender gap of access, use, literacy, uh, when it comes to fulfilling the potential promise of, of technology? Bob kindly reminded me of the technological access here that I should be uh, pushing my button. Um, let me build a little bit of a bridge between these various comments because I'd love to give you all the opportunity to weigh in um, if you'd like to build on a comment that a, a colleague introduced. But it sounds to me as if many of you have suggested that at the end of the day, even though one could have piecemeal solutions, at the end of the day, this is a systemic challenge. So the question, it would seem to me, is where do we find that inflection point? You know, what is the intervention that is most likely to contribute to a cascading effect um, and, and thereby create more societal impact, um, certainly around access? Do any one of you have comments or to build on anyone else's comment? Because I think there's wonderful interrelationships between many of your contributions. Evelyn? Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, First, I would like to acknowledge, yes, that uh, uh, it's, it's a very good thing that you have brought out that uh, coming up with information is one thing. And we come from a diverse uh, uh, of places. And even just as we talk about a country, and I, I like uh, what Gibbs said about, you know, I can be in Zambia, but then it depends, am I in the rural area or am I in the in the urban area, because that kind of information is also different. What would be useful to somebody, a farmer in the urban area and a farmer in a typical rural area might not necessarily, so one solution might not fit all. So, but then what I think is there is some leverage and the beginning point is how are we uh, making sure that this information that comes very technical information is first and foremost simplified to the level of the end user at any level. So then we can be able to try and come up with solutions for every level because at the end of the day, we all want to know what we are dealing with. The information might be the same, but it has to be simplified, I think, depending on what level you are. And using that as an, uh, an example, I know that uh, WMO, for example, has collaborations with SADIC. And my country is one of those beneficiaries where the metrology department does collaborate with WMO. But then at what level does that information that WMO and the metrology department gets to the end user, who is in this case the farmer, and more specifically, the female farmer. So that is where now we start seeing things like language barrier. Who is translating this information? You know, I mean, you might say a hurricane. What is a hurricane in Zambia? Doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything. Name it what you want. It, it, won't, it won't move me. Tell it in my language what you mean when you say there's going to be a hurricane. When you say there's going to be a drought, say it in my language what a drought means. Then I will be able to use that kind of information. So we do not expect, of course, the UN agencies to be able to do all those nitty gritties. That is where, being the president of the Farmers Union, I find that my role is critical because we have to filter in with WMO, with the government, and try and see how do we interpret this information that we get and try and siphon it to our members. So we have in Zambia what we call information centers. Being a Zambian, you might assume that I speak all the languages. There are 72 dialects. I cannot speak all of them. I'm fluent maybe in about 10. 
I can listen to maybe about 15. The rest, I'm as good as you, a foreigner, in my own country. So that is very uh, important. So what we have done as a farmers organization is not only also to depend on the government agencies to use their technical extension offices, but as a farmer organization, we have decided and made it uh, possible that we have our own extension service. So we are not totally dependent on government. We have our own extension service and those are people who will be able to speak the local language so that when they hear a hurricane, they will tell my farmer what a hurricane means. And also uh, try and give the farmer a proper idea of what I should do with the information. I'm sure we will have a chance to discuss it because I think there are two problems to weather. You can't tell me a projection of what the year will be. We might expect 800 millimeters of rainfall, and according to metrology, that is good if my interest is the underground water. But if my interest is the length of a crop, how many days is it going to rain, and how many of those days is going to be dry is also important. And that is information that a farmer needs. Is it going to rain for two days and then dry for the next five days? That is information that can be done by the people who are agri more in agriculture, more in, so that, uh, I think, collaboration is extremely critical. So I think we cannot leave it to one organization. We have to work all together. Thank you. I want to echo what uh, uh, Evan Elevan just uh, said. That I think it's very critical to bridge the gap between the information provider and uh, the end users. To do that, I think FAO uh, learned uh, quite a lot from the, the local efforts that have been done by the local authorities. I think one thing is critical is that uh, we need to localize all these uh, uh, climate services to the farm users to make them gender specific, to make them based on the community needs and also their practical uh, situations and the status, and also to make the language understandable yeah. by the local farmers. And so in this regard, I think FAO not only developed some specific guidance and the tools, but also we have uh, some mechanisms like uh, the uh, field farm schools to, to teach the farmers in the field directly. So, so this is uh, something I think critical to localize uh, the climate services uh, and uh, to, 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 to bridge the gap. But another thing is capacity development to increase the capacity of the, of the local government, of the local communities, and even down to the village level. And uh, so in this regard, some institutional settings, policy frameworks, and also the basic indications, uh, extension systems are, are, the, are the issues that we need to consider comprehensively and also systematically. At the, country level and also at the community level, I think a better coordination and more coherent actions across different sectors should be taken. So not only, I mean, uh, the, 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 the meteorological station work alone, but that they should work together with the agriculture extension yeah. system. Yeah. And agriculture system, I mean, should also approach all these meteorological agencies and also some environmental agencies. So those, I mean, joint efforts should be mobilized at all the level, at the national level, but also at the community level as well. Thank you. I think it's very interesting what I said uh, uh, at the very end of your talk that uh, we have to uh, tune different actors that are, they come from, uh, different field, because if you think uh, separately, agriculture is agriculture and meteorology may be only meteorology and climatology. 
If you want to work and communicate agrometeorological information, you have to have a skill in both disciplines. That is not easy. And I think that capacity building really means also to uh, increase the capacity to uh, uh, synthesize the, 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 the main characteristic of these two disciplines to merge together and to see uh, and to help people to understand that weather and climate modulate plant production and plant growth and the yield. So they, they are really uh, big actors, the main uh, agents that may allow to have a good or not good uh, final yield, so a successful uh, activity. So I think that this, this part is very important, so increase agrometeorology knowledge. And then I think I completely agree on the fact that we need uh, to bridge all the gaps that are present, I think, in all the country. And uh, even if the degree of uh, uh, needs and, of course, the local uh, um, characteristics are very different. We are really dealing with different kind of agriculture, crops, environment needs. And also, uh, we have to consider the kind of uh, uh, existing uh, support and way of collecting data in every place and how this can be better used and tailored to, to give a true service to, to farmers, to, to arrive to the final users. So we really should, should work, and I really think, I agree that the, the, the information must be simplified. And to, for communicate for human, to, to women, uh, is, you can use a simple example or a metaphor or language that they know better. So I'll just give a, a, a very um, specific example um, and experience that I had this week. Uh, if my eyes are a bit redder than normal, it's because I've just landed uh, mm -hmm. in from India, 8.30 uh, in, in Geneva. I spent the last week in, in India and had the opportunity to go to rural Rajasthan and visit um, uh, some women farmers in a tiny village in the foothills of the Aravalli Mountains uh, there subsistence farmers, all the issues that we're talking about at the moment, the issues around lack of energy access, lack of education. Um, and, and I was watching some, looking at some, some programs that are being done by a local NGO uh, there to empower, economically empower these women, because their husbands, frankly, have all gone off as migrant labourers and the women. It's an incredible place. But there was one chap I had the um, privilege of, of sitting on a bus next to going there who had been educated, his mother had sold her jewels to put him through school, he was the first person to be educated in his family, amazing, fluent in English, um, and he had developed a technology platform in India, I don't know, you said 70 something languages, uh, uh, Evelyn, in, in Zambia, but in India there's many, many, many different dialects, and this guy had developed this open source, free of charge, technology platform, translation platform, to allow um, all the different Indian dialects to be translated uh, one to the other, 10 million vocabulary or different words. And um, so I just think this power of, of moving, we need to move beyond these pilots and these projects to create the, the platforms and enabling platforms, uh, often digitally enabled platforms, to allow us to, to do this stuff at scale. A project here and a project there isn't going to cut it. But again, firsthand, the, the power of, and it's not expensive when you scale it if you build the platforms. It was free of charge, open to women to translate them. We then still have the underlying issues, obviously, of broader education and literacy. I, I recognize that's not done overnight, but um, that's just one example to throw in there to pick up on Evelyn's point. Let me build um, on a theme, because I think it's, it's a theme that I'm hearing that I would argue could be sort of the core challenge. Um, and Federica, you, you alluded to it in terms of how we look at information, because I think we often assume that in, information is packaged and delivered, and there is then a capacity to take that information as is. And the fact is that what we've heard, and what I think we all know, is that an appetite around the ability to engage with that information and to take that information and understand the consequences of that information is a whole other layer of engagement. And, and Frederica, you alluded to, I think, some very interesting core challenges tied to 
cultural norms and expectations, particularly as it's tied to gender. So you talked about issues around capacity for risk, um, advocacy um, skills, activism skills, um, entrepreneurial perspectives, all of the things that will allow women to engage more proactively and to potentially co-create the information that they need. Yeah. So rather than simply being passive receptacles for the delivery of the information, they're actually shaping it and co-creating information to ensure that it has resonance, applicability, and, and relevance. So I throw out to all of you the challenge of how do we, on the one hand, obviously create the infrastructural and systemic architecture to drive what is required, but how do we, on the other hand, look at the nuances and the granularity of social and cultural norms to begin to increase the appetite for the receptiveness to that information and to proactively use it? Because it sounds to me as if some of this is tied to, it's not just the delivery, it's actually the receptiveness to the delivery of what we're, what we're providing. Do, you, do any of you have insights, particularly as we're looking at the gender dimension of these challenges? What is required to gain much more traction for women in terms of these, you know, the access to relevance of engagement with the information required? Do you have any stories or perspectives on what, where you see there being promise? in terms of moving that needle? Because I could very well imagine us moving the, the, um, the, arc, you know, the systemic needle, and women are saying, but I have no idea what a hurricane is. Do you see what I'm saying? In other yeah. words, we need to provide that kind of granularity. Um, and the private sector has begun to move in this direction in terms of interactive technology so that actually the questions themselves invite insight. But do any of you have any interesting examples of how do we crack that social cultural nut to really open up um, our understanding of, of the nuances here? Yeah. Um, I honestly don't think it's a, it's a very easy, yes, um, one word answer uh, to that. But uh, if I understand your question is, the first thing we have to uh, identify is when we're looking at gender, we're trying to, uh, at women in particular, not gender, <laughs> when we're talking about women in agriculture, for example, what do they do in our communities? I mean, according to FAO statistics, according to any literature that you will pick up, especially in Africa, in Asia, they are responsible for over about 80% of the food production. So we already find that uh, whatever affects uh, food production or food productivity we will, will def definitely um, spirocate in a lot of uh, different issues. So I want to, to try and see that uh, one thing that we have to do is to try and listen and try and learn what are the women asking for? What information is relevant to this woman to make sure that the food production is easy? What does this woman need to make sure that what she plants can make a difference in her living. You know, as a woman, of course, when I become a farmer, I do not give up my role as a mother. I do not give up my role as a wife. All those have to be intermingled. So I think technology, and I'm glad that we have uh, some uh, entrepreneurs and business people in, 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 on the panel, and this all comes in with uh, technologies, mechanization, how easy can you make it for me if I tell you that all I want is to make sure that I know what crop should I plant this season. Not only to make sure that my family has food, but also that I will have some income. Because it's not all about food for my house. I need to pay medical bills. I need to buy clothing, you know? I need cash. So how do we interact this weather information with the livelihood of a woman 
that is going to make me more secure. I think that is where we come in. And I think the only way we can do this is first and foremost, try and listen to what they want. And then try and use the information that we have and try and advise. As a woman, I can decide if I have the information now that if I plant maize, for example, that is my staple food, but I can also eat cassava as a staple food, not very different from my food. But if I have the information that if the weather forecast predicted this year stipulates that if all my field will be cassava, my yield will be so poor that I will not have enough, then I will be, ha I will be able to make a decision to also cultivate some cassava, some sorghum, or something else that is going to make sure that I do not only have enough food to eat, I can be able to sell something, be able to send my children to school, and also have time to myself, try and be able to be a woman, try and have a life of my own. So I think we, we need to listen, try and make this information available, and from that, then the woman will be able to make uh, decisions that are going to be uh, suitable for them to be able to interact. Thank you. I think on one hand, we are saying that we need to empower women with more capacity. But on the other hand, we also need to pay attention to their overloaded work. And only when they have enough energy to learn, to listen, I mean, and also to, uh, to, to receive all this information uh, from the different uh, uh, sectors for their improvement of uh, productivity, for food and extra. So only when they have the energy to do that, then they can do it. Uh, because I think this is also one lesson I learned from our uh, farm field school. So if the women work for the whole day, very hardly in the field, and then you request them to go to the school in the evening to learn something about the knowledge, about all this information, how they can manage that? And they also have the family to take care. So, so, in, in, so that's why I'm saying that on one hand, we need to empower them, but on the other hand, we also need to care them more. Yes, you made a good point that women have in charge a lot of daily activities, so at the end they lack time. And so they lack time as well as they lack many other uh, things. I think they, they are considered uh, uh, not so well connected to the, to the land. Uh, they lack knowledge and because also they lack knowledge because it's not very well communicated and uh, they lack uh, uh, physical strength, they say. So I think that really this, uh, this perspective of uh, saving uh, women uh, whilst empowering them is very, very important. I also think that I agree that we have to um, find a proper way of uh, disseminating and propagating and then making uh, weather and climate information useful not just for women, but for all the farming community. And this must be uh, done per illustrating the local needs. So trying, now farmers, usually I come from a country in which agriculture is really, all tradition is well done. We have good farmers, men, and also women. We have uh, many of them that are direct owners, and they are good farmers. Uh, not many of them, but there are some. Uh, but they are now quite, uh, uh, worried and not sure about the final result of their season because, uh, because the climate is changing. So there are new hazards and new problems. So to make an example, some crops must be seriously damaged by uh, too high temperatures in some place. There is drought in place in which uh, drought was not occurring before. There are spring frosts that damage high value orchards. So uh, really, Farmers are not so sure really what to do. So even if adaptation and uh, um, uh, is 
should be really uh, adopted. There is still very few action to do that and to communicate to farmers what to do in this new situation. So I think we should really start to um, empower the value, empower people about the value of weather and climate information because this can be really, really useful in practice to have a good uh, uh, yield, so to have a good income that is the final goal of each farmer. Yeah, brief, very briefly, yeah, just, uh, I guess as the, as the odd one out on the, on the panel, both gender-wise and also being a, the, the, the business uh, guy, I, I, I tend to see these problems, we could overcomplicate the, the, the thing, I, I think women can be very entrepreneurial, very innovative, and almost, I think if we can reframe the problem, the real problem as something of a, a business opportunity, that's the kind of lens that I see, we could maybe see a virtuous circle in this food, water, energy, education nexus. Um, while I was in India, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. We were doing some work with them on rural um, electrification microgrids. They're going to have uh, a thousand microgrids across India uh, as part of a, a programme called Smart Power for Rural Development, I think is the jargon. But they're trying to create um, new electricity service companies, new livelihoods, if you will, for... Um, uh, for potentially women to create businesses that would be providing energy and electrification with mobile operators potentially being anchor clients you know, to power these big transmitters that, that create the mobile signals. So can you roll out then mobile towers with rural electrification, then you get the connectivity, the access to information, the technology, that will then hopefully improve the yields and the uh, the incomes of rural farmers, and we know that if women increase their um, uh, their income from farming, they're more likely to spend it on educating their kids than spending it on alcohol, as we bad men do. Um, and then if you educate women, you know, you upskill women. So, frankly, some might not want to be farmers, um, and I think that's okay. We may need fewer farmers, women and men, in rural areas to create more food, and then we can potentially have um, diversification of roles and maybe have literate, well-educated women perhaps not following their mother into farming, perhaps following them into business or following them into, dare I say, the UN or something like that. Um, so, you know, I think there is an opportunity. Maybe I'm just an optimist. Uh, I am an optimist. I, you know, there I go, admit it. But I think there is this power, if we think systemically, to create that virtuous uh, circle at the, at the, at the nexus and get to scale, which is obviously the elusive thing. I think two, two points that I've heard that I think are quite interesting. One is potentially having a more robust definition of success, because at the end of the day, this is a societal challenge with a number of different permutations and so on, um, which I think then opens up the conversation more broadly, as you said, give to per perhaps introduce a bias around where are the opportunities as opposed to more of a stopgap measure of what are the problems and what are the sort of you know, direct or targeted solutions in a very micro um, sense. The other question though I have is, is um, I, I am fascinated by this information issue about almost the kind of the if then. I mean, yeah. how fascinating that if you did have the right kind of information, you could make a more empowered decision about what crop options would would um, produce a greater yield, and you know even just the if then mm -hmm. issue, as opposed to a kind of data dump of information, which I think is quite quite intriguing. One of the things before I open it up to the audience that I think would be very interesting is you know where is there power in alignment or community building? You know, so for example, farming cooperatives and so on. I suspect all of you have very interesting perspectives on how can we bring communities together around shared challenges. So you, Evelyn, mentioned about had you not been a member of this union, you would have not had access to perhaps the, the useful information, information that you were able yes. to get. And that, yes. you know, comparing it to what the radio was saying, well, the weather might be good, the weather might be bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not particularly <laughs> useful. Sounds like what I get on my iPhone. Um, so the question I have is, 
where, again, biasing the conversation perhaps more in the solution space now, because I think we all want to look at what does the future hold? You know, where are the promising solutions? Where do we see good momentum? Yeah. Um, and I just would like to, to kick off the conversation, Evelyn, by building on what you said about the union, the power yes. of the collective. Um, and if I could ask each of you to sort of reflect on examples where you've seen um, sort of the, the flywheel effect of creating a shared agenda and then mobilizing through a shared agenda in that way. Um, that would be interesting. Um, thank you very much. Um, of course, being a member of the pharma organization, I strongly believe that we have made a lot of difference. And I'll give you a very a quickly, a very typical example. Uh, this year, when we did a uh, a focus of our yields, the members of the Zambia National Farmers Union, who, who I think their main difference was either they were members of, our, of the union or they were not. The yields of the crop, the national yield was 2.1 metric tons of maize. We had the same rainfall, we had the same chemicals, probably the same fertilizers and whatever. And our members had 4.2. The only difference was that there were members. Being a member, being a part of a family, I think we I think care more about each other. We will disseminate the information more timely and more relevant. We will know what is going to affect our members, and we will be able to disseminate that information. So that is why I strongly believe uh, in some countries, and now uh, apart from being just a member of the Zambia National Farmers Union, but also of the World Farmer Organization, in my travels I have seen that in some countries, cooperatives have also worked very well. So it doesn't, in some countries, um, cooperatives do not work very well. If you came to my country and you mentioned cooperative, you have to be a little bit careful because it's very politically in, in, inclined and everybody will be a little bit suspicious and, you know. But I have seen very successful cooperatives in some countries. And so I think the, but, uh, the bottom line is aggregation, you know, either at a village level, which can then will s stem uh, to the national level, to the global level to the district level, but there has to be some kind of grouping because then we are going to be able to share information that is relevant. So I think that sense of belonging, I think is quite natural, is human actually. I think in isolation, we will not achieve anything. So membership to organizations, and when I talk about organization, I would also urge organizations to try and be quite independent because that's also very important. Because I have also seen examples of countries where they have farm organizations, but they're not independent themselves. Therefore, what they say is influenced by who is financing them. So they are controlled. So I think capacity building, which was mentioned earlier on, of a former organization, of a cooperative, or whatever group you belong to, so that you can have a mind of your own and try and highlight what is necessary to improve the livelihoods and the core mandates of your organization is the bottom line. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the farmer organizations and the farmer cooperatives can play a very critical role to align the individual farmers to access to the market, to the information and knowledge. Uh, but uh, one more thing I want to add, based on what uh, the, the, the other panelists said, that it's a, a, a successful case that I learned from China. It is uh, the lead farmer. And uh, because all the farmers are, are not having the equal knowledge and education. And also the, the state-only extension system cannot be placed everywhere in the rural community. 
but the lead farmers who have more education background, who might be smarter than the average, then they live all the time, 24 hours uh, during the day with all these farmers. Yeah. So if we teach them and let them understand how to access to the knowledge, to the information, and that they could stay very closely with all the farmers in yeah. the village, and that they can, I mean, liaise with them or align with them at the daily basis. So this is a very, I mean, successful uh, mechanism I learned uh, from China. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think that uh, we should use what, what we have and increase networking. I strongly believe that now network is our strength. And uh, I was thinking to an example that I can bring uh, uh, from our uh, CAGM activities. That is a society that has been created uh, more than 10 years ago. It's 14 years old, it's becoming a teenager society. That is the International Society of uh, Agrometeorological Science. Uh, no, International Society of Agrometeorology, sorry. Uh, the acronym is INSAM. And it was being found that it's free of charge, it's web-based, so each of us can, be, can become a member, and was created uh, to overcome the isolation of micrometeorologists, to offer them a possibility to dialogue online and exchange everything, tools, information, questions. So now um, I just uh, uh, made a survey about the number of members. We had more than 2,000 members, 2,025 in 125 countries. That is very, very huge uh, spreading. And I saw that women are about 18% in the average, with some different, of course, representative. We have in Africa 18% of women. We have in Africa 16 women belonging to the society. I'm not talking in percentage, but in true numbers. <coughs> And um, 20 in Nigeria, to make a, some example, 22 in Iran, 16 in the United States, 23 in Brazil. So we have a, now a representative inside this society. We have uh, uh, a large no number, about 400 women that are skilled in agrometeorology that can be uh, possibly an interface for us to communicate in their country. And so what we thought with the new president, that is René Gomez, he comes from FAO, he was formerly FAO. Uh, the first president was a uh, key sticker that probably most of you know. We thought to promote a forum, uh, so a website discussion place. And one of the topics of this forum that was really new started two days ago. So uh, we don't still have any experience on that, but it's just on gender issue. So I, will, I thought that I can try to moderate it and to, to make that an instrument that all of us can use if we want to discuss about women-related uh, uh, issues and how, and I hope that can become a sort of meeting place for women, but also for men, of course, uh, just to discuss and to uh, see what are the local uh, needs, possibility, and how to uh, better liaise with the local population mm -hmm. to, to make them understanding and using agromet information. This is one of the part. And also we have uh, one of our focus in the Commission is uh, um, capacity development, so I'm very glad to say that uh, is in very good hands because it's uh, Giuliana Ukei and uh, Elena Matescu, so it's completely in the hand of women. So we really trust that this, this uh, topic of capacity development could be uh, properly done uh, using this uh, gender sensibility. Mm -hmm. So this, this kind of network can be sort of practical uh, example of how to do and to have a meeting places in which to discuss. I know we're short of time, so I won't add much in it so that we've got a chance for some, some questions. I think to your original question around the scope for cooperation or cooperatives, I think there's just huge opportunities in the supply chain, whether it's around equipment or particularly uh, cold storage, for example. I think one of the big problems is that uh, farmers having to sell their, 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 their produce all at the same time when prices are low and then some middleman, and it's usually a middleman, will exploit the prices and, and um, 
uh, store the grain until there's a higher price. So if we could combine together and, and um, uh, allow women to, to store uh, access to the base of the pyramid, I guess, uh, cold storage solutions, then that again could increase uh, income, income levels. So I think there's lots of scope in the supply chain, I would say. Um, open it up for any questions. I believe everyone can access their microphone. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Gulam Rabbani, and uh, I work for Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies. And um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for all presentations and excellent questions and the responses from, uh, from this side. But <clears throat> I would like to add some of the uh, some points with uh, with your panel members from uh, from Zambia uh, and also uh, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, in fact, in Bangladesh, as you know, I am not going to the background of uh, how Bangladesh is is vulnerable to the climate change and and the disasters. But we have a project with uh, with UN Women and BRAC, and uh, we conducted some of the research and. Uh, uh, we found some of the findings that, that I would like to add with their intervention, um, their presentation is number of women farmers and the workers in Bangladesh has, has tremendously increased in the last 15, 15, 20 years. And uh, under this changing condition, you know, almost every year in the last, um, last 10 years, you know, uh, there is either a flood or cyclone or drought or silent intrusion. There are many, many uh, hazards, climate-induced hazards that we have. And uh, there are some of the um, um, livelihood options that the women are currently um, um, doing is the nursery, uh, small enterprise, fishing, fish cultivation, home gardening, vegetable farming, poultry and duck farming. But information, how information, access to information and seeds become so much important for these women farmers uh, is, um, is the important one. And, and on her point is, you know, uh, if, the, if the mobile device remains with the man and the man, male members migrate for six months uh, in a year in the nearest district or some people, some male members migrate to the, uh, you know, near uh, India, and then, the, then how this information um, uh, comes to the woman? So that was the biggest challenge, you know, especially in the one of the one third of the uh, country, especially in the in the coastal zone. And but uh, I would like to give you one example, which is a successful case that uh, uh, that happens in Bangladesh is the microcredit organisations initiated by by Grameen and Brac. And as you know, the Grameen, um, uh, which is uh, uh, initiated by uh, Professor Yunus, the only Nobel laureate in Bangladesh, and he actually provided the opportunity uh, to 8.6 million women, again 8.6 million women who gets this opportunity uh, to access to credit and start some ent small enterprise. And more important thing is every week, every week this 8.6 million women gets information from microcredit organization on the met uh, meteorological data or the other you know, information and especially the access to credit credit and the, and the access to seats. So that's the important thing that happens, and that's how actually we say that in Bangladesh, we survive just because of, you know, if, if there are many factors, this is one of the factors that we survive. And, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the last point from my end is the currently, the whole world appreciate this Brack and Gramming, Professor Yunus and Fazlias and Abed, but these two guys appreciate the omen of Bangladesh. Thank you, ma'am. and then sort of respond to them collectively, if that would be all right, because you raised some really good points. Okay, yes, the woman. Uh, hi, my name is Suranjana. I belong to the Viro Commission, which is a network of uh, grassroots women's organizations, uh, many of whom are working on enhancing resilience in their everyday lives. Um, Thank you for a very uh, stimulating and interesting panel that sort of brings together all the different uh, stakeholders and actors. Um, I think in, not just in this panel, but in the run up to today, I think again and again, we are hearing 
the message that um, there's the meteorologists who have all this very valuable information, but there's this whole uh, chain of communication that needs to bring it down uh, to local grassroots women's groups, whether they are in fishing communities or farmers or um, living in, in slums and have to deal with disease and epidemics and so on. So I, I think I'd like to um, sort of hear how we can collectively come up with some recommendations that actually uh, bring together all these actors to work together, uh, keeping in mind um, the, the two points from the ladies from Zambia and from FAO who emphasize this notion of keeping a grassroots membership-based organization in the center. I mean, I, I, I'm from South Asia. We have huge numbers of organized women's groups working at the grassroots level, as I'm sure in Africa we have colleagues from Latin America here. So, so these are fantastic networks with huge potential for transmitting and transferring information. And because they are organized, there is a they 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 have a place to accumulate learning and build on it in a different way from just sort of ad hoc individuals coming and going from projects. And I like very much the idea of the lead farmers that comes from, from China because this is precisely a, a means of empowering people and, and promoting their leadership. So saying, here's a set of people who've taken local leadership maybe in many different themes, whether it is in uh, building microcredit or negotiating with local authorities and so on, but how can we put more information in their hands and help them play more public roles that changes how they are perceived in their communities and by external actors who may be local government, technological people, private sector, or national government. Yeah. Yes. My name is Malika Martini. For, I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization based in Cairo, the regional office. Uh, I would like to start talking about uh, the extension services. I work in an area and in a region that is devastated by conflicts. In addition to that, there is also the climate change. So it's a double challenge that we have to deal with. And uh, talking about extension services, especially for women, they are very weak in the 20 countries that we serve. Why they are very weak? Because research and development, both of them have focused their efforts on the farms as, as targets and not uh, having a holistic view working with the other uh, stakeholders such as the, the, the extension agents. So, so having women as extension agents is not sufficient because I have visited, I'm a field person, I have visited the, the extension services, there are women there, but they don't have any means even to go to, to women and provide this information because men may come to the uh, extension agency to get the information, but for women we need to have different mechanisms that take the information to the women where they are because we have heard over the, the few days that women are busy doing the agricultural work in addition to their work at home. Uh, the second point uh, I would like to talk about, we are talking that we want to provide the information, we want to give this, uh, uh, these gems to the farmers and to people in rural area and urban areas, but I would like to look at the other side they have also something to, to offer. And research has already done lots of, uh, uh, lots of uh, research on the perceptions of farmers on climate change. And uh, we have asked them many times about uh, what is the change over the, the, the last 10 years. They have something to offer. And we have to listen also to that to be able to build 
sound recommendations. The recommendations don't come just from, from meetings, of course, they come from the field. And these people have also their own strategies. They are not uh, only waiting for someone to come because, because they have to deal with their daily life and their food security every day. So this is another, another aspect. Um, the other point uh, I would like also to hear maybe more is about adaptation in addition to mitigation. Because although the two concepts have been developed maybe separately, but we have really to deal with them, uh, I, mean, uh, in a, I mean, together. Uh, the fourth point I would like to bring is about the approach. The approach to climate change has mainly focused on many aspects such as soil, water, land management uh, and technologies as mentioned by uh, our colleague uh, here. Of course with the, with the gender dimension but what has not been done up to now is really, or little has been done, on the adaptive strategies of women and men to climate change. This is really lacking in the, in the research and development uh, agenda. And in order to target uh, or to have sound interventions to women and men, I think there is a need to better understand their adaptive and mitigation strategies. Uh, in addition to that, I would, uh, I would also uh, uh, mention that uh, uh, talking about the, the technologies, we need to have also in mind that women in rural areas or in agriculture per se are doing different tasks and dif within different operations. And when we develop a technology, it needs to take all this information and detailed information into account in order to better intervene with the technology. Because technology is not only about the crop, it's about the different operations that are, are performed within the crop and then the different tasks within every, every operation. So my concern here is that we need to partner very closely with research institutions to be able to reach a level of intervention that is sound and based on adequate information, especially in terms of smart agriculture and, uh, and also, uh, and also uh, I think that there is already something on the ground that we need to, to take advantage of because we, we, we cannot start from this room, we cannot start just as uh, UN institutions. There is research done at the national level, they know better than us the country needs and uh, the, 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 the country requirement in addition to international research institutions that have already started working on this a uh, long time ago. Thank you. Very good. Let me just quickly summarize because these were, were wonderful comments. I think your comment was very interesting in terms of you know the financial catalysts that can help prompt not only the empowerment that we've been talking about, but, but actually the concrete wherewithal financially for these smaller enterprises, which I think is a critical ingredient here. I think the next comment, which to me was all about the ecosystem of stakeholders, how do we ensure that sort of the food chain of communication not only accommodates those different lenses of perspective, but creates a much more robust user-centric perspective on communication and information, if you will. And finally, I think that adaptation and mitigation point is critical, that we, we look at communication flows not only so-called top-down but bottom-up, and that we ensure that we're tapping into locally-based experiential success stories, and that we actually leverage storytelling. Um, there is data, but there is also storytelling that I think can, can help engage um, in a more robust fashion. So I leave it to the panel. If any one of you would like to jump on any of the comments or, or provide any either other additional perspectives or um, build on any of the points that were made? Yeah. Um, I would just like to comment, I think, on the, on the last comment on uh, research. And unfortunately, I think this is a very, very uh, important issue. And why I say this is because a lot of governments 
I think even from yesterday we heard that if you look at any international budget, research allocation has been dwindling. Why is that? It's because, I mean, what do they get in return is their first question. Even on the political level, um, in my group yesterday, we were with somebody from the government and we're asking her, I mean, the problem we have is that government is not putting enough money in research. And she says yes, because it doesn't pay much. But then there has to be awareness that without research, nothing else will come out. So this is vital. I think something has to be done. It is not, I think research cannot be dealt with as a business. It is not a business. We are not going to put in $500 into research and expect $1,000 tomorrow. But then we have to acknowledge that research has to be funded. In my country, for example, when we look at the agriculture budget, what we do every year when the budget comes out, we try and break down what the allocation is for. And you will find that most of the time, research is less than 1%. The, so the actual allocation towards a segment might be big, but the fact that research is not funded really means that there's very little that will be achieved. So I think it is very, very vital. We have to make sure that research is funded. It might not be profitable tomorrow, but in the long run, that is the only way we are going to sustain our planet. Thank you. I think it's uh, critical uh, for us to have uh, the impact at the uh, grassroots level and also to put the farmers at the center. Uh, but I want to uh, take a little bit, to, I mean, step back to say how we can achieve that. So to me, we, we have to think from the national policy level down to the community level. First of all, I think we should have a very strong political commitment at the national level I mean, and also the community level to see that we have to integrate gender, food security, climate services, all those cross-sectoral issues together. And also, I mean, for, for, for doing this, I think FAO is uh, trying to help the member countries to mainstream the climate-related priorities in their national policy, in their national agricultural development plan, so, because we think that is one approach to, to have more political uh, commitment from the national level and also to integrate all the, these different sectors together, start, st uh, starting from the, the national policy level. And then I think also, uh, secondly, one important thing is uh, the institutions institutional setting up. The research is very important, but also I think extension systems, uh, knowledge uh, uh, producing, uh, academias, all, all this, I mean, how we should set up our institution uh, from the top down to the, the grassroots level is also critical. And uh, uh, the third point I want to mention is uh, the good practices. Good practices normally do not have one model or standard models that can fit all. So we need to have good practices tailored made. And we have to learn from farmers and also to have the practices that can be suitable to the local situation and also suitable to the farmers that, who, are, who, who are farming. So this is uh, the, the thing I think I want to draw a little bit back not only, I mean, look at the grassroots, but to, to, to have uh, some, I mean, uh, uh, perspectives to, to support those efforts that we are going to, to do at the grassroots level. Thank you.
just a very few. Uh, yes, extension service should be empowered, uh, not just putting more women, but uh, since they are the only uh, way of transmission of information from the research side to, to the true world, to the farmers, I uh, really think that the way in which they are communicated, so that the, the capacity to reach people and the use of new technology or different technology according to the place must be uh, implemented. Uh, yes, we have to learn for farmers because farmers know a lot, so there can be also a research that starts from the farmer request. And this is very important for adaptation, the issues that you took out. Uh, yes, adaptation is the other kind of the mitigation side, or they work together. If we make some, uh, we are uh, good in making some good practice for adaptation, it's very possible that we are also working for mitigation and the planet will appreciate it. But this is, is not a single action. This must be a concerted effort. Excellent. Yeah, I'll pick up on that ad adaptation uh, point as well, um, briefly. And I, I talked about a virtuous circle before, but equally I think there is a, a possibly downward spiral that we have around farmers not investing in or taking the risk to invest in fertilizer and um, uh, other nutrients, soil nutrients, um, so that they minimise their exposure to shocks, climate shocks. So, one of my favourite examples that I looked at when, um, when researching this is is uh, an initiative that's been done in Kenya and uh, Rwanda by Swiss Re, the insurer, and looking at microinsurance along with uh, the Syngenta Foundation. And basically, it's looking at selling seeds that actually come um, with crop insurance built in. Um, you know, that is this, this notion of uh, climate smart um, uh, crop index insurance. And I don't know whether that's been talked about this week or not, but, you know, it's not cost efficient for insurers to, um, to send out loss adjusters to farms to understand who's been damaged after a particular event. It has to be done in advance based on, you know, data provided by the likes of uh, WMO and others. So if you can, if a particular weather event happens or a certain amount of rainfall happens, then insurance is automatically paid out to, to the farmers with their barcode scanned uh, seeds that they've bought. And, and then the payment goes over the M-Pesa mobile banking uh, platform to the farmer themselves. So you get this instant payout. It's not needing done on any sort of assessment. It's done very quickly and it's very easily bundled with the likes of buying seeds. So I think this is sort of, you know, let's face it, you know, we are going to have to adapt, we are going to have to innovate. And I think that's one example that I particularly like that brings together this technology and a, a kind of systems market solution to that. It's called um, Kilimo Salama, that, that example. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I unfortunately need to bring this very dynamic conversation, panel discussion, to a close at this point. I want to thank all of our panelists um, for just a particularly insightful conversation about really how can we help drive food security and agricultural sustainability. If you could all join me in a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Yes, and thank you again also to our moderator who did a really good job of integrating a wide range of viewpoints there. That was really a very informative discussion. Thank you. A um, couple of business announcements before we take the coffee break. Uh, we'll have a 25 minute break this morning and then ask you to come right back uh, to the next round of working sessions. We have some new speakers who will be here in Salo Bazi, in addition to Sue Carlson from the World Farmers Organization and Christina Tirado with the International Union of Nutritional Sciences. They'll also be joined by Thato Supang from Agribusiness Botswana, Philip Massal from the Ven Venutuatu Met Service, sorry, <laughs> um, and Madav Karki who will be representing IUCN. Should be a really interesting group. At the same time, down in South C1, we're going to have a discussion on improving access and use of information for food security. We'll have representatives from EFAD, from, uh, we'll have other representatives from, uh, I think Frederico may be there, uh, people from Crops from the Future, and Ed Carr, who has been working on these issues for many years with USAID, is also a professor at the University of South Carolina. So once again, 
please do. We'd love to have about 70 of you shift down the circular staircase. It's going to be a very interactive discussion downstairs. Lots of chances to hear from you. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you in 25 minutes. Just, just I want to make a comment that uh, the people who are sitting behind the panelists, they are not seeing them. I raised my hand more than one time to talk, but nobody saw me.
Welcome back. This is, as you can see by my attire, I, this is an informal session. I've taken off my suit jacket, so very session. We had a very good high-level panel. I should introduce myself. I'm Robert Stefanski. I'm chief of the Agricultural Meteorology Division in WMO, and this session, uh, again, is a companion session to the high-level. 
and I think it was very good in the last session talking about what concrete steps should we have. Uh, so this is ensuring uh, capacity and enabling mechanisms, uh, the particip participation of women in training and institutions. Um, so the panel that we have here will lead a discussion on how to build capacity among agricultural food security practitioners and institutions for effective use of weather and climate services through ensuring participation in training and decision making, decision making by both men and women. And how do we put enabling mechanisms into place? Some of the guidelines for this session is looking at major institutional and technical gaps that limit the equitable access and use of weather and climate information and services and, and agriculture and food security. So let me briefly introduce the panel, and let me just, uh, after that, I'll, I'll describe the format. So we have, to my far left, Susan Carlson. She's the Women's Committee Facilitator for the World Farmers Organization. We then have, uh, again to my left, Christina Tarato. She's the chair of the International Union of Nutritional Science Task Force on Climate and Nutrition, and she's a professor at UCLA in the US. To my right, we have Philip Marcel um, from the Climate um, Services Department, I believe, of the Vanuatu Meteorological Service. And then we have Mativ Karti, um, who uh, represents the uh, Integrated Development Society of Nepal, but is also the IUCN advisor uh, for the Committee for South Asia and the Commission for Ecosystem Management. And then we have Tato Sprang from Agribusiness Botswana. So what we'll do is that each panelist will give us a very brief background of what they do, their interest in this um, intersection of gender, weather, climate, food security, and agriculture. And then we'll ask them some questions uh, and get some interaction from the um, participants. But we'll also, because this is a working session, we need feedback. And so in about maybe a few minutes and half an hour, we'll be sending out sort of the question that we want you to, to answer in groups. And that question is, how can we address the gaps in institutional and technical capacity and training needs, to, and so how do we address these gaps, and what are the needs to ensure improved use of weather and climate information by both men and women in agriculture and food security? So I'll, that question will be on the sheet of paper that will be passed out. So we do have uh, a lot of issues to cover, so I will start with Susan Carlson, please. Thank you so much, Bob, and um, to the WMO for hosting this conference. I'm, I'm really enjoying being here, and it's something I've been working on for a long time. Um, my name is Sue Carlson. I'm, I'm from North Dakota. Uh, most of my life, though, was spent in Wisconsin as a dairy farmer. I grew up on a farm, and I was a farmer. I have three sons, and um, so uh, obviously, uh, the weather affects farmers. We've talked a lot about it the last two days, and all the issues that have come up, I've lived through them, and I have a passion about it. I became a farm leader. I was the first woman to be elected president of the Wisconsin Farmers Union. I served in that capacity for seven years and um, stepped aside to uh, marry Robert Carlson, and I moved to North Dakota, and we're farmers there. We're grain farmers. Um, and. Um, Throughout this time, I've had a lot of exposure to um, advocating for programs that benefit farmers for good conservation practices, for instance, carbon credit programs, where we would pay farmers for switching to better tillage practices, low tillage, minimal tillage, uh, planting more trees, rotational grazing. So I've had some experience with that. And then I've been involved with the uh, World Farmers Organization. I facilitated and chaired, so I brought together the first uh, women's committee, and we have members from around the world, two members from each region. And uh, our goal is to make sure that women farmers are at all platforms, uh, every fora, international fora, and that we have a voice at the table. So that's it in a nutshell. Did I stay to my time? <laughs> you were perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go with, um, let's see the order here, we'll go with um, Philip. Do you want to talk about 
just a brief background of what you're doing. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for the opportunity for, for us to, to be part of this. Uh... Yeah. So, my name is Philip Malsal, I'm, 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 I'm from the Vanuatu Med Service. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Vanuatu is, uh, it's in the Pacific region, which is uh, east of Australia. And I've been working with the Met Service for the past 12, 13 years now, and in the past five years with the Climate Division. So, uh, the Vanuatu is located in the southwest Pacific, just east of Australia, with more than 80, 80 small islands, uh, with a very limited uh, land area, about 12,000. Uh, kilometer squares. Uh, it is a country that is, according to the vulnerability index, it is one of the most vulnerable country in the world. If you talk about the geological, physic, uh, physical uh, impacts of falcon and tectonic uh, activities, we are located in one of the major active uh, zones in the region. Also, if you talk about meteorological uh, elements of we are also in the in the region where it's close to the uh, warm, water, warm pool area as well. So what we're looking at is when we talk about services that that we provide, we take in consideration what is uh, what 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 are some of the uh, imp uh, elements that we have to uh, you know try to meet. So we're thinking about rural versus urban, the literacy uh, level of the community, the gender issues. Communication isolation and different lunches that we uh, that we face. So, the, the service that we provide is basically looking at science, uh, looking also into uh, observation network like the Fanat Rainfall Network. We have a community-based uh, network that collect rainfall information uh, on a daily basis for the past five years now. We also look at traditional knowledge. What are some of the uh, uh, traditional indicators that can help with the science so that people can better understand, especially in the communities in, 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 in Vanuatu. So some of the products that we, we give out is, on a monthly basis, we give out uh, uh, the climate update on a monthly basis. Uh, we deliver it to communities in the form of art copies and they put it on, on, on all these boards. We are not really into the technology of SMS and all that. So. We also look into data management, uh, looking at hard copies, also digitizing some of the hard copies so that we can meet the needs of our clients. Now we are into uh, looking at into specific sectors. Generally, the climate division is really small, so we just give an overall service uh, basically on science. But tailoring specific products for specific uh, sectors is, is something that we are going into now. One of the most important things that we, we try to uh, get to is how do we get the information to the last mile? So the delivery component, the networking that we want uh, to use to make sure that women, men and children at the, at the community use this information. We can, we can go directly, we can go using the existing networks either through church, uh, through farmers. So these are some of the networks that we're using. So we use some tools that help us to deliver this information to make sure that the information is based on science and also we have to simplify the science for people to understand. So that's basically what we're doing. And yeah, uh, we'll, we'll give you more details once we go through to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so we'll next go to Christina Tarato uh, to give her this background of what she's involved with. Uh, in her work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you so much uh, to the uh, organizers for the invitation to this uh, great uh, conference. It's uh, really in the center of our interest. Um, I am going to uh, present you uh, just a little bit uh, the kind of uh, activities that we are doing with uh, women farmers in Central America. We also work in Latin America. Um, 
But first, um, I wanted to, uh, to show some figures to give you an idea of gender equality issues related to food and nutrition security. The first one is that 60% um, of the chronically hungry people are women and their, their children. And these, they, these children uh, get affected negatively through stunted growth and limited cognitive capacity for the rest of their lives. So to keep uh, children fed, well fed the first thousand days is critical. And this is why it's so important in many agendas, like the Clinton agenda, etc. Um, we know that women produce up to 80% of the world's food as consumed in the households, but on the other hand, they only own 2% uh, of the world's title land. This is something that, uh, you know, that is, uh, we, we have to address. The problem is that usually women are uh, smallholders, uh, they are uh, small farm, uh, farmers. Um, many times they work in a... Uh, the self-employed, they are uh, not in regular jobs. They have limited to access to education, credits, natural resources, technology, information and extension services. In fact, uh, the current data show that women only receive 5% of all the agricultural extension services that are available, and only 15% of the people that are providing these um, extension services uh, are women. Um, there is a recent um, uh, work by FAO that was showing that if we were giving equal access to agriculture land, training, information, and credit, the, the farm productivity may uh, uh, increase by 20, 30%, and up to 100, 150 million less people will be hungry. This is a big, uh, big number, and I think that uh, could be, uh, you know, critical for promoting what we are uh, saying here. So, um, in Central America, we will, we have been working with um, uh, indigenous communi communities in, in two different ways. One has been promoting health and nutrition through family agriculture. This year is the year of the family agriculture. And for example, and this is just an example of one of the projects, um, we were promoting the WHO guidelines for the safe production of fruits and vegetables for food safety. Uh, and we were doing this through agriculture services. Um, it was a project uh, long-term long project uh, funded by the IAC, uh, the Spanish Cooperation Agency. And as an outcome, we got that they were improved nutrition and house, household diet diversity. We found a decrease up to 60% of diarrheal diseases. And there were many opportunities to improve environmental health with, you know, learning ways of using less chemicals, fertilizers, and other agricultural inputs and definitely room for much more opportunities for education, which include uh, weather and meteorological services. Now, um, the other uh, big uh, initiative that we have uh, been working in Central America, it has been with uh, cooperatives. And these cooperatives in, in particular, they were women cooperatives, uh, agriculture women cooperatives, um, and it was a, a very, uh, you know, rewarding um, experience since they are very integrated and all the benefits and opportunities that they offer are uh, incredible. Um, we have been trying to bring all these successful stories to the different uh, um, conference of the parties the in the, in, to the UN uh, climate conferences uh, in the last years. We have been present um, as, the, um, as, as the UN Standing Committee of Nutrition has been present there since uh, Copenhagen, 2009. And this is an example of one of the policy papers that we brought uh, to, to Durban in South Africa that was endorsed by WFP, by the UN Standing Committee of Nutrition, Action Against Hunger, in which we were uh, looking at gender equity in agriculture programs and community decision making. And 
uh, we make up a strong point that access to maternal and reproductive health, so you can choose if you are working or you are having children. Childcare services, healthcare and healthy environments, they were key uh, you know, to ensure that we have gender equity. Then girls' education was uh, critical. Uh, and um, later, in Rio Plus 20, we were still focusing on the partnerships for climate resilience uh, sustainable development. And we were uh, passing some messages, key messages on food, nutrition, security, health, and gender equality. And we realized that to ensure health, food, and nutrition security was essential to have a gender responsive approach. And this should be a critical component of the SDGs and the post-2015 agenda. And in, uh, just to finalize, what it will be super important in the, um, uh, in the, when, when developing indicators and targets for the uh, SDGs and the post-2015 agenda, in, for example, in Sustainable Development 2, which is ending hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promoting sustainable agriculture, there is a target very clear that was discussed in the World Assembly in September that was looking at increased productivity and income for smallholder and women farmers with a focus on sustainability, increasing smallholder yields and ensuring access to education. And I would suggest that, you know, that in these targets we also include and you know, ensuring access to weather and climate services. Uh, this is perfectly fine, and you know, there is an opportunity right now that these uh, um, targets are being discussed and put it on the table to add this kind of issues that are, uh, could make a real difference for the sustainable uh, development um, goals. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. And uh, that was very good to link. I think we should stress you know, this conference is very important because it's bringing together many different disciplines and uh, people with different work experiences. So we're focusing on gender, but as we've talked about on Wednesday, with the, the, the focus on climate services, looking at agriculture, food security, health, um, water, and disaster risk reduc reduction, you've combining these. And it's important that there is a lot of cross-cutting issues, especially dealing with women's issues and how to access or give access to women and men um, across all those sectors. So thank you. So next we'll go to uh, Madhav to give uh, just a brief <coughs> background. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very good morning to you all. It's a great pleasure sharing some of my uh, learning and uh, some of the insights from my work uh, with you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how uh, we can empower women uh, with knowledge and also uh, build their institutions. So I think we have heard uh, women uh, and children and elderly are the first and the most seriously affected when the climate change impacts happen. And I think this is true also in Nepal. We have also heard that uh, women's inequality uh, prevents them to do adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And this inequality actually combined with the existing social structure actually magnifies their vulnerability. So we, we have women suffering this what we call multiple stress and then they have multidimensional vulnerability, structural vulnerability. So I think uh, for that uh, we took a small work. Uh, I. Uh, leader, uh, I was a team leader of a research on indigenous uh, knowledge and practices for climate change adaptation uh, in Nepal. So I'm going to just uh, share some of the some of the insight from that. So the key issues which we uh, try to address is that uh, inequity in access to resources, goods, services, and decision making uh, in agriculture and food security sector, I think is pervasive. So we have to address it. And and second issue is the the empowerment uh, is needed, but it is hampered by their lack of capability, skills, and uh, organizational, I would say, uh, forum, uh, and then, uh, then, of course, the skills also. 
So uh, we visited uh, 18 districts out of 75 in, in Nepal, and we did case studies uh, documenting indigenous and local knowledge and practices. We went from knowledge to practices because we need to really uh, wanted to learn how they are really tackling climate change is happening, and they are doing something about it. So we wanted to learn from them. And what came out uh, uh, is that uh, uh, when, uh, this just confirms that when the climate change uh, hits, uh, some of the sectors, some of the uh, aspects which are affected are the ones which are increasing the drudgery and the difficulties of uh, women face. Like uh, you can see on the slides, the food storage, the seats are affected. And so they have done something to raise the platform of uh, storage uh, beans so that they are not um, inundated. Similarly, the water sources dries up. And uh, then, of course, their mobility is affected in South Asia uh, because of the cultural factors also this, uh, this affected um, even more. Uh, so uh, uh, what I think um, we tried to find out is uh, there was a perception. Of course, men and women had different perception. Uh, most of the men uh, uh, felt that climate change uh, mm, affects uh, men and uh, uh, women more, much more. I mean, this was a kind of pleasant surprise, but the women felt that uh, it sort of uh, affects both. So I think there was uh, some sort of a, uh, more egalitarian thinking among the women. And then we uh, tried to find out what they are doing about it. And uh, we found several practices which can be uh, classified as climate adaptive and resilient practices. Uh, they have been doing uh, indigenous practices, but I think uh, doing it for addressing climate change, this is something new and we wanted to find out. Uh, for example, this lady, uh, she comes from a, a more uh, ethnic uh, minority groups, uh, but she has developed the skill of uh, you know, doing grafting of pear on wild uh, crops, which, which survives drought, uh, which survives uh, lack of moisture. Uh, so she has found out how this can be more resistant pear, and she's earning uh, money from them. And she's managing uh, this community forest for the community, and which is one of the most successful, uh, uh, I would say, the natural resource management systems uh, in, in Nepal, and which is also globally known. The another thing is, I think we found that wherever women's uh, uh, these practices have uh, have succeeded, uh, they are the strong institutions which are also uh, simultaneously becoming more capacitated uh, exist. So there is a kind of a correlation that if you want really women's knowledge to work. Uh, to, to improve their, uh, uh, to decrease their vulnerability and improve uh, resilience, uh, then the institutions have to be strengthened. And uh, with that, I will uh, stop it here. Uh, but I think what I wanted to say is that women, they have knowledge, but I think they are prevented uh, to really use that knowledge for uh, addressing climate change issue uh, because they have poor access. Uh, to resources, poor access to um, to institutions, poor access to poor access to outside decision making forums, and of course poor access to skills and tools. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madhav. Next, we we'll go to Sato to to briefly give a introduction and, and talk about what you do in Botswana. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation and giving me the chance to share my experience with you. Uh, my name is Tata Supang and I operate in Botswana. I am a farmer and as well as a founder of an agribusiness Botswana, a platform supporting and empowering the agribusiness sector in Botswana. So I came up with this idea because I live in between two different environments. I am a farmer and I also have the ability to go into the city, so I experience both, uh, both lives. Let me first start by giving you the agri sector um, set up in Botswana. Agri agri agriculture sector in Botswana is inherently vulnerable to climate change. And this is bad because uh, it is already vulnerable to the semi-arid climate which, uh, in, which severely limits agricultural production. Arable farming is, sever is severely hampered by unfavorable agroclimatic conditions including endemic droughts and high summer temperatures. Erratic rainfall average about 450 mils per year. Actually, now we're getting less than that. And rainfall season varies from year to year and is uh, punctuated by periods of severe droughts. 
My country has over two thirds covered by a desert and only leaves about 5%, which is uh, suitable for cultivation. So you can see how severe the situation is. In short, agriculture is very, very difficult as it is. And now that we're in the face of climate change, things are becoming much, much, much harder. Women are a bigger part of the rural communities, and that means they rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. Um, the agroclimatic conditions largely threaten the food security in Botswana, so we end up uh, taking a lot of our food from neighboring countries such as South Africa, Zambia, and others. This is very bad because we have up to 80% of all our food coming from outside, so you can imagine what would happen if the borders closed. The government sees agriculture as a top priority and invests heavily in it, but uh, we see, we'll still see situations of uh, agriculture uh, include putting up a very little um, contribution to the country's GDP. So most people are ending up uh, looking down on this and seeing it as a political, as a political thing, as a political a hobby. So most people are turning away from agriculture, which is really um, worsening the situation. Women are more affected by this, obviously, because uh, they don't have the physical strength to go to the cities and find these hard labor jobs. And so they're left at, uh, at the farms to take care of the, the sickly, the elderly, and the, the children. So we end up having a situation whereby we, women also are in need of markets. So what we did is, what I did, I came up with a way of finding out uh, a solution to this problem. Agribusiness Botswana offers information dissemination through ICT platforms. We also support this with events such as Kotla meetings, Kotla is award, it's our community. We have meetings with these women and we share, experience, we share their experiences and their feedback and look at uh, how we can offer solutions to them. We also have offer market access to these women as they can simply sell their farm produce from their farms through the use of SMSs, through the use of the um, online portal, and they can also buy inputs from the, from directly from the platforms, meaning that they don't have to leave where they are to the neighboring um, villages or to the cities and towns. They can actually, from the comfort of their farms, find out uh, the, pro the, the inputs they need, the price, and they can leave home with the relevant money and know what they're going to get. So um, I think uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, so now we'll go to some individual questions to the panelists. Um, I'll start with uh, Sue Carlson. Um, and maybe this is as, as a le uh, first question. Um, Sue, can you give us some examples of what women farmers are saying about the weather in the region and what would they need to improve with, with this weather information to improve their production and food security? Okay, well, thank you, Bob. Um, well, you know, we're around the world, we're a mosaic of size and diversity of what we grow, size of our farms, and the availability of information, um, technology, how it's received, and how it's used. So it's hard to have just a one size uh, answer to any of this, but I'll try to give a few examples from around the world that may um, kind of uh, accentuate what women farmers are up against. Um, they often don't know what the term climate change means, but if we talk about weather, what's happening on their farms, they say the weather's changing. It's more extreme, uh, longer, more difficult drought periods, heavy rains and flooding, shorter growing seasons for some, and for some longer growing seasons. Um, and the effects of climate change for some, like for us in North Dakota, for Finland and uh, the northern, very northern parts of the world, Climate change is helping some of those farmers by expanding crops that they can grow, uh, more grains and cereals that they weren't able to grow in the past. And then for others, um, it's really changing in a negative way. Um, it's also introducing new pests and diseases that they hadn't had to deal with before, funguses, um, aflatoxins in, cor in corn and in, in ground nuts and peanuts. Um, we just had vomitoxin in our winter wheat, and that can happen anywhere when you have too wet of a season. Um, and um, uh, 
and difficult in drying and keeping it stored well. So it impacts their yields and it impacts the crop quality. Um, you know, I had a lot prepared and I don't want to take up more time than I should, but I can see how women are resilient and changing. They don't even realize they're doing it. They're innovative. They're trying new things like drip irrigation, um, buying manure from farmers and putting on their fields, doing some minimal tillage, finding information on growing more trees to capture and store that carbon. I see that happening. Um, they want information on how to more organically control pests that they have. Um, I get emails about that. What can they do about it? And I'll flip through some pictures here in a little bit just to give you a flavor for what they're doing. Um, Rose is one of our members from Uganda on our Women's Committee, and she tells me the government of Uganda, through their Ministry of Water and Environment, is promoting a tree planting project where it incentivizes those with land from five acres and above to to plant trees. The landowner prepares the land, they're given these seedlings to plant, and then the farmer maintains the forest with the help of the government money until the trees are ready for harvest. The government identifies markets for the landowners and then they can sell the timber. So, the, And then the Ministry of Energy and the Mineral Development Ministry also urged families to use energy-saving cooking stoves to reduce the burden of firewood. So this is helping them not only um, increase their yields, have some new crops like um, uh, jackfruit and different pines and f other mangoes and other fruits, um, but she's learning how to harvest water and to use it for watering livestock, for irrigation, and for their home use and they're reducing their wood and fuel and using more biogas for cooking and lighting. So this not only is um, good for the weather because they know they're storing and mitigating and adapting to climate change, um, they also then have the next step of having cell phones and having weather information, accurate and local weather information. And I guess um, though that's just an example of from Africa. We have them all over the world. In Indonesia, they're working more collaboratively, um, working together to get this information. I think co-ops is a, a good idea, and women have strong grassroots networks and are doing that. And what do they need to improve their production? Well, I think they're seeking this information out, but it's how this information is given to them. And I think that's where what I hear women saying and what Evelyn said this morning is we need to listen to what the women want and what we hear them saying is they want mobile phones. They want local, accurate, current weather information and they want to be able to respond to that. And for many of the women they're illiterate and so they need it in a simplified format. So those are the things we're seeing. Um, in the US, yes, I can turn on the TV, I can have the radio, I can turn on my mobile and app. There is access to it, but we shouldn't take that for granted. It didn't happen overnight. It was because of research, um, a commitment by government to put money into universities, into our land-grant universities, and through extension that this information is shared. And why can't we have this around the world? It is a commitment uh, policy from governments to be able to make that happen. And I don't think we should take that for granted, and I think we should work to share that information. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. We'll now turn to Philip, um, who's, who's aptly in, the, in, in the, the meteorological or climate department in Vanuatu. So Philip, in regard to, let's say, climate information or weather information, what do you think is the most important factor that prevents women from using this information for agriculture? As climate scientists, we often forget about those people that, are, that will use the information. We often use scientific jargons that prefer uses of the information to really you know, digest the information and make decisions based on the information. So it is important that we as climate scientists or as a service provider, we have to get to the users, get them, tell us what they want from the information. In other words, how do we simplify the information to make them better use the information? So it is important that we go out to the rural areas, all community meetings with the different groupings in the community like the women, 
uh, youth group and see if they can understand the information that we give out. From there, we can build a bottom-up approach that we can come up with a product that is suitable for, for, the, for the women, for the, for the different groupings in the society to, to use the information. So it is important to really simplify the science and also to make them understand the science that we're talking about. For example, what we've engaged in, with the, in the Pacific for the last five years is we try and make people understand what is ENSO. People have been living with tropical cyclone for, the, for all of their life, and they understand what is tropical cyclone. When we give out the information, they can relate themselves to what, what is you know, the different warnings. But with ENSO, it is a really new thing for us. So when we give out information on drought, and so it's like uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, drought, and extreme rainfall. So we engage uh, with the committee on developing what uh, a short animation, because it, it is really difficult to people to understand the movement of the warm pool from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific. So we develop a short animation for them to really understand the movement and how it links to the activities, especially with agriculture production. So, when we launch this animation, people then become more aware what is really ENSO. So you simplify the science, link, make these linkages uh, known to the community so that they can re really relate uh, these events with, 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 with what they engage with. The other thing that we, we find is re uh, engaging with different sectors. We have to make sure that the information that we provide suits the different uses that we engage with. You're talking about agriculture, you're talking about fisheries, you're talking about NGOs. So the language that we use in the products that we give out have to us to suit the needs of the different uses. So we have to engage with them, consult with them, what, what type of wording, what type of format do they really need, what type of maps, images that they want. So when they use and they disseminate using the networks, the end users, the can understand and make decisions based upon these, these products. Thank you, Philip. I'll next turn to Christina. And you've done a, a lot of work, uh, as you mentioned, in, in several regions of the world, uh, in Central Asia and also in Central America. So what has been your experience in developing partnerships uh, for building capacity and, and, and opportunities for information access, and also You've had experience with cooperatives. Can you maybe just share some of your experiences on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Um, you have, uh, um, experience by oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I have a, a very good experience uh, in all my years working with uh, WHO, building partnerships with FAO and the agriculture sector. And um, this, these partnerships have been proved to, to be uh, at, the, at the field level some of the most effective that I have ever uh, had. Uh, then, for example, let me share with you a recent one of uh, an experience that we have working in Central America with a large initiative that was funded by the um, Spanish Cooperation Agency. Uh, the, the initiative was targeting uh, children malnutrition, okay? So um, it, it was a long-term uh, initiative and we were working with populations that were coming uh, from the guerrilla. So uh, they were populations, the, like 60% were under the level of poverty, uh, no water and sanitation, and we found uh, that their kids uh, where, like the average in the community, 60 per, more than 60% of the kids were stunted. So, you know, the intervention was to reduce stunting children and to promote nutrition. How we did it? Uh, we were uh, promoting family agriculture, and this was done uh, with extension services. The extension services were great. Most of them, they were men, but, you know, women seemed to like them a lot. That it, was, it was fun. They were having fun. And, uh, and, and they were really excellent and provide a platform uh, um, to pass messages, to pass information on, on weather and meteorological services, 
to pass information on more um, environmental friendly ways of growing uh, food, how to bring traditional seeds that were completely forgotten because these communities that we were targeting were eating three items. The dietary diversity was, you know, tortillas, café, and another cereal. They, the ladies, the mummies in the houses, they didn't know how to cook because from the guerrilla, you know, their mummies never taught him how to cook. So we brought chefs, you know, to, to help them uh, to cook the food, the new food that was traditional food that they were having in, the, in their gardens. So these extension services, this partnership with the agriculture sector was um, an excellent uh, opportunity to promote health because we uh, increased the dietary diversity at the household level. We decreased uh, foodborne diseases by 50, 60 percent. And we open a door uh, for, you know, for, for accessing information as uh, they were uh, weather and climate services. Now, in relation to the cooperatives, in relation to the cooperatives, is a completely different um, experience because they were cooperatives developed specifically for indigenous women farmers. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this cooperative. It's 30 years ago, it was established uh, uh, in Guatemala, Cuatro Pinos, and it's an integrated farming cooperative just for indigenous women. And it provides all services that a woman farmer can dream about to be, you know, to be successful. You know, from uh, you, you have daycare for their children, you have health care, insurance, uh, of course, information, access to information, uh, to weather and climatic services is uh, every day. But they also have grants for primary and secondary education, uh, of, of matological services, oral health services, all kind of health services, and even you know, services to help their kids to assure that their nutrition is going uh, smoothly and they are growing well. So this is the places where I can see, and I can see a difference between women in other regions and women in Central America. Women in Central America will not look for their information on whether on a TV or in a phone. They will go to the association. Uh, they will go to the extension services. They will the places where they live, they, you know, the first thing that they will think is not, I don't need a phone. They will not say that. They may need a phone for something else, but not for that. They will definitely look for the information in their women associations. And, you know, the extension services, the work in El Salvador has led to many independent uh, new uh, women associations that work together. So I think that the, the message here is, to know what are you what are your communities, what they ask you for, and you know how to you can respond to them. Great, thank you, Christina. As you probably aware, we're, we're trying to do a lot of things in an hour and a half, <clears throat> and also we have some um, logistical issues, so we only have the interpreters for about another ten minutes. So I want to open the floor, and please, uh, I'll talk slowly for any non-English question, um, we, we want to use the services of the interpreters. So does any, for any non-English question, so we can hear what you're saying and, and, and talk back to you, anything we can talk about right now from a, a non-English uh, speaker, so we can use the translators? Please. Merci. En fait, ce sont deux observations que je voudrais faire suite à, à notre expérience. Donc je me représente, je suis Madame Bayazitoun, je viens d'Algérie. Je préside une association nationale dont l'objectif est l'intégration du genre dans le processus de développement rural. Voilà. Et toute ma carrière a été en milieu rural, bien entendu, puisque je suis agronome de formation. Alors, par rapport à ce qui a été dit tout récemment par madame, qui a travaillé dans plusieurs pays, sur l'agriculture familiale, je voudrais rebondir et dire que, bon, rappelez que vous savez très bien que la FAO a décrété l'année 2015, année de l'agriculture familiale. Et c'est une excellente opportunité, justement, 
pour justement promouvoir, euh, j'allais dire, euh, l'utilisation euh, de semences qui ont été longtemps, vous l'avez dit vous-même, abandonnées, de semences locales qui euh, présentent souvent et ont prouvé par le passé une rusticité et qui pourrait être une réponse peut-être aux variations euh, climatiques puisqu'elles sont adaptées au contexte pédoclimatique du pays. Et alors à ce propos, nous avons une expérience, notre association travaille en ce moment sur un projet avec une autre association pour créer, justement, constituer plutôt une banque de semences locales. Pour partir de là, et justement, euh, ça permettra en même temps, comme vous l'avez dit, de manger sain. Premier point. Le deuxième point sur lequel je voudrais aussi rebondir, c'est la vulgarisation. Alors effectivement, euh, je pense que la vulgarisation doit, euh, si vous voulez, concerner plusieurs volets. C'est-à-dire que on ne peut pas faire de la vulgarisation uniquement sur les données météorologiques, mais il faut pro profiter justement d'avoir les agriculteurs, les agricultrices, puisque nous parlons des femmes, pour leur parler de tout ce qui les concerne, y compris des problèmes euh, quotidiens de la vie de tous les jours, des problèmes de santé, des problèmes d'éducation et des problèmes techniques, et notamment les problèmes des informations. Parce que quand vous leur parlez que d'un... Ça, c'est l'expérience qui parle. Lorsque vous leur parlez que d'un seul aspect, eux, ils ont leurs préoccupations. Ils ont les préoccupations de santé, de vie de tous les jours, etc. Et donc, c'est comme ça qu'on peut amener la motivation et l'intérêt. Voilà ce que je voulais dire. Je veux être clair, votre question était à Susan ou à Christina To which... Oui, ma question, enfin, en fait, c'était plus une observation pour aller dans le sens de ce qu'a dit madame, pour conforter ses propos, que j'ai relaté notre expérience, notre projet. C'est plus une observation qu'une question. Ok, we, we heard question, so thank you. Any other non-English questions so we can use the, um, our fantastic interpreters? Please, in the back. Merci de m'avoir passé la parole. Moi, je m'appelle Namoji Lucie. Je viens du Centre Régional Agrimètre de Niamey. J'interviens pour faire un peu de commentaires. Ce n'est pas une question que je voudrais poser, mais je voudrais parler des services que nous fournissons au niveau du Centre Régional Agrimètre. Le centre agrimètre régional Agrimer, c'est une institution du SILS, Comité Inter-État de lutte contre la sécheresse. Ce centre est situé au Niger, à Niamey, en Afrique de l'Ouest. Et les services que. Ce centre a été créé depuis 1974 et bénéficie de l'appui financier du, de l'OMM et aussi de la coopération danoise. Et le service que nous fournissons, c'est que nous octroyons des bourses de formation aux ressortissants des pays membres du SILS. Et, et je voudrais parler de, de, de l'appui de la coopération danoise que nous avons bénéficié de 1999 à 2007. Cela nous a permis de former 234 euh, personnes. Donc, les filières, les domaines dans lesquels nous formons, c'est d'abord l'agrométéorologie. Nous avons formé 65 personnes, dont 19 femmes. Et le pourcentage des femmes s'élève à 29. Au niveau de la protection des végétaux, nous avons formé 66 personnes, dont 38 femmes, soit un pourcentage de 58. En idéologie, 49, soit avec... 14 femmes, euh, soit un pourcentage de 19. En instrument, nous avons formé 39, dont 6 femmes, soit un pourcentage de 15. En master, nous venons d'introduire le master, euh, le cycle de master euh, en changement climatique, en gestion intégrée, en gestion des terres durables, en sécurité alimentaire, en gestion intégrer des ressources en eau et en environnement. 
Mais pour ce tapis, ce tapis nous a permis seulement de former le master en environnement. Nous avons formé en tout 15 personnes, dont 4 femmes, soit un pourcentage de 27. Euh, euh, donc, c'est juste ce que euh, le service que nous fournissons. Nous fournissons également de l'information. Nous produisons de l'information que nous diffusons à l'endroit de nos usagers potentiels. Donc, c'est juste euh, un petit commentaire que je voudrais vous faire. Et là, les femmes qui sont formées aussi, il y a certains qui sont dans cette salle. Peut-être qu'elles peuvent intervenir pour pouvoir me compléter. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Thank you for that. In, in, the, in the interest of time, so any other question for our non-English? We'll get to questions, don't worry, I'm aware of that. So with that, our, in about five minutes, the, the interpreters are free to go. So what we've done is that we've distributed a, a sheet of paper with a question on it that's central to this session. So just in a matter of time, I'd like to have each of you try to think of what would be the um, the gaps and how do we address these gaps and more importantly what are the solutions looking at training and capacity development that we can help ensure improving the use of weather and climate information by men and women in agriculture and food security. So please write this down and I want to be very clear that we're going to synthesize all these in a session during lunch and we'll present this in session five in the afternoon. The same thing is happening downstairs in the other session in 4A. Um, and we will also synthesize the high-level high plenary. So please, we need your input. Remember that the goal of the conference is to come up with some concrete um, uh, suggestions and ways forward and recommendations that we can use. And I'd like to challenge the group. You've been here for now three days. Have we missed anything? So you've been here for two and a half days. You've maybe heard the same things. What have we missed? And so please write that down. This is your chance to give us input. Um, so I think what I'll do for the rest is, is go through the rest of the panel. We'll have try to summarize from their point of view what they think and then open up for questions. So please, Madhav, I'll give it to you. Okay. I think um, uh, regarding climate change, I think two things are, are very clear. We have uh, knowledge gaps and we have uncertainty to deal with because climate change uh, comes uh, without uh, much warning. So this is how, and women, uh, children, and elderly, uh, they are affected the most. I think this, we have all talked about it. Uh, in developing countries, like countries such as, my, my, such as mine, Nepal, uh, there are three issues, I mean, first, the climate change knowledge exists at global level, IPC level, and we talked about that knowledge is not very useful uh, to farmers and to women. And at national level, because climate change, we have been talking about just for the last 10 years, so there's a, you know, a sort of obvious gaps. There's a capacity gaps and there's a knowledge gaps. So what local people have is traditional and uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, but as a, a Asian Development Bank said, you can't solve tomorrow's problem with yesterday's knowledge. Uh, so although I'm a fan of indigenous knowledge, but I think indigenous knowledge needs to be uh, integrated. I mean, the modern knowledge, integrated knowledge have to talk to each other. They have to uh, come together and to, uh, if we make uh, indigenous knowledge, like uh, women have a lot of knowledge, and they have this barrier which I talked about, but I think if we can uh, bring modern knowledge and skills uh, to, to really help them uh, to, uh, to uh, adapt and to, uh, to mitigate hazards, I think they can, uh, they can be resilient, they can address. So for that, what uh, my uh, solution is that uh, we say, information has to flow faster than flood. So first end-to-end -end kind of uh, uh, you know, solution that you, you connect uh, the impact. Like in our country, uh, the floods come because uh, the, in, the, in the hills, uh, they have denuded the forest. And that then, so that there is a flash flood, and it inundates uh, very valuable farmland. So what we have convinced them is that you need to, talk, uh, to take a river basin or watershed approach so that impact 
and uh, what you call the flood impact and flood source problems and uh, impacts are connected. So this uh, interconnection is what uh, we are suggesting and I think regarding this knowledge, uh, uh, the Director General of UNESCO suggested, we are in, uh, in the IPBES, so what we are suggesting is that we need to build synergy, we need to have conversation between the two knowledge system, uh, two communities, and we need to complement each other, and we need to also integrate. So that's my first uh, take. And second, I think we talked about um, uh, this capacity building training. And I would like to say one training uh, is not enough. I, I, I was a head of a forest college and I said, if you want one uh, faculty, you train two or more. And I convinced USAID to train two, so that half of them never came back. They stayed in the US, but still we have faculty to teach. So I think training, retraining, and I think training more women, I think this is solution I think which we need to do. And the training uh, is a kind of not a capacity building. Capacity building is much more holistic. We need to have, as I was saying, the institutional capacity building, like a med service, a hydrometrological department, I mean, they might train uh, people, but I think capacity building is the whole institution. When a person like WMO gives a scholarship, I think uh, these people have to go and be training of the trainers. Uh, they should be sharing what they have learned and build the institutional capacity and knowledge, corporate knowledge. I think this is what our uh, solution, and the, another one, the last one is, I think uh, I read somewhere that the Zimbabwean woman was saying uh, empowerment of women to me is the money in the pocket. So yeah, I think climate change also, if you want to address climate change, if you get hit by climate change, and you can, uh, if you have money in the pocket, if you can diversify your livelihoods, I think you can be much more res resilient. That's why women in Nepal, they have women's cooperative, they have, um, oh, they are uh, like the, self, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of accessing veterinary services, agriculture services, uh, and they are women exclusive community groups. And they are now uh, also engaging into income generating uh, uh, sort of activities like growing non-tumor forest product in the forest. So they have money in the pocket, so they feel empowered. So I think this is my solution. Thank you. Thank you, Manda. Very good. Uh, next, I'll turn to Thato and talk about, um, again, from your perspective in, in Botswana, uh, you have the benefit of looking at two environments, as you talked about, the urban and the rural. So what do you see as a solution uh, in helping women to contribute to food security and agricultural issues? Please. Um, like I said, um, in Botswana, I don't know if many, if some of you share the same experiences, but we have uh, cases of uh, de departments working in isolation, working in silos, and then the work not really merging and benefiting the people is where it's made for. So in Botswana, we have uh, um, Department of Agriculture working there on agricultural issues. We have med services working there and delivering data that is not really analyzed uh, um, to, to benefit farming. And then we have the health sector, and then we have other, the manufacturing sector. The manufacturing sector is looking mostly at, um, at, the, at the urban industries. So they, they really talk, they talk about agriculture, but they don't really, if you look closely, you will not see any projects on agro-food processing. So we have that problem of uh, different organizations working in isolation, and then the, 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 the information that they're, they're doing that the gathering does not really benefit the farmer because, for one, they don't know the farmer. When they make these uh, forums, when they make these meetings, they, they invite uh, commercial associations because they are the more recognized. And then you end up having a situation whereby the, the decision makers are only um, given one point of view, one, one side of the, the farming world. And then the, the women and the, the rural communities that end up not having their voice exp uh, expressed. They end up having things that are dumped on them and they, they don't really benefit them in any way. So the, the, the women at uh, the rural communities have realized that they don't, they, they've lost trust in the government. They look at the government's uh, initiatives as uh, something that's out of obligation. So they just see it as worthless. They see it as, uh, as not really practical because it is not practical. Those decisions are made not from their feedback, not from their experiences, but from different people. So what I see um, as a solution would be having training 
having information readily available all the time, and having feedback. I feel, I feel feedback is the most important because you will not know what you're doing, you will not see your impact, and you will not know what to do if you don't know who you're working with. Because women are different. I'm a farmer, but am I the same as the people, the, the other women uh, in my farming communities? No, I'm not. But I do feel the same burden. Like, uh, I remember, let me tell a story. I remember one time, um, uh, uh, my farm was there, I had farmed and I was ready to harvest the following day. It was green, it was beautiful, it was perfect. But then, in the morning, in the early, early morning, frost came early. It came earlier than it was supposed to. So I woke up to a field of brown, useless um, crops. So you see, even the, the, the weather, the, the med services don't communicate the relevant information. Frost did, it doesn't usually come at the time that it came at, but they did not say anything. They did not tell anyone. And I'm sure it was not just me who lost all that. So what, are you gonna, what, what is a woman going to do whose only livelihood is dependent on that farm and it has been bent? What, what, what is that woman going to do from there? And another thing is um, I don't like the, the idea of women being viewed as vulnerable or as victims because society has a way of, vict uh, of, uh, of taking, looking down on the on the victim and um, putting shame on the victim. Women are important and they have influence in the communities and we always do, do choose not to look at that aspect. We always look at, oh, they're poor, oh, they need this, oh, they need that. So I think as part of a solution, we should really look at engaging women. Look at their strengths, look at what they're doing. And uh, another thing is, uh, I like to share an African proverb with you, it says, um, if every single person in the village cleans their yard, then eventually we'll have a clean village. So it doesn't matter what you do, if the next person is not working, then my leaves are gonna go be blown into your yard. So let's work collectively, as, let's look at countries at, uh, for that situation, and let's work together so that we move together progressively. Because otherwise, my leaves are gonna be blown into your yard and your efforts will be defeated. So, thank you. Thank you, Thrakta. I think at this point, um, we, we've, we've heard from all the panelists, and uh, I'm curious to, I know, um, trying to get some interaction from the audience. Again, I encourage you to fill out uh, any of the, 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 how to address these gaps. Um, at this point, maybe go to the audience for any questions, and then we'll come back to the panelists to see some final thoughts, things that they want to stress and maybe they were missed from the audience or things like that. So. I'm going to actually start with people on the side. So, Linda, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I would like firstly to con congratulate the, 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 the presenters. Um, my question is uh, directed one uh, to the World Farmers uh, Organization. I think um, it's around the global framework for climate services. Um, and um, one of the components is uh, the, the interface platform. Um, may you provide us maybe with guidance on how we can go about using that interface platform uh, at an international level and regional and the national level and tapping into the network that is there, so that we can start coming up with uh, implementation plans that will address some of the, the questions that are being raised around uh, is the accessibility of information, information that is provided in a relevant manner uh, that will address the needs of, 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 of the women. And then the other one is for uh, Ms. Ms. Tato. Um, I am uh, really encouraged and impressed by the fact that we also have young uh, uh, people who are into farming. Uh, food security is very important for our future as well. May you please share with us, uh, maybe you do have programs around uh, youth uh, uh, development and what can be done uh, in ensuring that if you do have those programs, how can we make sure as MET and Climate Services interact with the uh, agribusiness or association addressing the issues of youth? 
Then um, my, my last question is uh, to doc, uh, Dr. Kaki. Um, it's around um, the indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge. I'm really impressed with the work that's being done. But the question is, is the information being recorded? And if uh, it's also recorded, is there um, a, maybe a platform where we can link the, the knowledge that is recorded with also science and, and answer some of the questions and do a little bit of research around that? Thank you. Thank you. So just to the panelists, if we can um, do a quick response and I can help add to that, especially for Susan. Well, I would beg if I could get back to you on that. It's a really big question um, that you've asked. And let me give it a thought. And um, can I address it at the end when we have a time for, I think I'd be better. OK, thanks. If, if I can add. Sorry. Um, so we, WFO and WMO have a memorandum of understanding, and we've been participating in their events, and likewise they've been participating in our events. So we have a good relationship, um, and, and we're targeting even from 2015 to do some events on, on the climate framework of climate services. So it's a discussion we're having. Just for your information, they met with the Secretary General yesterday, so we have a very good interaction with that group and the farmers. So, please, Madhav. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, this work on uh, documenting indigenous and local practices, and indigenous traditional uh, kind of, uh, um, and local practices are, local knowledge and practices are used synonymously because uh, as yet, uh, there is no single definition. Uh, so what we have done is this work is just completed for Asian Development Bank. So we are submitting this report. But at the same time, and this is done for the government of Nepal, uh, for their PPCR pilot program in climate resilience. Uh, so we will have some, and some of these practices, uh, we would like to post it on the website of uh, LDC, Expert Group uh, website, which is a UN triple, UNFCCC uh, website, and LDC means least developed country, developed country, uh, 49 of them, and the uh, majority of them are from Africa. So they will have access. Uh, but at the same time, since I'm nominated, I'm uh, working as a task force member of International Platform for Biodiversity, for Ecosystem and Biodiversity uh, Services, uh, this is a UN forum, and uh, what we are trying to do is we are developing part of the processes and approaches of uh, documenting. At the same time, we are also suggesting what are the mechanism of work bringing these two knowledge systems together. Uh, and that would be, of course, the public domain uh, knowledge, and there is a large group which is working on it. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, indigenous traditional knowledge sometimes become a bit, uh, I would say it's a hot topic because it's related to intellectual property rights and also uh, intellectual, uh, because indigenous knowledge is very contextual knowledge, very cultural knowledge. So uh, it doesn't talk really has a solution about access and uh, property rights issue. So sometimes, uh, you know, you are looking for all solution, it doesn't provide. But what does it do, and this is what I was stressing, is for climate change adaptation, which is essentially and inevitably local, uh, I think the foundation has to be local practices. Thank you. Thank you, Madhav. Tato, do you want to respond to the quickly the question? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mom Linda, for the question. It was on: Do we have any programs uh, for youth for youth development in agriculture and food security? We actually do. We have a, a program that's called YEM, which is Youth and Agriculture Movement. This we look at uh, youth in different um, levels. You see that. Uh, Nowadays, people see agriculture, people relate agriculture with poverty, and so they stop the young ones from going to the farms. They actually don't want the young ones being seen as poor and um, taking up agriculture. So we look at different levels. We start at primary school education. There we have agriculture, which is uh, um, studied by all. And then as you go higher, it's a choice. And we realize that it, the, the, the numbers in there are very low because kids see agriculture as 
as dirty, as work intensive, as useless, because they want to go to offices, they want to be, they want to wear suits, they want to be at the cities. So what we do is we have these different activities that are set at different levels, from tertiaries to unemployment. And Botswana is hardly hit by unemployment in the youth area, in the youth sector. We have the youth that covers up to 60% of the population, so you see that it's a big problem. And looking at the agricultural sector not performing as it should be, it's, it shows that we need more manpower. So all that youth that is unemployed needs to be diverted back to agriculture. So we do have the, that <clears throat> program that uses different um, platforms from the ICTs to the forums. On the ICTs, we have a library where anyone here can share any information regarding anything about agriculture. We also have links that um, go on to anything, uh, any websites about agriculture, and we have events. We have forums where uh, uh, these uh, youth uh, learn from um, more experienced farmers. They learn from um, these research organizations, and we have uh, career days. So the, 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 the program is there, but the activities are coming up slow because of uh, lack of funding. And I actually found this interesting because I've been talking to the uh, to the Botswana College of Agriculture on making uh, things like this that show uh, the, the youth that they are actually careers in agriculture because they see it as, they don't see it beyond uh, the farm. They don't see it at, at uh, stages of uh, research, of all these other, like all these careers that are here today. They don't know that. They don't know that they're actually, they're actual careers in agriculture. So it's very important that you raise that question and I thank you. Oh, and to add up to the youth, we also have uh, business briefs. I've come up with a concept of making business briefs, of looking at uh, an agricultural project and packaging it into a business brief that shows that if we have this much land, you can do this much and you can end this, because youth go where money is. They, won't wanna go. they don't care about food security much. Thank you. Thank you, that's very good. I, I just want to address the, our colleague from Lebanon. Would, would you want, did you have a question from... The previous session? No. Okay. So we'll go to this gentleman here, please. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Anjal Prakash from EC Mode Nepal. My question is to Dr. Karki. Interesting presentation indeed. Um, I just want to ask you is, uh, especially in the mountain region, when, uh, you know, and you, one of your statement was that economic development is key to uh, empowerment and also capacity building, uh, especially in the context of climate change and adaptation. Uh, now, when we see at uh, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, there is a huge migration of uh, out migration, male out migration uh, to different countries like Gulf countries and all that. And then that has a lot of social implication. It also brings in remittances, and I think Nepal is on the case where remittances actually contribute a huge number of the GDP, uh, a, a kind of a double-digit percentage of the GDP of, of uh, Nepal. How do you uh, look at this? Because there has been differential debates on uh, migration as an adaptation response. How do you look at this uh, uh, issue? Thank you. I think this is true for Africa also. A study somebody said when climate change happens, men migrate and women adapt. So I think this is, uh, I think adaptation, migration, I think has been now agreed uh, in literature also as one of the adaptation strategies. And uh, the remittances uh, have become very significant uh, contribution to not only uh, to, the, to the families, but also to the national GDP, at least in Nepal this is the case. Uh, but the challenge is uh, that uh, this remittance is, uh, one, it is basically going for consuming. Uh, basically, it's just being uh, buying, ensuring food security. So once the jobs are gone, then food security, insecurity will happen. The another one is uh, most of the migrants, they actually do not come back to the uh, villages, which means if they come back, uh, they could add to the local economy, they could uh, build, uh, you know, infrastructure which could make the whole society resilient. So I think our challenge is how to plow back the uh, uh, remittance uh, income uh, to the village, to the, uh, uh, so that there is no feminization of agriculture. That means that larger agriculture like the agriculture could be, uh, land could be pulled together and more commercial farming could happen or the, the women's drudgery could be reduced by uh, introducing small uh, machineries. And uh, like uh, Susan was mentioning, now we, we have to do for climate change uh, more 
uh, I would say this eco conservation agriculture, uh, which means that it has to be, uh, I think, done at a landscape level. So I would say there are um, uh, opportunities. Uh, migration, I don't think, is a negative. Uh, we could uh, find solutions uh, which could be win-win, but uh, I think right now they aren't. Uh, but I think for that, what we need is uh, we need the skills, and these migrants also bring skills, but how to harness the skills and finance, and then, or, then uh, sort of target it to make the whole society resilient. So this is what I think is very important for mountains all, uh, as it's for dry land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we had a question back there, please. Thank you. Uh, this is Rajendra. Rajan Radhikari from Ministry of Agricultural Development, Nepal. Uh, I have two questions and one submission, please. Uh, my, my first question is, the capacity building of uh, rural women is quite cr uh, critical uh, for this uh, goal to achieve here. And from our experience, what we have seen is, the women have been very much effective when they are working very um, uh, collectively. So, uh, with the panelists, uh, can, uh, can you share the best examples of incentive and accountability system uh, that we can uh, promote uh, to develop the, uh, the capacity of uh, these uh, rural women? Um, uh, my first question is. The second question is, from your perspective, how the government can actually contribute uh, to, this, uh, to this goal? Uh, and I have one submission as well regarding the informations that actually uh, we need to uh, provide to these um, women. Uh, we are talking about the impact of uh, climate change and weather to women, but uh, more importantly, I believe is we have to talk about the impact of climate change and weather and all these things to, to the family and the children as, um, as well. And how these informations can actually be is, um, collected and disseminated to them in the way that they can use and uh, communicate as well. So that's my uh, submissions. Thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll take maybe one question in the back, and then we'll have the panelists try to answer and, and wrap up, I think. Please. Um, hi, thanks for a very um, enlightening and interesting uh, set of presentations. Um, I kind of wanted to comment on um, the two, two things that I heard, one from Botswana and the other from Nepal, um, and add a question at the end. Um, I think it's very important that uh, you brought up the issue of not treating women as victims or uh, beneficiaries, and that goes to the whole question of if we are talking about gender equality and women's empowerment, then uh, shouldn't we be talking about something more than just delivering a service to women which changes the conditions of their existence? Shouldn't we be talking about delivering the services in a way that actually changes the status of women? And um, I think in that context, I think it's very important that the grassroots women's groups get seen as a stakeholder group in all these different conversations and dialogues, and that we have more uh, formalized and institutionalized engagement mechanisms that enable uh, groups to uh, different stakeholders to communicate and collaborate. But um, I also wanted to say something about uh, the gentleman from Nepal's statement that capacity building is much more than training. And I think very often institutions are stuck on training as the only mode of capacity building. And if you look at how uh, organizations and individuals learn. It's very much by doing, and and so I, I believe we have to have to resource that doing and practicing collectively. But also, I'm concerned that sort of combining these ideas that if you look at where communities get positioned in research 
invariably they are a little bit victimized by researchers and, and, and this includes those of us who do you know documentation of best practices and so on and I, and I wonder if you have ideas about how do we make sure research uh, that engages communities is actually fun and interesting and usable for communities and that they get as much out of it as policymakers get from collecting this information. So to move away from this very extractive kind of research. Thanks. Thank you. And then the gentleman in the blue shirt in the back, please. OK, thank you. My name is Max Oft. I'm from the Association of Indigenous Village Leaders in Suriname, South America. Um, I have one question, uh, which is, um, I think, for Christina. Uh, I'll get back to that because I didn't write it down. And actually, uh, some remarks on the question you posed to us on, on the paper. Um, first, it was mentioned that traditional knowledge should be integrated. Um, and I would add to that first a recognition of traditional knowledge, a kind of formal recognition of traditional knowledge as a valid knowledge system, because um, that doesn't happen. So in, in a sense, it's kind of floating and everyone is saying it, but it, it's never written down as such. Um, I would like to make the remark that it should be handled with caution, because I've heard it in several of the work, working groups, uh, in, in the sense that, um, like Mr. Uh, from, from uh, the IPBS, said that it, there, is content, there are contentious issues, in, particularly with regard to intellectual property rights. The, the, the experience is too often that our communities um, make available knowledge, but it are the researchers and the scientists who run away with it. You know, we have this experience in biodiversity. We know the biopiracy experiences in many of our communities where people just collect plants plus the knowledge and make patents out of it. And the communities stay poor as they were always. So that relates to my other remark, and that is capacity strengthening, like you said, is, is much more holistic. And it must be um, bottom up because people often, too often design things top down. And that's, that's the same for information, weather and climate information is designed too often top down. So it never reaches because nobody understands it, nobody actually gets the message if there's no telecommunication, for example. If it's um, you know, done in a different language, on, on paper, to people who cannot read. So if the design is not good, the information will never be used or may even not, never be um, reach, reaching the community. So my concrete recommendation is that it must be a bottom up. Um, that there must be capacity strengthening in a much more holistic manner, and that may start with even basic education, you know, being able to read and, and um, in a foreign language, actually. Uh, another recommendation is a, a rights-based approach, first with regard to the uh, issues of uh, traditional knowledge, um, but also because in, during the whole sessions, uh, the three days we've had, uh, we, we spoke about agriculture, uh, health, um, uh, food security. These are all rights, rights of women, of people. And if we do not phrase it and frame it like that, it still becomes like something, a surface delivery. And that's not what we're here for, I think. It's because we're... Um, concerned about the rights of people, and in this case, more particularly of women. So that would be my other recommendation. Um, and oh, I know the question for Miss uh, uh, Christina: whether land security has been has been incorporated in the Sustainable Development Goals or not. Security to land. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you all for the questions. I think we need to respond and then maybe the final thoughts um, from each speaker. So just to try to recap the questions, um, we had a question on looking at accountability um, and how the government can cont contribute to this goal. We had an issue of can delivering the service actually change the state of women um, and looking at traditional knowledge and the, the previous question. So, um, maybe I'll go to Christina because you had several to you, but then I'll go through each one to respond from your point of view on the questions. Please, Christina. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I would like to uh, respond to the first question about the family agriculture uh, from the lady from uh, Algeria. Um, the, one of the best experience that we have got working with extension services and family agriculture was the fact that we were working with the family nucleus, that we were working with the man, the woman of the house, and sometimes the kids, the children. So that was the beginning of the work, and, uh, and these uh, extension services, they were not only focusing on information on weather and meteorolog meteorological services, they were giving all kind of information for sustainable farming and nutrition sensitive adaptation and mitigation strategies in the agriculture. Then, you know, from, from uh, drip irrigation uh, to you know, ways of uh, um, growing food with no pesticides, etc. So it was uh, broader than that. But one of the experience that was great was to work with the woman and the man of the family together because they also learn power and equality uh, issues, you know, by working together. Uh, or keeping the kids while the other person was doing something else. Then it was quite interesting. Uh, now, um, coming to your question and to your comments, uh, I have not seen anything in the last test in the World Assembly. I did not see anything about land security as such. So, you know, there is still some room an opportunity for uh, influencing that. And coming back to your point about education, I think that that was one of the uh, points that uh, I really wanted uh, to comment, because uh, after so many years of uh, um, working in trying to empower women, that has been uh, what we consider the bottom line, the, the best approach to assure change in the future. Or, or to avoid barriers in the future. And the difficult thing has been in countries where they don't want, uh, where they don't want to send girls to the schools, how we have done it. And we have done it as a, uh, as a strategy to adapt to climate change and to reduce uh, nutrition. So it has been like a win-win. And I can tell you some experiences in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and coming back, fame zero in Brazil was this way. Um, the, the idea has been to improve girls' education. It has been through a school, uh, um, feeding schools, through the feeding schools. So in the schools, uh, yes, the girls' enrollment in primary schools went up up to 28% through school feeding. But if you were giving a ration to these girls to bring back home after the school, uh, the girls' enrollment in the highest prim primary grade surged by up to a 50%. So, you know, we were um, getting many co-benefits of these strategies. And Brazil, I, I, they went further. They decided that 30% of all the food that was delivered to the schools have to be from local farmers. And they have this fame zero based on this and all this program of... Uh, uh, food acquisition. So, you know, it's, uh, it's all around education, what you were saying. Thanks. So, Susan, uh, respond to the questions from your point of view, but we'll have another round of final thoughts. Oh, okay. So, if you always want to combine them, I'd... I could do both. If that like. would be great. Okay, I think there were a lot of really good questions. I think a lot have been answered, some good suggestions. Um, I think one thing I'd like to address was how can research be found interesting and usable? And I think we could expand that a bit to the technology that's um, also available. How do we do technology transfer? Because it's terrible when all this work goes in and then it isn't translated down to the farmer, the woman that or man, the family. I guess it's implied we're talking about families here. It's the woman, in my opinion, that is often the glue that holds the families together, especially on the farm. We're doing it all from the home to the farm work to raising the family. So I guess it's implied, and I'm sorry if I didn't say that enough. And um, 
But I, I think that that's one of the key questions. How can we transfer this technology? And one of my inspirations is a woman from Malawi. Her name is Alice. And I had her with me at the Commission on Status of Women. And we went to a big technology uh, conference. And at the end, there were questions, and it was very technical, and she was just wowed by it all. And she had her hand in the back raised, and no one would answer, call on her. Finally, they did. And she said, this is all well and good, but how can I get this on my farm in Malawi? Wow, that's the question. And no one had an answer for her. We were at the Global Compact. And it is striking. Yes, we have all this information, but how can we get it to the farm? So we know right now, we're talking about weather and the impacts it has on women, and in this session on women farmers. We know they want local, accurate, simple weather information that's pertinent to their farms and on a daily basis. So I think you know those are things that we can do to transfer the data you've collected, the technology that's out there, to get um, empower women not only for weather information, but through mobile phones. As Gibbs said this morning, that's not the end all, but it is an opening for social stability, um, for health information, for, for market to buy directly uh, from their uh, farm co-op, to for just a plethora of things that we've talked about. I won't have time to go over every one of them. It's not that I don't agree because I haven't said it. We just don't have the time. But I believe that once we empower women and we encourage them to step up into decision-making roles, much of this will change. And I think by tra transferring that technology, by women becoming more informed and having powers of position, I think we will reach their villages because once we have one or two women empowered, it quickly catches on and these techniques, the opportunities to um, adapt their farms, to change practices, to know when weather is changing, will improve their yields, it will improve their livelihoods, it'll improve their farms, and it'll f improve our world's food security. As you gave all the statistics this morning, we know that women farmers are providing this, and if they had that opportunity for equal access, their yields would improve, hunger would be eliminated, and poverty would improve. So, that's my thought. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, Philip, uh, please, uh, you know, um, try to answer the, the questions that you, you know, you feel in drug to you and try to give a, a follow-up summary or a, a conclusion. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll just refer back to, to traditional knowledge. It, it is really important that, that, that with this, uh, trying to get the different perspective on different indicators that we have in the different societies and incorporate with it modern science. These are way that we feel can really make information understandable to the people at the, the, the users at the community level. So for make them to better use the information and to make decision making so. But we have to take into consideration that in some parts of the world where I come from, traditional knowledge come in different levels. So we have, that is, uh, the indicators that is common to, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the ownership of the knowledge. One that is open to the, the whole community, what is owned by the tribe and individuals. So when, when we try to make these uh, indicators or the, the knowledge available to the community, we have to make sure that we understand these different levels of, of, of knowledge that, that exist. Uh, what, what I would like to uh, end with from, from this panel is as we have heard in the last three days, to empower women to participate in, in to better understand climate information, weather information, and in this case to participate actively in agriculture or food security, it is important that we let them understand the science, simplify the information so that they can really <clears throat> make good decisions so that they can have a better living. And secondly is partnership. We have to work, not only the climate scientists, not only the med services, but we have to work together with the agriculture people, with different sectors, to make sure that women actively engage with food security. Thank you. Great. Manda? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have uh, several questions. So quickly, I think the capacity building and accountability 
Uh, my experience has been that women who uh, mostly uh, and in South Asia, I've worked in South Asia and Nepal, they, they practice these collective actions, which means there are uh, always in groups. And when they practice in collective uh, uh, mode, uh, there is this peer pressure and peer, I would say, the requirement of transparency that accountability comes uh, automatically. In fact, uh, not automatically, but mostly they are more transparent, accountable, and also democratized uh, sort of institutions. So I think there, uh, this, uh, this uh, collective actions, I think we, we have a good, good accountability. Regarding the what government can do, I agree with the gentleman that uh, we, our first recommendation is that the local efforts made by these uh, collective groups, uh, women's group, have to be recognized and supported. Often women's group, I think, uh, uh, are not really targeted to provide uh, external support or government support. I think the support has to be targeted because they are uh, behind and so we should not just, uh, uh, you know, fund uh, I would say the institution which are rural, basically it should be women-led institution that should be supported. Now I think the several questions regarding traditional knowledge, I promoted medicinal plants for 12 years for IDRC, so I know all the uh, sort of issues. Uh, in this uh, research we have been very careful that we don't do extractive research. Uh, when we <coughs> went to the community, we practiced this, uh, you know, FPIC, means prior informed consent, means we informed the community from district to community. We had a lot of shared learning dialogue type of, uh, um, you know, documentation. And then it's uh, to avoid extractiveness, what we did, first we gave what we understood uh, and uh, we saw that there, they also benefit from our knowledge, from our perspective, because we bring uh, rather broader learning and so this was appreciated and I think this has also provided the community with some, uh, some benefit. Now regarding capacity building, and uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, lady asked question, I said capacity building is not training. And training, capacity building much holistic, capacity building always should be, uh, should be combined with knowledge management. <coughs> Uh, the capacity building has to be uh, benefit, has to be uh, to be given in risk with knowledge, traditional knowledge, and then modern knowledge, and we need to make it very targeted. So this is what our our efforts is, and then uh, of course um, uh, we we also uh, make that the research, the research uh, you know, is a very uh, kind of a debated topic. The how research can benefit communities. We have made sure that we have promised we will share the report in local language with the communities and we will also try to follow up with the some policy actions so i think this is a kind of a uh, you know uh, is a, a kind of a professional obligation which i feel my last thoughts two thoughts actually uh, empower i think they i agree yesterday somebody said gender matters so i really gender matter women matter but i think they need empowerment they have this inequality situation uh, so empowerment has to be uh, through knowledge, and the knowledge has to be applicable, accessible, affordable. Remember the three A, uh, which I think is important. Knowledge should not be supply driven, it should be demand driven. I think we talked about information, uh, which should be usable uh, by, by the uh, local groups. Then only I think information has value. And my second is, uh, I think, uh, to fight climate change, uh, livelihoods of those poor and disadvantaged communities, especially women, have to be improved. And then uh, climate change also requires this, what we call the safety net. And then diversified livelihood will provide safety net. We need to provide the safety net to the women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madhav. And I think it's appropriate that we started with a, uh, a woman farmer and we'll end with a woman farmer. So Tato, please uh, address any questions uh, that you feel that you can address and then some final thoughts uh, from your perspective, please. Thank you. Where I come from, the, the last person to participate or to eat is viewed as the king, so thank you for the honor. Um, you said, how do we find, uh, how do we deliver services in a way that actually changes the state of women? Well, climate and weather disasters affect both men and women. So the moment we, we need to share tailor-made information with all in the communities that are affected. The moment we choose to, 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 uh, to help women is when we are increasing the mindset of that women are victims and they are more vulnerable and then it takes them down. 
So we need to move away from that and we need to empower both gender and move for gender balance. Women should be told what they can do, what they are capable of, their potentials. If women should know that with their bare hands, they can not only feed their families, but they can move on to feed their communities, then their countries, and maybe even their regions. They need to be told on what they can do. They, we need to focus on their strengths and help them move forward with that. We also talk, we're always talking about women empowerment, women empowerment this, women empowerment that. What about men empowerment? How do men get to where they are? Everything is silent around that because we don't, we don't put a light on that. So how can women need empowerment and men not? And then, but they, they get the same. So I think we should move away from this whole women empowerment because men also have empowerment, but we don't say anything about it. And so it appears that they are superior and they're just made like that. We all have strengths and weaknesses and we can, if we really look at both, they can complement each other and we can have a community that is um, balanced, a community that moves forward progressively. And on the last thoughts, I would say that, uh, like I said, if you clean your yard and you don't help me clean mine, you're going to find my leaves on yours. So let's move forward together and let's help each other. Well, thank you. And with that, I know we started a little bit late, so we're just maybe 10 minutes over. So I think that was, I think, pretty good with a jam-packed session. So thank you so much. I'd like to applaud the panelists. And also applaud the audience for the participation and good questions. And again, just a reminder, please, if you have any comments uh, on how do we address these gaps on the, on the sheet of paper we, we um, distributed, please send it to me, give it to me, or give them to Asha on the end of the table there. Um, you're now free for lunch. Um, we will reconvene at 2.30 in this room as a plenary for session five on how we can put these all together uh, among all the, I believe, five sessions during the week. So thank you and uh, bon appetit.
So, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, uh, dear members of the family, uh, we are coming to the last session, uh, which is called started speaking. Some of our rapporteurs are still putting knowledge together. So, but uh, what, uh, what you will see on the podium in a few minutes, you will see 14 people, of them seven men and seven women, who formed a fantastic team of our rapporteurs from all the se sectors and all the thematic sessions, and they will report uh, on the summaries. But before I will start uh, with reporting, uh, I would like to uh, give, a, give us um, just a few seconds excourse in the history to put this conference uh, in the context of all our efforts in WMO in the gender mainstreaming. Uh, we, think, we thought that it's very important for us to, to put this, to, to see how this conference is uh, nicely contributing in, in, in the gender mainstream effort. So, following the 95 uh, uh, World Conference on uh, Women of the United Nations, which have been mentioned here so many times, and Beijing plus 20, every one of us knows what it is. So, the WMO uh, have stepped up in just a few, a little time, and in 97, WMO convened the first meeting at that time at Cold on, on the participation of women in meteorology and hydrology. That was in Bangkok. That was the very first gathering in our community, and it looked in the, partici in the participation of women in our profession and set recommendations to women professionals, National Med Services, and WMO. These recommendations were adopted. In 2003, WMO hosted a larger conference on women and meteorology and hydrology. That was in Geneva, and that was the beginning of my career in WMO. It was just one of the first conferences I have been immediately involved in the organization. I remember how it was. And uh, this conference uh, discussed and stressed the need for uh, implementation and accountability for many measures on gender mainstreaming. And it also agreed on a number of actions which should be taken by women professionals, such as promotion, participation, and career development. So it was uh, basically looking inside the community of meteorologists. Um, and the result of this conference, uh, in a few, uh, few months after this, uh, we have developed the policy, double more policy on gender mainstreaming. It was formulated, and uh, in, within our governing structure, Executive Council, uh, we established the advisory panel of experts on gender mainstreaming. So, uh, 
sometime later after this in 2009 when we had when we hosted the world climate conference uh, which was a uh, event uh, which launched uh, J uh, global framework for climate services we had a forum on uh, gender and climate and it made some good recommendations so that's where we came to this conference so we are hoping that this concluding session will really show us how far we have gone this way and how specific we became and how more action-oriented we are and how broader we became, how we are reaching beyond community of meteorologists and how we are making linkages for meteorologists to work with all the partners and colleagues in, uh, across different sectors. So with this little introduction, I would like to immediately uh, uh, request uh, mm, rapporteurs, uh, one of the uh, group of rapporteurs on disaster risk reduction uh, to give his uh, report. Um, this will be actually a synthesis report uh, of the uh, three sessions hold, held on this. You can put the slides already as I speak. Okay. Um, but before I do it, I would like to recognize the key lead people who prepared all this session and all this. It's Jay Wilson from WMO and UNSDR, and lead rapporteur would be speaking now, Mubarak Mabuaya, and the other rapporteurs is Alex and uh, Alex Makaragi, Makarigakis, I'm sorry, <laughs> and Dean Salofa. So, uh, on behalf of the team, Mubarak, you have a floor. Ten minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I I'm privileged to represent the group on DDR to present the outcomes of uh, the session uh, over the last three days. Um, and uh, we have two major parts of the presentation. The first will be the key issues, and the second will be top recommendations. And the rapporteurs and drafters are acknowledged as listed on the first slide. So, sorry. so in terms of the main issues, the, one of the key issues that emerged from the discourse of the DR sessions, DRR sessions was the limited attention that is given to women's competence and skills in disaster risk management and mitigation. The, the conference did acknowledge and recognize the fact that women quite often stay in their communities in the case of disasters with the children, whereas they, their husbands, their partners leave them there, and that they have demonstrated um, critically important skills in terms of resilience. But that these competencies and skills have not been harnessed sufficiently and have not been given attention to inform um, uh, other resilience building measures. The second point that was uh, presented during the discourse on DRR was the ineffective early warning systems and there are two perspectives to this. The first being that quite often the information that is given as part of early warning is inaccurate and the second being that even where the information is given, the community members rarely use it. And that the number of factors that explain this, in terms of inaccuracy, when you look, for example, in the context of tropical climates, there is not sufficient infrastructure to give location-specific um, weather and climate information. And as such, the general information at times is inaccurate and could be misleading. And where the information is not used, probably it's as a result of the lack of trust. For example, if uh, communities are warned about impending landslides and they hesitate to leave because of the fear that they may lose their land or other livelihood uh, assets. The third point that emerged from the discourse on disaster risk reduction was the fact that whereas the number of policies and laws that address women's human rights and more so property rights, the enforcement of these legislations is weak and that severely constrains their capacity to recover or their capacity to diversify their livelihoods in the event 
of uh, disasters. The discourse also highlighted the critical issue of technological, social, and economic barriers as a key um, limiting factors in terms of effectively using information and communication technology in delivering weather and climate services. The discourse underscored that whereas uh, there is increased usage and penetration of, for example, mobile phone technology in many of uh, the countries, and if I may talk for Africa where I work, a country like Kenya, you'll find 70% of the population have a mobile phone. But again, when you study, for example, the Airtel Kilimo, which is one of the services that a private uh, telecom service provider uh, uses as a platform to deliver agricultural advisory services to farmers, weather and climate information, as well as issues to do with marketing of their produce. Out of um, an estimated 5 million smallholder farmers, you find that only 7,000 farmers have registered to this platform. And of these, only 30% have been able to access information from the platform. So that clearly shows uh, that the utilization of this technology has not been fully harnessed and yet provides good, um, a good platform for being able to reach particularly the rural areas with uh, the vital information on climate and weather. And we also, uh, it also emerged from the discourse that there are also social barriers. And particularly when you study, uh, for example, police gender desks um, in uh, the Great Horn of Africa, these are specialized uh, units within police uh, offices that deal with issues of domestic violence. The number one reported trigger of domestic violence in these countries is the use of the mobile phone. And as such, you'd find that there would be also social barriers in terms of using the mobile phone, particularly in, in uh, contexts where they, you, you do not have uh, very productive uh, matrimonial relationships between spouses. But also more critically important that issues of literacy or illiteracy for that matter among women limit their capacity to, for example, read uh, SMS messages more so if they are delivered in English or any other language that is not um, close to their, um, their, their traditional dialects. The other issue that came out was working in silos and particularly the issue of weak linkages and partnerships between uh, the national meteorological and hydrological uh, services as well as the users of this information and in this we are talking about the different sectors for example agriculture health education um, of, of, of these weather and climate services that these these weak linkages have not um, provided the necessary leverage and synergy to be able to use the existing infrastructure and opportunities such as extension workers who are sectoral to be able to integrate climate and weather information within the extension services delivery. In terms of recommendations, what emerges from this session is that we need to invest, we need to invest, and the word here is invest heavily in NMHSs, particularly those who are the providers, to deliver improved gender sensitive services and to scale up good practices. The session revealed a number of good practices and initiatives by intergovernmental agencies, by governmental agencies, by civil society in delivering services, in delivering uh, information and services to farmers to be able to uh, build their resilience in the wake of climate change. In the picture there, this photograph, um, we picked it from one of the dailies in the Great Lakes region yesterday. Those children are not dead. 
they woke up in the morning went to school while at school he trained heavily and on the way ba their way back home they found that a stream they had to cross had flooded they could not be able to reach their homes all they did was to sleep under that tree but what is intriguing again is that even with floods there's a woman in the background who is pregnant and she's from the well she's been fetching water so how do we ensure that the communities in this area are able to receive timely information to inform their planning and to inform decision making about for example transport and about the different services about water harvesting and other measures the sessions also do recommend the session also does recommend establishment of affirmative action measures to attract and retain female staff in geosciences and through this we see curriculum development as an entry point to ensure that the stereotypical presentation of science as a male subject is changed and reformed and that specific targets are also set by way of attracting and recruiting women in those agencies that deliver meteorological uh, services enhance the capacity of service delivery sectors to use tailored weather and climate information for informed decision making at all levels and here we're talking about right from policy level up to the community level we're also talking about sectors like agriculture sectors like health like education like energy to be able to use weather and climate information as an integral component of their services delivery we do recommend uh, strengthened partnerships through stakeholder platforms with gender machineries and by these we mean ministries that are responsible for gender and women's affairs as well as agencies such as UN women and civil society that deal with gender issues with um, um, uh, Oh, and, and on, on issues of disaster risk reduction at all levels and through these partnerships should be able to create awareness on the gender dimensions of weather and climate services and to be able to empower them to engage the relevant stakeholders in mainstreaming gender in their work and also to be able to tap for example women as champions uh, in delivery of weather and climate information to other women through their networks and also for example at the uh, international level for WMO to work with UN women to be able to ensure that the 2015 post 2015 um, uh, development agenda uh, on issues of climate change disaster risk reduction and the sustainable development goal frameworks all um, pay sufficient attention to gender inequalities the session also does recommend documentation and dissemination of case studies on indigenous knowledge we learned that women have a lot of knowledge tacit knowledge knowledge that they use to ensure their survival in the wake of disasters but that this knowledge has not been effectively tapped and used as part of a broader knowledge management framework and to inform the design of appropriate uh, mitigation measures the session also does recommend does, does recommend promotion and collection promote the collection and use of gender disaggregated data on drr to inform the design of targeted interventions as long as we continue to report about Two million people displaced or 600,000 people di displaced without finding out who are these people are they women are they men are they boys are they girls with different uh, socioeconomic groupings we will not be effective in terms of designing the responses that address their unique and different needs so the session does emphasize and recommend the promotion and collection of sex and gender disability data and its use in planning and programming finally 
the session did underscore that addressing gender dimensions of weather and, and, and climate services is not something just for the mates alone. We did recognize that some of the action is beyond the scope or mandate of meteorological and hydrological services and that it would require complementary action by other stakeholders. And to this, the session does recommend the support for livelihood diversification, and this is a message for other actors, for example, FAO, FAO, so to say. The other recommendation is around strengthening policy and legal frameworks to protect women's property rights, and this is a message that may go to institutions that are dealing with legal justice or even gender machineries, and then also a message around livestock and crop insurance. And this, again, speaks to those that are dealing with risk management in the broader sense. On that note, I wish to thank you and also remind you that tomorrow uh, will mark, I think, the first year of the Haiyan, Typhoon Haiyan, at times called uh, Typhoon Yolanda, which killed 6,300 people in Philippines alone. And I think for us as a group on DRR, this session has been very timely and want to use this opportunity to associate with those communities that suffered Typhoon Yolanda and in a special way to honor the lives of those people who, uh, those people who lost their lives during the typhoon and also the communities that probably still continue to pay the price of Typhoon uh, Yolanda and in general the people of South Southeast Asia. I thank you. We warmly thank Mubarak and all the RR team for this presentation. And probably I should have said in the beginning, I hope you understand that um, with this time frame, uh, we have chosen to give a highlights and the most key important topics. Uh, but the re reports team uh, have put together a lot of uh, more specific recommendations and a lot of details, which we will all summarize in the summary of, of the session and uh, in the publication of the conference. So nothing will be lost. But this is the best effort of the teams to highlight what is the most important conclusions they can uh, communicate to this session right now. So now it turns turn of health team. And I'm pleased to uh, remind ourselves that uh, Hali Kutwell and Elena Villalobos from WHO and WMO have been leading organization and preparation. And the rapporteur's team is Gerald Fleming, Niri Raholajo, and Judy Omomumbo. So Gerald will be speak for, on behalf of the team. Thank you very much. We had some very interesting and very lively discussions, both uh, after the plenary session of health, which was held here uh, yesterday morning, and the workshops which followed, uh, one up here and one downstairs. But when we looked at all of the issues that were raised, we found that really they divided into six strands. So we have six strands and a recommendation for each of them. So if we could take a look at the next slide, please. We have it here. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. So, the recommendations really follow into th six, as I mentioned. One is about the need for more research. One is for better engagement with social and behavioral sciences. The need to develop gender-sensitive communication strategies. I think that's probably common to many of the themes. The benefits of moving to a low-carbon society and the particular implications that has for health the partnerships with the health communities, which are crucial, and a focus on females in education and outreach. So for each of these, a recommendation and some issues. So to start with the first. First recommendation is to promote and encourage cross-disciplinary research, which links climate change, health and gender, in order to develop sufficient information to adequately inform policy. I think we'd all agree that policy needs to be evidence-driven. We did hear that there is actually very little research available in linking these four issues. Plenty of research in climate change, quite a lot in climate change and health, 
but when you get to climate change, health and gender, and then add on policy development, it becomes very, very thin indeed. So a lot of work needed here. And in particular, as we've heard from other speakers and will hear probably again, gender disaggregated data often not available and right down to community level. Another area of research which is certainly badly needed is in social and behavioral sciences. So the recommendation is to engage with those sciences to help us inform our information and communication mechanisms to lead ultimately to improved decision making. Lots of issues under this heading. It's a development within the Met Service community now that I think there is an increasing realization of the need to understand how weather and climate information is used. We're very familiar with putting it out there, but understanding how the user takes that and applies it to their decision making is key. Part of that, and particularly in uh, severe weather situations, is a better understanding of how people appreciate risk and how they integrate that understanding with other aspects that they will have uh, to consider. This leads on to impact-based forecast and warning services, which not just talk about the weather, but communicate specific behaviours which are designed to protect personal and family health. And a recognition that this is a very, very complex issue. Gender and diversity are just pieces, important pieces, but pieces of a much, much larger puzzle. Communication strategies. We have to get the message out. We need to recognise that there are some gender-specific barriers to accessing weather and climate information. Some of these are technical, technological, some of them are cultural. As we've already heard in the case of DRR, we cannot assume that putting a message on an SMS or a mobile phone or even a radio will necessarily reach both genders in a transparent manner. There may be implicitly and inherently uh, a sense to favour one gender over the other. We need to understand this and we need to focus particularly on communication pathways that are used by and familiar to women if we want to reach the female gender effectively. Promote awareness that moving to a low carbon economy and society will have as a secondary effect perhaps but a very important effect improved public health outcomes, especially for women and children. So there are strong linkages, as we know, between climate change and increased hazards such as vector-borne diseases. But we also heard how indoor and outdoor air pollution are key issues, and particularly indoor air pollution affects women and children in the developing world to a very significant degree. So moving towards a low carbon economy would improve outcomes here. Other aspects would be transport systems and nutrition which could be improved through this mechanism. Encouraging NMHS is to engage with the health community to bring together health, weather and climate experts, both for joint training and for operational partnerships. That means both training health professionals in the use of climate data, indeed even the existence and accessibility of climate data, and training climate experts in the needs of the health communities. One example we heard was where co-located climate observing stations and health sentinel sites led to much better understanding of the two data sources. This would also involve engaging female health actors and a recognition that work working through the health system would by itself bring a gender focus because the health system is necessarily gender focused in providing in the female case maternity services, services for young children and particular focus on male issues too. So you automatically bring a gender discrimination and focus to any information that is fed through the health system. And to remember that animal health issues are often also important here, both because animal health issues can become human health issues and because they can affect economic livelihoods in themselves. And finally, a recommendation to encourage NMHSs to develop education and outreach programmes with a particular emphasis on science education for girls and women. Now, this is seen not just to encourage more women into meteorology and to become meteorologists, though that's obviously something that uh, would be desirable, but to encourage and improve the general understanding of science as a discipline and an activity within communities so that people who understand better how science works will have more faith, if you wish, 
in science-based outcomes and advice. So improving the understanding of science in the community, developing outreach programs, educational programs with schools, especially girls' schools, and also programs reach right into rural communities, that they are not just urban-based. That, of course, is a resource issue in very many often, but uh, rural-based and rural-focused training programs will have a better opportunity, better chance of reaching through into the females, the mothers and the children. Thank you. So our great thanks to Health Team and uh, Gerald on pre presenting the uh, highlights on behalf of the team. Now we turn to Water Team. Uh, you see on the podium Bruce uh, Stewart and Anatea Brooks, who were lead organizers of this session, and also uh, Bruce will be lead rapporteur. Uh, on behalf of colleagues, rapporteurs Isabel Riboldi, Anahit uh, Hosiyan, and, and Angel uh, Prakash. I'm sorry, I'm having a lot of notes in front of me. <laughs> I'm trying to read the names cor correctly. Thank you very much. So, big team, Bruce, you, you have a floor, please. Thank you, Elena. The, the main focus or the main titles of the three water se sessions held yesterday were strengthening women's role in the water sector, ensuring climate information reaches women users and empowering women to participate in water science and policy. But I think everyone would agree that attended the sessions, the discussions were in effect far more wide reaching. And therefore, I'm fairly sure and hope that you would recognise that it's very difficult to reduce nearly five hours of discussion to just 10 minutes. Um, and sitting here, I did notice too that if you were to substitute water for DRR or health, you probably have listened to my presentation already. Uh, but perhaps I'll just use some different words and um, hopefully won't confuse you even more. The main issues that, that came to light during the, the, the three sessions were that the, the climate, weather and water nexus is indeed multifaceted and a linear approach is not going to be sufficient, will be insufficient. We must address the gender differential needs, recognising, I think as Linda said, one single blanket cannot be used when dealing with women who are, who've come from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds. It was also pointed out and recognised that women have limited time and in many instances are overburdened. So the, the solutions and that that we bring forward really cannot impact on their already large workloads and so must be built into their current ways of working. And in effect, I think it was Nicolene said, we have to recognise the risks that women deal with, <coughs> that, that there are many and climate and, and water are just f a few of those and therefore we have to recognise that, that we're dealing with just one element of their livelihoods and their working lives. And so again, we've got to, to recognise that. Weather and climate information is often delivered late, sometimes not understandable, and not addressing the real needs of users. And when we do develop that up, we really need to make sure that people have an understanding that they can, a, a response or an action that they can put in place. To, to respond to that, those directions. I think Yota gave us a very strong evidence that water and peace can be closely linked and that access to water can lead to conflicts. And so we need to take that into consideration as well. Further issues that were raised were that gender inequality is embedded in socio-cultural socio context and gendered expectations. And this dictates women's careers choice and how science is viewed. Um, this is difficult to achieve, but we really need to address the issue of retention in, uh, of women in, in scientific careers. And women need to have a voice at the community level, in actual fact, obviously at all levels, but particularly at the community level for in, uh, influencing local policy. Moving on then to, to the recommendations. Recognising that the water sector, as I said, water, climate and weather is multifaceted, really we need to target interventions at all levels, from children to youth to adults, 
across all levels of cap capability and capacity and meeting a wide range of needs. There, there are lots of directions that we could head into. One of those was to empower those at higher levels to gain influence, and AMCARMET was seen as a good example of how that can be achieved, getting the, the Ministerial Council of Meteorological Ministers together and, and having them speak with the one voice and, and giving information to the community. To compile gender disaggregated indicators, and we've had that mentioned already, uh, and UN Water through the World Water Assessment Program activity is addressing that from a water perspective. But with, within the disaster risk areas we've mentioned as well, the linkages between all these areas are just so, so strong. We need to target those at greatest risk, the poor and the disadvantaged, and understand their perspectives and their needs. And there was a good example provided from Bangladesh of some work in the extension area that was addressing this topic. Repeating a little bit of what others said again, that we need to develop partnerships and improve coordination amongst different stakeholders and different, uh, especially already existing projects. And this is one of the strong focuses of the Global Framework for Climate Services, which looks at all aspects of, of the climate service delivery. And I think the user interface platform of that will be a strong uh, capability in terms of dealing with these sorts of issues. Others have already mentioned uh, the communication issues and, and much has already been said, but I suppose the key point in this, this context is to use the right communication technique, but also to keep it brief and simple and easily understood. Information must be made to measure, must be provided in local languages, must be, but must be needed and received by those communities. We had a lot of discussion about Indigenous knowledge, but one of the things that hit home to the, the drafting group was the example of Uga in Uganda, where there was an effort to look at and determine what the scientific basis was for so much of the Indigenous knowledge, because it is there. And that, was, uh, that would enable building trust between the local communities in that their indi Indigenous knowledge was understood and the scientific community. And that trust is an important element of, of achieving change. Just moving on to the last slide on recommendations, um, the, it was suggested that schools should have hands-on access to uh, water and weather facilities, uh, things like a weather station in, in, the, in the playground and visits and career talks. And much of that happens already, but perhaps it could be more targeted to, towards girls and, and, uh, and, and young women. Certainly we need to emphasise the societal value of, of, of scientific careers and create and maintain networks of young women in water professions. And there was a very good example provided of that happening in Kenya and also through, through UNESCO. We should recognise that positive discrimination in hiring and promotion of equally qualified candidates is just a start to addressing some of these issues. And also establish family leave for uh, mothers and, and fathers. Finally, we should scan all policies and programmes through a gender lens and make sure that they meet the requirements of, of, of that, um, of, of, of the gender uh, dimension. Um, a lot of the challenges that are on this slide have already been covered, um, Elena, so I think I, I, I will move on. Um, I'm just looking through them, and I think they have already been picked up by other speakers, so I'll, in the interest of time, I'll move on. Um, as a, as a group of writers, we decided that as we, we can co-create the future we want, and, and I think that's, that's a call to us all here to work closely together to achieve that. Thank you. We thank very much, Bruce and all water team. And um, now it's the turn of agriculture and food security. Uh, you see Rob Stefanski and Selva Raju who is on the front row, he will come here later from FAO, uh, but Rob will be main reporter, and with him the work was done by Jose, Jose Camacho, Vicky Newman, and uh, Tabi heller Jordan. So, Robert, the floor is yours, and uh, we are very uh, interested to hear, because you were last session, we didn't have a chance to hear you before, so please, take time. Thank, thank you, Elena, and uh, with me is uh, Tabi heller Jordan, uh, co um, rapporteur and also the moderator of the um, high-level segment. So it, it, this is a challenge actually being last, also on, on the last session and also we're presenting last, so I'll try to highlight 
uh, the key areas that maybe haven't been talked about or further elaborated on. Um, we had only about an hour or so, hour and a half to do this, so uh, we would try to put uh, maybe too much on the slides, but I'll go through that. Um, so the main findings, again, uh, and even from people I've talked to, uh, these conferences are very interesting because we brought together you know, five or six different disciplines, and these are always uh, a very good discussion. Um, so we're not talking to ourselves, we're talking to different people from health, gender studies, gender issues, uh, and it helped us, especially myself, in learning about these issues and ways forward. So again, there's a good technical discussions um, leading uh, a mutual understanding between men and women, but also from different societies and regions we have to uh, recognize also. Uh, and the general acknowledgement um, that women have less access to weather and climate information, and a specific effort must be made to provide required education, technologies, and tools to support women empowerment. Um, a key issue here is that climate and weather services should uh, consider uh, integrating gender considerations in all their plans and developing schemes. Uh, again, have a gender consideration at a high level. Uh, one of the inter interventions was even at the, the parliamentary or government level. That's maybe a bit beyond the, the water and, and uh, weather uh, agencies, but that's a good recommendation. And also, we, we did recognize the need for research, but also it needs to be directed at an implementation level, so action research. Um, there's some discussion in our sessions about this, of making the, the research, uh, implement, uh, making sure it's implemented. Um, spe special needs to be considered when communicating weather and climate information. Um, and even more specifically, recognizing the specific activities performed by women uh, in every region. Um, just some analogies that given um, the news broadcast, you know, is that at the right time of day that women are listening? Uh, and there's much discussion on that in our sessions. Um, what are we doing with the information? Um, is there something that we can lead to this to end result? And there was a lot of consensus on getting access to the right kind of information, just not broadly disseminating information um, and seeing if people can pick it up uh, randomly. Um, building collaborations, uh, not one size uh, fits all situations. And actually we, we came up with uh, sort of the, the last line there, listen to women farmers and farmers in general, localize the information and, and the actions and then leverage it with our collaborations with partners and other institutions. Uh, Tabby, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think, you know, at, at two different levels, I think what made our, our conversations particularly dynamic is that I think at one point we really were saying there's a difference between addressing the symptoms and addressing the root causes. And occasionally it's, it's challenging to differentiate the means and the ends. So I think part of what we were attempting to do is sort of that proverbial chicken and egg question. Should we look at empowerment and what are all the ingredients that contribute to women's empowerment first? Or should we create a bias around the tools and techniques, policies and programs that are likely to invite or at least encourage that empowerment? So I thought that was extremely interesting. I think the other interesting issue is that I think at the end of the day we realize that this is a very multifaceted holistic challenge that both um, requires systemic change but also we have to ensure that we don't bias the solutions either from a top-down perspective nor from a bottom-up but at the end of the day this is truly to be an inclusive response we need to ensure that we're really doing a good job of leveraging diversity in all of its facets. So I do think that notion of one size does not fit all, um, I think was probably a, a core theme in many of our discussions. Thank you. So on to specific findings. And again, we've had the two, these are mainly from the two breakout or working sessions. Um, climate and weather information should move from the technical jargon um, to messages that are more understandable and usable in the local languages. Again, we've talked about that. Um, again, even talking about uh, meteorologists like to use jargon, you know, the upper level vorticity moved into the region and, you know, caused uh, precipitation. People just want to know it's going to rain tomorrow. So we need to really move from that jargon to more easily understandable uh, language for both men and women, um, especially for farmers. Um, again, information provided to farmers needs to be blended with other sources of information. 
um, crop models, weather and health. So definitely cross-cutting issues across the other sectors there. And, and again, delivered as simple products to make decisions um, that every, uh, every farmer could use. Um, there needs to be feedback from the users on the weather and climate information. Um, and the quality and the characteristics should be acknowledged as one component, especially for climate change adaptation. And again, specific plans are needed to fill a gap on education, access to technologies, decision-making schemes for women in the rural context also must be developed. Again, a lot of discussion on technologies, and it's, I think we have it on the next, ah, there it is, okay. So we have the next slide. Um, so again, a better use of networks, and we don't mean weather networks, we mean people networks. So cooperatives, ag extension services, communities and champion or leading farmers. We need to reach out to these. One thing that I definitely learned that can help us in the work in WMO is there's many, many um, networks of women farmers out there that we need to reach out to and communicate with. We need to shape the climate and weather information in a simple and attractive way. Again, for not only women, but for the most vulnerable groups in rural societies. And here's the technology issue is that it is part of the solution, but will not solve everything. It is not a panacea. And again, the weather services should improve the quality and quantity of information targeting farmers and other food producing communities. Again, anything that I've missed or you want to uh, elaborate on? No, just one point, um, which I think you know really was very interesting and exciting for all of us is if we are talking about creating a bias for impact, what are the things that have worked? You know, and in the session we had, you know, the lead farmer example, um, Evelyn Jira example of, you know, what is a hurricane? I mean, at the end of the day, these are stories that are memorable and give us, I think, a very um, user-friendly access point to say, you know, at the end of the day, we don't have to boil the ocean, so to speak. There are things that have worked that we can either replicate or leverage in other environments, not necessarily being formulaic about it, but saying what are the ingredients that contributed to that success? Um, and maybe some of the most simple, uh, straightforward interventions are what's needed to get the ball rolling and to move in a very incremental fashion. So I felt many of the organizational practices or best practices, if you will, um, made a lot of this quite concrete. So I think that was very helpful. And I think with that, thank you uh, to all the uh, participants, uh, moderators, and um, rapporteurs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert Abbey and the team. And um, the last uh, group we have um, to hear is uh, Women and Carriers group. Uh, organizers were Jeff Wilson and Ade Brooks. And the reporter, we, uh, two rapporteurs, we had Vilma Castro and Leo Meng. And Vilma will present the report. I said training. <laughs> So I let, allow me to remind you that the main focus for this meeting was women in sciences, particularly focusing on employment and careers in the national meteorological and hydrological services. Uh, though many of the issues also relate to partner agencies and the users, users of weather, water, and climate services. So, what were the main issues pointed out at this, during this meeting? Uh, again and again, the ability of girls and women to access education at primary, secondary, and tertiary levels, all levels. There are many causes. Uh, we mentioned like ob obstacles that can be internal, lack of self-confidence, for example, or external, can be societal, society, to societal restraints, uh, religion, family, um, and there are many actions, global actions to, to, to address, and they are described in the uh, draft of the conference statement. Um, another issue is the lack of gender aw awareness in teachers that can result in girls accidentally or deliberately being turned away from mathematics and, and physics. Uh, this is an issue that should be taken care of probably or had, UNESCO has a, a, um, to put uh, hands on. 
uh, what kind of, of uh, an example could be, for example, uh, uh, a teacher receiving a classroom and notices that there are many girls and saying something like, oh, I have many girls in my classroom. I wonder how many will make it to the end. That it, it's, it seems harmless, but it's not, it's not harmless. Um, lack of visibility of careers in physical sciences in comparison to others. Yeah, I imagine you, we have seen on TV and on, on the movies, uh, picturing lawyers, doctors, engineers, even cis it's not geographer, ge geologists, but try to remember in how many movies, or if you, do you remember any movie in which the star is the meteorologist? Do you? <laughs> or, well, let's say, support actor? So, really, there is a lack of visibility. Another issue, there is a difficulty in attracting women into the physical sciences to consider a career in weather, water, and climate. Um, there are societal perceptions and stereotypes that picture women as mothers, uh, caregivers, uh, stay-home uh, pr uh, providers of, for the elderly, elderly or handicapped, rather than staff managers or, well, CEOs. And even when they reach the upper positions, there are different communication styles between men and women that may lead to potential miscommunication. So the way a, women's, a woman expresses herself can lead to people say, oh, she's a pushy woman, or she's so stubborn, or whereas a man in the same situation or the way uh, he's already stereotyped it can, can be perceived as a very strong man. So, Uh, we found out that there is underrepresentation of women in science, that the underrepresentation of women in science contributes to the lack of gender sensitive services for women. So, recommendations. One is to integrate national and international endeavors in promoting and supporting women in science at all levels of their careers. Um, another one is enhance and extend gender mainstreaming actions at, and targets in WMO, its con constituent bodies and members and the other organizations responsible for the planning and running of these conferences. What do we mean by this? For example, when there is a regional, WMO regional association meeting, is there a gender issue treated, treated in these meetings? There is climate, there is DRR, there is everything, but I have never seen gender issues in, in regional associations. Um, and we want to do more things and let's stop talking, let's try to do Let's try to do this. Uh, it can be done immediately. We have to increase the visibility and attractiveness of careers in weather. Um, for example, emphasize uh, the, the diversity of careers. Uh, how many of you have been asked for by somebody also, what are you? you? Ah, you are a meteorologist. Can you tell me, is it going to rain today? So nobody perceives us doing something else apart from weather forecasting. There are many other things that we do. We teach, we do research, we work in, uh, well, uh, in water also. So there, um, uh, may, there, there's many who are presenters on television, none, is, none are actors. <laughs> so there's many things that we can do by being meteorologists. Uh, and the following one is the one we ask uh, UNESCO to help, is to enhance gender aware awareness in teachers' education, particularly science teachers. We have 
commented in several uh, instances that um, if the teacher delivers a, uh, something that is uh, attractive to people, and, and if the teacher delivers a message that is very important for the student. Um, another recommendation is to build gender sensitivity into weather and climate services. Um, and this sensitivity has to start now. We cannot wait until more women are educated or more women into the science world. Uh, this, this can be done now. So top actions. Extend and ex uh, enhance and extend e existing mentoring, internship, and fellow fellowship schemes for women at national and international levels. This has been, it has been mentioned before that uh, positive bias at the beginning would be, it would be acceptable, even if women, we, re we really would like not to be what, uh, um, ad uh, what treated as special. Maybe we should accept that at, at, begin, at, at this moment, uh, positive bias is, it, it would be acceptable. Um, uh, we need to develop and deliver context-centered training programs to support gender sensitive ser services to meet the, need, the needs of women in different roles, in different regions, in different cultures, and socioeconomic uh, situations. This has been said before. It, it's uh, the, that not, what is it? Not one size does not fit all. Every situation has, been, has to be taken care in a different way. Different countries, different cultures, and there are some groups that need more help than others. So I think it's important that the groups that need more help should be uh, given special attention. Um, another top action, look for and promote role models, improve the vis visibility and attractiveness of a career, a career in weather, water, and climate. And the last one, easy. Publish and promote the conference proceedings and use the material uh, when reviewing existing publications. And uh, I was suggesting why don't we have a special WMO bulletin dedicated to gender? Because if it's, uh, it doesn't mean that the, the, what the bulletin will not contain anything else, but we've always seen, for example, National Geographic magazines especially dedicated to the issue of water. So uh, it, it's a suggestion, and um, thank you very much. Well, uh, we heard all five teams. They have worked real hard to, to pull on these few slides what is key and most important to the view of the team. Uh, we can assure you that we have a lot more written, which is going to the final proceedings. But then uh, our, role, our job right now is to see how this converges into the conference statement. Uh, and the teams also looked at the statement. So what we would like to do right now is to display on the screen the uh, out, main outcomes, uh, which uh, you already could see in the draft statement, and, and to give uh, some opportunity and actually to request uh, some, some of the reporters to just highlight how what they were saying is reflected here. So essentially, uh, the statement was prepared from the input of all speakers, moderators, and rapporteurs uh, which worked on this conference, and they confirmed it's quite well written. Uh, some fine tuning was made, uh, but we would like to just take us through this uh, few points to, to see uh, how well we can see what, what has been said and reported uh, in the last uh, few minutes into, in, in this document. So we start with um, outcome number one, which talks about improving understanding of gender-specific impacts of weather and climate and the gender dimensions of weather and climate. It also has a highlight on the uh, disaggregated data and gender analysis. 
Uh, uh, though we, I know exactly that uh, each of the team uh, uh, could make a point and could illustrate uh, uh, their, their point in, through this message, but uh, we have agreed that a uh, few would take a floor uh, for this one. In particular, we, would, we could uh, hear a few words from Gerald and then from Bruce, yes, and then from Vilma. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Elena. There were two specific recommendations that we made from the health team which addressed this. One was recognizing the very low level of existing research which uh, took gender, health and climate change into account, particularly policy focused research that we needed to see a focus on that. And the second was the very important area of engaging research in the social and behavioral sciences to understand impacts better. Thanks, thanks, Elena. Yeah, just to, to remind you that um, in the, some of our top recommendations, we mentioned the compilation of gender disaggregate, disaggregated indicators that's being undertaken by UN Water, uh, the World Water Assessment Program activities there. So supporting that. Thank you. It's work in progress still. We are still working, converging and discussing. So, okay, thank you very much. Let's go on the second, please. Second. Um, mm -hmm. This talks about pursuing strategies and structures to increase involvement of women as well as men in the development and communication of gender-sensitive weather and climate services, including promotion of women knowledge and skill. Uh, here I have Gerald also to make a comment. We saw our recommendation regarding the education of women and particularly broadening the general uh, level of science education as being relevant here in helping women to understand and implement better information of climate and weather. Thank you. Colleagues, please, if, if, I, don't, if I don't call you on, uh, to talk and you have a strong point, you just raise your voice for hand, okay? Uh, then we could turn to the third place. Third is um, about um, production actually in communication or delivering uh, gender sensitive weather and climate services. So here uh, we would like to uh, hear from um, Bruce and Mubarak, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, Elena. Again, two of the, the, the recommendations that we had were targeting interventions at all levels. And I think this was mentioned too in, in, the, in the final presentation from, from uh, children to youth to, to adults, but, but in all capabilities and all capacities. But then again, also having that special attempt to target uh, the poor and the disadvantaged, those most at risk uh, and, and um, th those that um, have, have greater need. Thank you. And from DRR, we had two uh, also recommendations. One is around ensuring that we have gender disaggregated data on who receives the information and who uses it. Um, and then also tailoring the messages um, for the different sectors, for example, agriculture, to be able to unpack the climate information and make it usable, make it more relevant to the farmers. So. Um, the same as in health, the same as in uh, other sectors like education. Thanks. Are you fine? Robert, please. Thank you, Elena. No, when we talked about listening to women farmers, you know, one thing that was brought out by our uh, distinguished colleague from Zambia, the weather, the weather bulletin is given at uh, 7.30 in the evening, and most women in that country are in the kitchen cooking or doing something else. So again, making sure that we have alternate ways of, of communicating to, to women, especially maybe through radio, or at times that they are accessible to the information. So that's very important. Yeah, very good point. Thank you very much. Uh, let us turn to the fourth, please. Uh, this is about capacity of women as well as men in climate-sensitive sectors. Okay. As service providers, as relevant authorities and end users to contribute to the effect of production. So here uh, we probably would again ask probably Rob, Robert. Because, um, sure. Yeah. Again, strength and capacity, this is where we get into the networks. Um, when you talk about, again, the relevant authorities and end users making sure they're connected to that, uh, if you will, that value chain of producing all the information. So. Um, there's many, many networks out there at the civil society level. 
um, at the national, even governmental level, um, societies of meteorologists, societies of agriculturalists, societies um, dealing with other health issues and things like that related to farming. So again, when strength of the capacity, again, strengthening those networks and interactions with those networks. Uh, again, similar to what we're doing here is, is we're intersecting five or six different disciplines. This needs to be replicated at a local and national level. Thank you very much. Bruce would like to say anything? Would you like to say anything? No? Okay. On, um, on the fifth, uh -huh. this is about increasing investments in gender-based weather and climate services. Uh, so we would like to ask Vilma uh, and then probably Robert if you wish. Okay, Vilma? Who? You would like to speak? Okay, yeah, please. Limen, we should have, we should have put, <laughs> accommodate you here. Okay, please. Okay, um, we, we proposed that to build gender sensitivity into weather and climate services as an investment on the uh, policy level as well as practical level. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, very good point. Thank you for this. Okay, Robert? Yeah, again, increasing investment, uh, it, it's financial but also human. Again, um, I think the recommendations from uh, the session on careers and looking at that, you know, how does, um, how can WMO incorporate more women? Um, we talked about in our session, um, many different mechanisms we can have as a forum for gender issues, um, and maybe one thing for even looking at the commissions in WMO, dealing with the different disciplines, looking at that. Uh, of course, the increased investment will also take um, our partners, um, our donor partners, so I would even say when we start with um, something that maybe wasn't added in the slides is when we look at projects, you know, putting aside um, some investment into looking at these gender-based weather and climate services in a project from the beginning so we can address these issues. Right, thank you, good. Um, let us go to the sixth. Um, yeah, so initially it was about science only, but uh, we have expanded this to STEAM, which, is, uh, which, uh, which came uh, across the conference. Uh, here I would like to request um, Bruce and Gerald to comment. Thanks, thanks, Lady. It's one of the, the sessions that we had, session 3B, was very strongly focused on this and, and the sorts of things that was suggested was to emphasise the societal value of scientific careers and also, again, the importance of, of networks amongst the various science and technical, technological groups. I think one point that was also raised was that there are a number of scientific societies out there, the, uh, and the one that I'm most familiar with is the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, and I'm not sure that they have a very strong gender focus, and I think maybe we should sort of fo focus on those sorts of things as well. So um, lots of things that we can use in supporting that, uh, Elena. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. Yes, the uh, education recommendation, which was, came from the health team, also addresses this, not necessarily looking at the education of people to the very highest levels in meteorology, but to increase the broad-based understanding of science, and particularly atmospheric and meteorological sciences, among the community as an aid, because, quite honestly, there's little point in those of us who are experts uh, delivering information if those who are listening cannot understand and appreciate that information. Thanks, Gerald. And Mubarak, you. Oh, Mubarak or, or Vilma? Vilma. Uh, uh, regarding this, this, this topic, uh, our recommendations that had to do with this is to increase the visibility uh, of the career and the, uh, to enhance gender awareness in teachers' education. It goes, it's our recommendation that will help with this. One more is uh, establishing affirmative action measures. Affirmative action measures to attract and retain women in the sciences. Okay, then 
Let's turn to the seven. Thank you, Asa. Um, well, this is collaboration and integration. Of course, it's the broadest topic. And uh, we actually consider that uh, the way we have approached the conference, uh, we had a very explicit focus on gender. However, many recommendations which you have heard are actually going beyond they, because that, uh, uh, it only opened, so revealed one of the layer of the issue which we uh, are addressing through this conference. But in fact, uh, the diversity of the needs is huge and it, it, it's coming across many recommendations and uh, what, you, what we are recommending on one or another topic can well be actually relevant to the group of uh, youth or group of uh, others. Uh, so, uh, in here, in the collaboration and integration, uh, we, we, uh, in this whole big scope of different layers and different levels of collaboration, I think the most important thing came through that we cannot do the great business alone. However, uh, as we have focused on weather and climate services, we need to have national med services key in those processes. So, but that's why we have uh, a little bit adjusted this to, to make this point. Uh, I hope it is clearly seen. And uh, maybe we could uh, ask uh, uh, Mubarak and then also Gerald to contribute to uh, illustrating this with your recommendations. Thank you. We um, identified three, three strategic platforms, like the UN World Conference on DDR, scheduled to take place in 2015 in Sendai, Japan. And we feel that WMO can partner effectively with, uh, for example, the UNSDR to be able to further this um, dialogue and discourse on gender dimensions uh, of DDR and weather and climate services. The Beijing plus 20 review process, that's another strategic uh, opportunity where WMO could partner with the uh, UN women, again, to deepen the articulation of uh, uh, gender uh, dimensions of uh, weather and climate services, and then also the post-2015 development agenda, the sustainable development goals, to see how the rollout of these SDGs um, reflects uh, the centrality of uh, weather and climate services, and more particularly ensuring that women access this information. And that this can be further cascaded to the regional, sub-regional, and even national level, where we can build partnerships between med services, gender machineries, uh, and other agencies such as UN Women at country level. Yeah. Thank you. Please turn it. It occurred to us, coming from the health perspective, that uh, a number of the international movements, in particular we think here of the Global Framework for Climate Services and the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, that they were both uh, areas which needed to have an awareness that moving towards a low carbon economy, where it's obviously very necessary in order to mitigate climate change, would also have very positive outcomes in health and in particular outcomes which would be focused primarily or principally towards women and children. Maybe because it's last outcome, maybe Bruce, you would also like to say a few words? Or Bruce, first, Bruce first. Oh, ladies first. Well, okay. um, have you seen all the logos in your program? Have you noticed that? In your program, how many logos do you have? All those institutions, not WMO, not only WMO. Uh, the recommendation uh, is that all we have to ex enhance and extend gender mainstreaming, not only in WMO, but in all, all these uh, people and other institutions that could make a difference. Thank, thank you, Elena. Um, yes, uh, one of our recommendations related to developing partnerships and improving coordination among the different stakeholders. Um, the Global Framework for Climate Service has already been mentioned, and I, and I think we could look very closely at the four exemplar papers that were developed for the GFCS and make sure that they actually cover the gender dimension within those documents, because I'm not sure that that, that has actually been done. So that you know, would be part of this process as well. Thank you. And maybe, Robert, you are the only one team who haven't spoken on this issue. Let's, be, let's conclude with you. No, I think it's, you know, one of the, again, I think when we talk about um, getting feedback, you know, increased collaboration and integration of the programs, um, we do that quite a bit in, in WMO with all my colleagues on the podium and in, in the room. 
And then I think as Bruce said, uh, one starting point is in some of these key initiatives, um, he talked about the global framework for climate services, but we have programs on droughts and floods, and so we need to start integrating those. Also, we have programs on severe weather forecasting. So I think we have a lot of things that we do technically that, again, the outcomes of this conference can help educate us and lead us forward in doing a better job in, in putting in gender considerations in our work. Well, thanks. thank you very much. And um, all the rapporteurs and the teams here are voices of the audience, and they have been part of the all discussions. So what we would like to propose, uh, these uh, seven uh, points are capturing quite well what we have discussed in the conference. But we were all very strong feeling about that this conference should not stop with just writing this document. This, this conference should start the process of us acting uh, each in our place and together. So we, uh, pro we would like to propose to spend the rest of the session to reflect on how we take these recommendations with us. What do we do with this? So we have some idea to do it and we would like to uh, uh, start with the partners for, for, to begin with. But I would like just to, 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 to see your reaction. Uh, could we uh, endorse uh, the statement as it's written and uh, uh, entrust us to pull together all which we heard and took notes in the, in the recommendation so that we could continue uh, the session with action, uh, uh, action oriented? Laura, please. Ms. Foggioni. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in regards to the set of items, real quick before we move on, um, one point that I think um, may have been omitted, and I think it came up in several areas because we continued to talk about language barriers and going to the local community, and one point in particular that came up in our working session downstairs was in regards to graphics the utilization of graphics to overcome these language barriers and um, have the graphics in both hard copies such as pamphlets, um, electronic means, or even signage. And I know we've talked about that in various forums in the WMO in our working groups. Um, and one example in particular is the color coding. Uh, UK Met and some of the other um, meteorological services are already using this type of color coding, in particular the Meteo Alarm that UK Met uses. US is trying to formalize our color coding as well, but we want to do it in a more standardized fashion. So color coding is just an example of graphics, but there may be graphics that will spur action and help people better understand the potential upcoming extreme weather if you're using pictures versus trying to uh, reach 72 different dialects with words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great that the yeah, road map, uh, road signs and color cards is something very appealing. Um, if I open the floor right now, then it would mean that we would not do what we planned. So uh, I'm struggling. We, we still have a plan to, to engage all of us in this room, okay? So we have an hour for this before, before, we, before we leave this room and open the cocktail reception. So we have a plan to listen many of you, okay? So but let us, let us now proceed with, uh, with, on, on the plan and to first of all thank all rapporteurs very warmly. And let... Let them, okay, let them please clear this place. And instead, I would like to see here our representatives of partners, which were members of the organizing committee as well. John, Salvaradru, Anatea, uh, um, Verona, uh, Lorena Aguilar, are you already here? Lorena? No, maybe she could join us later. So, Verona Colantes, UN Women, Salvaradru Ramasami, AFAO, Anatea Brooks, UNESCO, uh, and um, John Harding, UNSDR.
well, we are not very well balanced in terms of the <laughs> in terms of the concentration of us on the table. So the plan is as follows: uh, we have we have asked our partners and, and ourselves to think and to say just two three minutes, a very short uh, statement on how do we deal, how are we going to act on these recommendations and on all the outcomes of the conference, how we found it for us and what we can already now say that we would do. So we would like to uh, start this uh, discussion from the partners who were also in the orga organizing committee of the conference, but then we would, we would extend this discussion uh, to the audience. So maybe we could uh, first ask uh, who would like to speak first? <laughs> Dem democracy. Anatea. No? Okay, thank you. UNESCO, please. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with everybody involved in the organization of the conference and all the participants that I've had a chance to meet here so far. Uh, first of all, the conference strengthens the justification and the motivation to continue working on things we already are doing at UNESCO, but it also did give us one new idea that I hope will have a great impact in the future. So I've heard over and over how important girls' access to basic education and literacy is in almost every session, and in access to information through appropriate media, and those are things UNESCO has been working on for a long time. Under our second gender equality action plan, I only have four things I'm doing in the natural sciences, but they're all relevant. Continue mentoring and setting role models. You've probably heard of the UNESCO L'Oreal for Women in Science program, but you might not know that TWAS, the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, has a new um, scholarship and award program that promotes mentors called the Elsevier Foundation Awards for Early Career Women Scientists in the Developing World. So let us try to get those two to give awards to scientists who are working in meteorology and hydrology and not just medicine and physics and the basic sciences. Our second um, thing we're doing in gender right now for science is expanding networks of women in science. And uh, right now, you already heard about our UNESCO chairs on water and gender. They're actually launching next week a new course on gender mainstreaming. Third thing we're doing is assessing sex disaggregated data and creating an inventory of policy instruments that affect gender equality in science. There is brochures outside for the World Water Assessment Program. You've heard it mentioned twice, so I skip that and talk about one that I actually helped create. With UNESCO Institute of Statistics, we're doing a review of policy instruments to see which ones actually work to promote and retain women in science careers. And we're putting them into our global observatory of science technology and innovation policy instruments. The fourth and final thing that we do in our normal work is try and promote women in high level processes shaping the science agenda. And I wanted to just note that the United Nations Secretary General Science Advisory Board, which UNESCO was asked to coordinate, its first team is 46% women. Now the new thing that we're doing that came out of yesterday's session, and this has been approved by the Director General this morning, UNESCO IHE Institute for Water Education now has an official gender equality focal point. Uh, Professor Zvartinin, who was here yesterday but isn't here right now. And she, along with Anjal and Vesela in the water theme, decided to collaborate to create a short course on advanced training in gender sensitivity in water planning and management. And an online version of this could be made available for uh, water experts within the UN system, so that includes WMO, and even outside the UN system. And since we're revising our program specialist training in gender equality right now, we could incorporate it into that. Then, a more in-depth course could be uh, made to be a requirement to graduate students in water sciences, including at uh, UNESCO IHE Institute for Water Education, and then we will be building a new generation of experts who understand this and are able to act on gender differences and in inequalities in water. So. Thank you, UNESCO.
for, for it's, it's of course first reflection, but thank you, Anate, for this comment. John, UNSDR. Thank you, Elena. Let me join my colleagues in, in thanking you and, and the team in WMO for, for all the hard work going into this event. It's been a real pleasure working with you over the last few months, and it's, it's great to see the meteorological world setting the pace for inclusive and possibly events like this. It's, it's uh, very encouraging. But as you say, even with all the, the hard work that's gone into this event and, and all the substantive presentations by the participants, we know that uh, these events really serve to set the, the path looking forward, and the work really starts now. And, and uh, I've been made asked to make uh, two contributions to the, to the follow-up and the implementation of the recommendations of this conference on behalf of uh, UNISDR. And uh, so the, our first commitment is to... Uh, work with, with WMO and, and, and other partners to bring the recommendations of this conference to the, the third uh, World Conference of Disaster Risk Reduction that will take place in Sendai, Japan, it was mentioned by Mubarak a few minutes ago. And we will, we will strive to ensure that the, the future intergovernmental agreement on disaster risk reduction uh, that will be, we, we hope, endorsed in Sendai recognizes the need for a better understanding of the gendered impacts and dimensions of weather and climate services, as well as the need to increase the involvement of women and the related capacity requirements to support its follow-up. And I think the, the strong messages made today will greatly contribute to, to, to us uh, achieving this. And our second commitment uh, from, from on behalf of UNISDR, we, we work with countries and, and local authorities to strengthen their availability of uh, risk information to inform decision making and, and making better development investments. Uh, this is very, very much related to our engagement in, in, in the global framework for climate services. And based on, on the recommendations from this conference, we, we are going to revise our existing guidance and tools to, to ensure gender perspectives are better captured. This will include the work we do with countries to develop disaster loss databases, for example, which are now available in 85 countries, and of course the related risk assessments. It's actually a concern for us that, that actually very few countries you are working with currently actually collect this data in a gender disaggregated manner. And as we heard during the last two days, it's, it's, these are essential elements to ensure that we have, for example, uh, effective early warning systems or, or, or effective sectoral investments that reduce future risk in a gender equitable manner. So we look forward to working with, uh, uh, well, first of all, we'll, we look forward to reporting back on these commitments at, at the next meeting, but we also look forward to engaging with all the partners that we've been working with so far and, and the participants in the meeting uh, moving ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Now I would like to turn to Verona Colantes, UN Woman. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, WMO. I think uh, this is really a very great, great opportunity to discuss the linkages between uh, gender equality and women's empowerment, uh, women's rights, uh, with the thematic areas that that um, we've discussed for the three, uh, past three days. And for me, it was really very enlightening. And it's uh, also um, uh, just so the substantive knowledge coming from the experts uh, listening to the interlinkages. Because while uh, UN Women works on advancing gender equality, we need the technical expertise of the, all of you who are present here to help us also advance our work further. Um, just before I uh, um, work, uh, I, I, I discuss uh, our commitments as UN Women, I just want to highlight uh, some of my key takeaways from the conference, having listened to your discussions, to the discussions here. Um, one is, one very, very strong message was to look at women uh, and their agency, and I think, uh, not, uh, and their agency, not their vulnerabilities. I think that's a very strong message, and and um, and it's a powerful message because I think we have to uh, give due recognition 
to the role of women as contributors, as sources of knowledge, of solutions, as decision makers, as resource owners, as leaders in every walks of life and in, in all the, their roles. So that's one uh, big takeaway for me. Um, the other one is the importance of research and accountability, and it has been mentioned. Uh, all of the panels that I've heard uh, identified this as one of, of the key areas, uh, and they have to be gender responsive. And uh, one last point, um, that I was listening to the in interventions, and um, I, I was struck by several interventions about uh, where are the men? Why are we just talking about women? Uh, men have a role too, and indeed men have a role. And I really, I, it's great to hear it from the men themselves who were here. And um, I, I would just like to make an advertisement. Uh, as you know, UN Women has launched this He for She campaign. Uh, it's called a he for she, but it's actually, well, it's a solidarity between men and women. It's not men doing something for women, because I think that's, there's, there's um, uh, some kind of controversy there. But please, uh, men who are here and women who know men, uh, go to www.heforshe.org, and you can see how you can engage men and how men can contribute. So. Um, I think I will, I, uh, th that those are my key takeaways. So in terms of the concrete ways for UN women to use the findings of the conference, uh, particularly the outcome statement to further uh, gender equality, uh, this is just really giving us um, the substantive backing to continue our work in the intergovernmental processes that we follow, uh, we, we actively engage in SDGs, um, the post-2015 development agenda. We have the commission, the status of women, which UN Women is servicing. We participate in the ECOSOC, the General Assembly. So all of these um, are entry points to bring in the substantive contributions that this, this forum, uh, this conference has made. So that's uh, one of our key commitments. Uh, of course, uh, we also have our policy and programs. Um, and again, uh, we will, I will bring with me um, when that, the, the report has been prepared. This is, again, going to serve as a substantive base for us to um, develop, further develop our key messages, what our priorities should be at the country level, and this will help resource mobilization which uh, then will also help us to further uh, uh, contribute in bringing women's voices. We have brought a number of uh, youth participants here, and I think they've contributed very um, substantively. Uh, the last point that I want to mention is uh, this, the, the conference outcomes and your messages here also strengthens UN women's coordination role within the UN system in mainstreaming gender uh, in uh, the UN system's work. And I mean, this is a great, uh, I think uh, Elena and her gender focal point team will have a um, top score on oh. the UN swap <laughs> for, for, for this alone. And of course, um, I encourage uh, um, not only the UN agencies who are here, but also um, all partners to not stop here but to um, go forward with the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verona. We will, we will live up to the, your expectation, I'm sure. Salvaraju Ramasami, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so first of all, we are happy to be part of this important uh, conference on gender dimensions and climate services. And FAO uh, thanks all partners and participants uh, for providing us uh, concrete recommendations from the conference. Um, we, uh, from the broader sense, we clearly understand that uh, the greater proportion of women are exposed than men to impacts of climate variability and uh, climate change, simply because of the fact that more women or more proportion of the women are engaged in agriculture and allied sectors, 
and they comprise significant uh, agricultural labor force in many countries, in many developing countries. This proportion is more than 60 percent in many developing countries. Uh, on, the, on the vulnerability side, women are more vulnerable, as uh, we all uh, know very clearly, uh, to the effects of uh, climate change than men, primarily as they constitute the majority of the world's poor and are more uh, dependent for their livelihood on natural resources uh, that are threatened by both climate variability and climate change. Coming to the access to the resources, access to productive resources such as land, modern inputs, technology, education, and financial services is a critical determinant for agriculture productivity enhancement. But access to all these important resources by women is weak in many ways. Similarly, access to agricultural extension services and weather and climate information services to women is low due to lack of access to technology and also to some extent cultural reasons, among others. Uh, coming to hunger, uh, hunger, uh, the unusual, uh, unequal access and control of uh, resources uh, causes global hunger. The yield gap between men and women averages around 20 to 30 percent and the gap is due to differences in access to resources as well as access to information and its use in agriculture sector. Increasing production by this amount, this 20 to 30 percent, could reduce the number of undernourished people in the world in the order of 12 to 17 percent. Uh, that is a big number in terms of, you know, uh, the closing the gender gap in agriculture yields and uh, bring the number of under, undernourished population down by as much as 100 to 150 million. So that's a big number compared to the total undernourished population, which is about currently about 842 million. So it's a big number. So already, if we address these issues, focus more on the gender aspects so we can reduce the number at least by 17 to 20%. From the FAO's part, FAO supports to member countries to strengthen climate and agriculture information services for women and men recognizes five major uh, thematic areas. The one is just I would like to list out where we try to integrate uh, these recommendations into our work. Monitoring data, tools, and methods for climate risk management. Managing risks of climate variability and climate change, which includes impact assessment and also looking at the vulnerability pattern that women face. Managing food systems and its resources. Advancing payment for environment services and risk transfer mechanisms and contributing to food security information and emergency response related activities. So these are all uh, the five major actions that uh, has a clear, uh, the climate information or weather and climate information services has a clear role to play. We have already integrated gender dimensions into these thematic areas. Building on that, we strongly feel that the recommendations from the conference will further add value to our work. We look forward to uh, your active uh, partnership and collaboration to bridge the gender gap in agriculture and food security and commit ourselves to take up the zero hunger challenge, uh, which seeks to eradicate hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition worldwide. We once again thank you all uh, for supporting us by giving this uh, key and crucial recommendations that would be useful for our work. Thank you. Many thanks, Salvarajo. We will, we will try our best. Elena Villalobos, World Health Organization. So I will just make a brief uh, intervention. I didn't prepare anything uh, very formal. I just wanted to first of all thank uh, the organizers for this great conference. I saw all the work that was behind and I think the result is uh, very good. So thanks and congratulations. I think from WHO we back up 
all the recommendations and uh, for sure in the, at the operational level, we're already working on, on gender and climate change. But as uh, I briefly explained in the intervention in which I participated, one of the main challenges from the health sector is the generation of data. So I think that from our side, we will focus mainly now on trying to get more uh, sex, disaggregated, uh, sex disaggregated data and more information and understanding on which are the impacts, the, the gender differentials of the health impacts. Um, to do so, we have already developed a gender uh, toolkit and then we will include it and make sure that we use it in the, when we conduct vulnerability and adaptation assessments and we, when we do health impact assessments. But at the policy level, I think we have an opportunity now that the main stakeholders and the main climate sensitive sectors are here. So I think we should try to focus on some concrete joint actions that we could do together so to try to get a real impact. I think the first thing to, to do is to link it to the overall UNFCCC process and then to make a statement to the UNFCCC. Uh, I've seen some of the negotiators that, and I'm sure you can help us to find the right way to make sure that this uh, statement is uh, going to the right uh, way in the UNFCCC. And in addition to that, I think, for example, most of the agencies we are working now with the countries to support them to do the national adaptation plans. So we have an opportunity there to make sure that their national adaptation plans, for example, the health component of the national adaptation plan, the disaster risk reduction, agriculture, whatever, and that the overall national adaptation plans at country level recognize this and gender is included within those. Because if we continue to work as we do normally in isolation, the impact is going to be lower. Um, the same with the, with the national communications of the UNFCCC. I think we have an entry point there to make sure that countries are taking into consideration these, um, these recommendations. So I think that's all uh, from my side, and I thank you once again. So thank you, World Health Organization, very much. On the side of WMO, I also need to, to make just a few points right now. Of course, we are very excited with the conference, and we have wealth of ideas in our hands. Uh, just to highlight a few which are most obvious and come, come up from first. Uh, next week we will have Intergovernmental Board and Climate Services. So one of the clients of this conference or one of the, uh, one of the approaches where these recommendations would be implemented is the Global Framework of Climate Services. So it's already an agenda and the presentation will be made and hopefully mainstream quite well in the implementation plan. Uh, we, already, we already think how we engage more our technical commissions and regional associations. The most specific recommendation on the regional associations' involvement, I can tell you that each of our bodies do have resolution on gender mainstreaming, and most of them have focal points. But these recommendations of this conference would really show them the way forward. Uh, I, I see them very helpful in, in, in now bringing this agenda back again uh, to their operational work. We would uh, also uh, promote women in meteorology and role models. Uh, this website we started would be now enriched with information we collected, and it will continue to live. Um, the, I think that the most important thing is to promote it in the day-to-day -day work. And uh, we are very glad that uh, this conference actually involved directly, I would say, more than the 40, more than 40 or 40, 50 professional staff from all departments of WMO. Well, uh, they all contributed to setting this con conference, and this is already in the mindset of people who are uh, uh, supporters of all the programs and projects, uh, let alone the regional training centers and universities with whom we participate already start doing curriculum for women. Uh, we would like to go, go forward and to, to think of the Women Fellowship Award, uh, and some recommendations was from Wilma. Uh, we would like to, to see the gender uh, aspects or gender, com, mm, gender, uh, uh, yeah, gender aspects in the projects which we implement and those which we will set. Uh, national level, national med services, we will hear a little uh, in, a li in a moment from representatives of the national med service, but what I think WMO should do is to, is to start preparing the guidelines or a guide for national med services, how to deal with all that. So this guide, guide would probably be a very, very helpful tool. 
I also think that we should ask IPCC to to commit to to uh, prepare the special report on the gender and climate change. And my last point is uh, we will have World Meteorological Congress, it's the General Assembly of WMO next year, and uh, we, are, we are thinking and planning to have a gender day there. So that's just a few reflections of, for this moment. Uh, thank you very much. Now I would like to ask three other speakers just also in the one, two, three minutes to say how they take it with them. Uh, it's also members of the International Organizing Committee. It was a mix of uh, partners, organizations, and our governance. Uh, I would like, I have a three, three names in, in, in mind, and I would like to start, if you don't mind, with Xiao Meiyan, who is Deputy, uh, direct, Deputy Administrator of China Meteorological Organization. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my honor to be part of the uh, IST and uh, working with other IST members to develop this uh, concept and program of this conference. And uh, I should say the conference is a great event that make difference and bring about change. I offer my full support to the, this uh, outcome of the conference uh, statement. As a, uh, here, I firstly uh, to emphasize the uh, importance of the enhancing the capacity of uh, MHS to provide gender sensitive weather and the climate service. Uh, we must realize that uh, a talk about gender perspective in weather and the climate service is still narrow uh, casting in the materials community. So therefore, when I back a China, I will try my best to give the uh, widest uh, public, uh, public city to the views and the proposals that come out of the conference. I really hope that by putting the essence of the conference outcome into concrete actions that fit China's circumstance, our service will become more capable of uh, mainstreaming uh, gender perspective in our routine meteorological service and the DR service. Thus, our service will become more open and uh, inclusive. Secondly, I uh, want to mention here is that China Meteorological Service has established good interagency collaboration with over uh, 20 ministries and the government bodies who represented the major and the users uh, of the major and the users of the weather and the climate service. I believe this interagency uh, collaboration platform. Uh, should be fully used by us to promote the impo importance of gender perspective to collect the gender disagree uh, age data on user needs and uh, to develop a gender specific uh, service. My third point here is I know that w uh, WMO has already inclu uh, included gender issues in the gender uh, in, in the agenda of most of its co uh, constituent bodies from the Congress, the ex uh, ex ex Executive Council from the uh, Technical Commission to Regional uh, Association. So I'm uh, uh, responsible for gender uh, mainstream as a uh, management group of uh, WMO CBS. I hope that in the coming years, I would take the chance of every possible uh, occasion to exchange with my colleagues on the progress and the experience obtained in the practical implementation of this gender conference outcome. Thank you. Many thanks indeed. Maybe I can now request Ms. Fujioni, permanent representative of United States of America. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the steering committee for pulling the conference together. The U.S. delegation have been honored to participate in the Third Gender Conference on Weather, Water, and Climate Services. We've thoroughly benefited from the preparation and the discussion over the last three days. Um, I do have five points and points of action that we plan to take home. And uh, when I thought about the five points, you could then translate that into the graphic that I used in my presentation of to we can do it. So the, the first point, and just a little bit of background on the point, whether water and climate data can be useful for understanding the health impacts of climate change. Closer collaboration between the meteorological and the medical public health disciplines is required for the benefit of society, as was mentioned. So our action is to work closely with the joint WMO-WHO office, connecting weather, climate, and health expertise to better understand how the integration of the data and tools support our shared missions of protecting life. We want to capitalize on those synergies across the joint office. That's one action. The second action, a little bit of background, I was recently elected as the to be a member of the American Meteorological Society's Executive Council. That's the U.S. Pro Professional Society for Meteorologists. My platform will be to foster consistent environmental information and messaging across the weather enterprise. Within that organization sits the AMS Board of Women and Minorities, whose primary goal is to support the inclusion of women, minorities, and persons with disabilities in the fields of atmospheric science. So with that background, we then want to develop a more diverse partnerships that result in consistent outreach and messaging to vulnerable and underserved communities. My office within the National Weather Service of Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management will play a key role in advancing the priorities of the Board on Women and Minorities. The third point. It's a fact that women are significantly underrepresented in the sciences and in the U.S. National Weather Service workforce. So our action is to develop recruitment and retention goals targeted to increasing the representation of women in our workforce. This could include expanding our outreach to scientific organizations, academic institutions with the significant enrollment of women in the STEM fields. And I think that ties in directly to one of uh, the seven uh, points within our statement from this meeting. The fourth is uh, we recognize that society is best served when we understand how people receive and interpret our products and services, and we've made the best use of social science methodologies We've made that uh, a priority across our organization as per my, per my presentation yesterday. So we want to continue to add a gender focus to social science efforts, initiatives, activities, and projects. For example, after extreme weather events, we often will go out in the field and conduct service assessments. And within those service assessments, we want to include an analysis that will explore the implications of gender on perception and response to weather and climate information. And finally, the fifth one, and maybe something, uh, something that I took from our working session yesterday and was reemphasized today, according to Gib Bullock, the director of the Global Management Accenture Development Partners, this morning he said 300 million less women than men have mobile phones. However, companies, including our Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, are investing in the development of weather and climate apps that these women will not be able to access. So our action is to share what we've learned at this conference, raise the awareness of the lack of access for hundreds of millions of women that will, have, that will not have access to these apps that they are developing. We will work with our partners to facilitate the development of mechanisms that will lessen these gender imbalances. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to ask also Dr. Makulini, Linda Makulini, permanent representative of South Africa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, program director. I think uh, for, for, for me, uh, for uh, the take home, 
Uh, number one, one of the issues that, has been, uh, that have been raised is around the collaboration at an international level, regional level, and also at the national level. Uh, I think um, we need then, from the seven points that have been raised, uh, probably to sit down um, as part of the WMO and uh, the WHO, FAO, and um, I'm putting more emphasis on IOE as well, uh, specifically for also for agriculture, that uh, we need to sit around the table and see what needs to be done to come up uh, with uh, um, initiatives that will influence research institutions, not only um, at, uh, on at science, also um, business schools to look at coming up with, re with research on how we can come up with uh, 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 what is needed in terms of developing gender sensitive products and services. Because we also talked about social economic issues, but we tend to focus a lot on, on science based research institutions, but forget about uh, business schools that, so that we can also look at that area. The other area that I think is important, we spoke about uh, the indigenous knowledge. Um, which is also an important area. And we also uh, talked about STEM in terms of empowering women. I think um, at a national level, from our side, I would like to have a dialogue between the Department of Science and Technology, uh, Department of Arts and Culture, and some of the key uh, departments like agriculture and the Department of Environment where we can sit and say what kind of platforms do we need to put in place to attract a, a dialogue uh, with the end, use, end users, whether it's the communities, and also what kind of research work that can be done uh, to using the indigenous knowledge and also addressing the barriers when it comes to culture in addressing issues of gender and, and balance. And in totality, coming up with ways of looking at climate change moving forward. The other area that I think is important for us that was raised by um, one of the members that we tend to have these conferences and some discussions, but we don't have feedback mechanism. We also do not monitor um, what we say we're going to be doing. We've got policies, we've got frameworks, but we don't have ways of monitoring and evaluating. And I think one of the challenges that maybe we do have is that we tend to use different performance indicators trying to measure um, the same idea that we all have. So I think uh, for me is to go back and challenge research institutions to look at uh, indicators that really would link issues around gen gender sensitivity and also economic development and, and, and also growth. And lastly, in terms of uh, collaboration, I think uh, the Global Framework for Climate Services is a platform and a tool that we, we need to continuously use. We've got a window of another uh, six years to make sure that we learn a lot and come up with uh, applications that are useful. Uh, as you know that South Africa, we also had a workshop um, looking at how we can develop our own uh, national framework. And we agreed we have a roadmap. We agreed the first thing that we need to do is to have a steering committee. Although the issue of gender, we talked about it really, but I think it will be important that in that steering committee, we also factor in people who will also assist us as implementers in looking at how we can service and come up with gender uh, specific and sensitive uh, services and, and also knowledge. Thank you. Many thanks indeed. While you spoke, uh, we have been joined by our last member of the committee who is able to say in a two words in two minutes. Uh, this is Lorena Aguilar. Uh, she was also a member of the committee and she represents International Conservation Union, ICN. Lorena. Uh, thank you very much and sorry for being late. Um, 
IUCN commitment, we have, it will be at two levels, one at the international level and the other one at the national level. There are only 14 months left to a new climate change framework agreement. And um, our commitment is to take this conference statement as of Monday, we're starting a process to build the capacity of all the negotiators that are going to be in the climate change uh, decision fora for the next 14 months to bring to their considerations what has come out from this uh, conference. So that is one of our uh, commitments. We have a group of women delegates in which we're going to inform them. This is also with UN Women and some other people that are here in the table to move that forward. And our second commitment is to take this at the national level. We are already working with various countries in the world to develop gender responsive climate change strategies and we will bring uh, the elements that we're taking out of this conference and the demands and requests done by this conference to be fully integrated into the new uh, gender responsive climate change uh, strategies in various countries of the world. So that is our commitment. Lauren, thank you very much indeed. We really benefited from your, uh, your contribution to the committee and the conference. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this concludes talking. We have half an hour before formal closure, but uh, we, may, we may spend a little more time, uh, just a little more. So the proposal is as follows. Each of us here going home should become ambassador and agent of change. Each of us can make a lot to implement these recommendations. We would like us to right now turn around and to speak with two, three colleagues around you for five, <laughs> just 10 minutes, and to say what that meant for you, what you are taking home. And after this, we would see if we have time, and I think we have, we would listen as many as we can, uh, one, two ideas, what it is the main thing you have learned and how you can make the difference, okay? So we will help, we will come, turn around. 10 minutes, time started.
ok? <risos> They're happy. They don't want to stop. <laughs> Dear friends and colleagues. Dear colleagues. <laughs> My bell is not loud enough. Maybe I should sing those evening bells. Those evening bells. <laughs> Как много дум наводит он. It's a mixture of Russian and English. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. So, before uh, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. I see the discussion was ve very interesting. Uh, I, and I saw Mr. Jaro moving in my direction and here to join us on the point. Mr. Jaro, please come here. Yes. How? He was, he, he just disappeared halfway. <laughs> and um, so what we would like to do right now, when you see these two ladies standing on the lecture, you probably can sense that they are standing there not in vain. There is a purpose. <laughs> so the purpose is that to challenge you even more. We would like to start with 10 people, stand up and go and line up to, to each lecture. And we would give you one minute to say, who are you? Which organization you came? One significant action you will take with you? Why it is? And which partners you need? Or anything? So only one thing. Okay? Who is, uh, who is very courageous? Stand up. Okay? First five left, first five right. We will alter. Okay? Good, good. Yo, you're already there. Stay there. No. <laughs> Stay there. Um, we still have interpretation in French and Spanish. So if you are francophone, vous, vous, vous pouvez parler français, mesdames, messieurs. Vous pouvez utiliser votre langue. Quelqu'un d'autre? Oh. So the boat, okay, the, the boat, the boarding is completed. We go. So I will, I will try to use timer. Maybe you can use timer, you, you too. I will try to use timer one minute. And in one minute, I will give a little, only little bell, okay? So, see the action. please go ahead. My name is Andy Vastulevu, and my organization is Family Pacific and supported by UN Women and also Trans and Oceania. And my action going back from here is to enhance communication and fill in the gaps in this area from indigenous ways, styles, approaches in communication and build that capacity. And although in the Pacific there is adaptation and mitigation going on, there are gaps, there are still working progress and this conference has really built that capacity for me and empowered me to go back and implement this and enhance our community media, and Women's Weather Watch, SMS, and correcting, giving back feedback to Met Office to give accurate and consistent weather um, information. Wonderful. How much can be said in one minute, and even less than one minute? Amos. Oh, sorry. Then you manage. I will be only the, the bell, okay? Yeah. Dr. Samelin, the peer of Madagascar, from Madagascar. Uh, I am proud to be a woman. I agree with all, uh, most of the recommendations, and uh, I invite uh, the, uh, most uh, of my colleagues to agree with me uh, about it. And uh, I hope that uh, together we can do it. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Amos Makarao, I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm going to organize a workshop for women in Zimbabwe um, so that uh, we mainstream climate, uh, uh, policy, uh, gender policy into the, um, uh, into the uh, uh, national climate policy for Zimbabwe. This will involve not only women's organizations, civil society, but the communities themselves as well as government. Thank you. My name is Kusuma Tukorelev. I'm from Sri Lanka, and I'm the chair of the Network of Women Water Professionals, Netwater, and the Global Water Partnerships uh, partner organization, Sri Lanka Water Partnership. I've been traveling for almost 14 days. After I left, I saw the disaster which happened, the landslide which struck our country. With high intensity rains, we have more and more of this issue. But the community didn't get the warning in time. So there are areas which are defined and un clearly defined as being disaster prone. So I would like to set up uh, community rain gauges and train people who would then be able to monitor that red line when 100 millimeters come. You have to take it seriously, you have to go. And in that I would be working with the Global Water Partnership, the Disaster Management Center of Sri Lanka, and also the Department of Meteorological, the Met Department. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tata Supan from Agribusiness Botswana. The one action I will take from here is uh, in, engage, collect the women in my community and help them know that they can go forward in, in partner, partnering with the organizations that actually want to um, assist. The purpose of that action is that um, what I've heard from this is that um, feedback and partnerships uh, take a lot in getting the, the required impact, so that's what I will do. And the partners that I will engage are obviously the, the, the department, the MET service, and the Department of Agriculture, as well as uh, the, women, the, the leaders in the communities. Thank you. My name is Lesha Whitmer, and I make two commitments. One, as an expert, as part of the WAP um, working group on gender desegregated data that we will do a recheck to see if the recommendations from this conference are actually reflected in the current draft. The second is with another hat on, I'm the coordinator of the butterfly effect for the citizens forum in the seventh World Water Forum in Korea. And that event was not on your list yet, but I think it's very important to bring the outcomes of this, especially in the theme on water and climate change. And I'm sure that your neighbor, who is the current chair of UN Water, will help me with doing that. Je m'appelle Madame Gurel Bailey, Toine Odette Elizabeth. Je suis la présidente de l'Organisation Nationale des Femmes Rurales Fleurs de Centrafrique. Euh, en retournant au pays, euh, nous allons mettre en place avec euh, la représentante de météo météorologie qui est là dans la salle et avec elle, nous allons mettre en place une plateforme pour aider les femmes rurales et introduire aussi les étudiantes en agronomie pour qu'ils puissent s'intéresser aussi à, à la météorologie. Donc, nous allons euh, impliquer tout le monde Euh, les services de météorologie, l'agriculture et les, les femmes paysannes aussi. Donc nous allons mettre cette plateforme en, en place pour que nous puissions travailler ensemble pour euh, faire une adaptation par rapport au changement climatique. Mais nous demandons à, aux partenaires qui sont, en tête, euh, qui sont dans la salle, par exemple l'UNESCO ou euh, d'autres partenaires, pour nous appuyer. Merci. Je me nomme Bayazitoun, je viens d'Algérie où je préside l'association nationale Femmes et Développement Rural. Alors je suis en même temps, enfin je suis une militante féministe, je suis présidente du comité national de suivi de la CEDO et je suis aussi membre du comité consultatif de la société civile au, à l'ONU Femmes à Alger. Alors à ce titre, je me sens l'obligation, le devoir premièrement de restituer les travaux de tout ce qui s'est fait ici, notamment les recommandations issues de cette conférence. Alors, à qui 
d'abord au sein de mon association, mais aussi et surtout à deux femmes ministres qui sont très importantes à mes yeux, à savoir la ministre de l'Environnement et la ministre de la, de la Solidarité Nationale, de la, de la Famille et de la Femme. Pourquoi Parce que, pour être franche, la dimension genre dans la météorologie dans mon pays, à ma connaissance, n'est pas prise en compte. Alors c'est peut-être l'occasion de sensibiliser à cette question qui est extrêmement importante et qu'aujourd'hui, je, je ne découvre pas, mais je m'aperçois qu'il y a beaucoup de pays qui travaillent dans ce domaine et euh, qu'il est temps que ce, le volet météorologie soit pris en compte dans notre pays. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Julie KJ from Nigeria Meteorological Agency. Um, one significant action I would like to take away or lesson from here is the uh, issue of uh, survival costs. I heard that from the PR of the US, and I think it's very, very significant on the issue of violence and climate change, which I'm not really pleased that was not reflected in our outcome or recommendations. Because um, women are actually the ones that suffer most during the case issue of uh, violence. So I would like to, when I get back home, talk to my PR and see how we can strengthen our preparedness against violence, climate-related violence and other violences. And in addition, What I also want to do is lessen the number of jargons we put in our seasonal rainfall predictions. And then I would like, like to engage the media in that regard so that they can help us do the communication with graphical, something that will be so catchy and catch the attention of the junior ones because we have to start catching them younger, and, uh, the, the lady, the boy and the girl child. So they will have interest in meteorology because when you make it, like the question we had today, he asked uh, one of the panelists that, have you ever had a meteorologist as a star? That is a known star. So we need to have put some glamour in our profession to also attract people. And um, I mentioned the partners and stakeholders. And I do hope that I will also get cooperation from WMO. Thank you. I'd like to extend my thanks to the WMO for such a powerful conference and allowing us all to participate. My name is Diane Johnston from the Meteorological Service of Canada, and I have uh, two comments for consideration. And uh, one of them, well, they both relate to the objectives of the conference. Uh, one of them was the, uh, the objective to propose concrete actions, and I have to say, I'm in extremely encouraged by the summary that we saw today with the recommendations, the actions, et cetera, but I can't stress enough that having seen those common threads across the multiple themes over the last three days, we really have to get into expanding on the how we get there. So we've seen you know, the actions, we've seen the recommendations. I think it's incumbent on all of us to uh, express the how we get there, the targets and the timelines. Secondly, for consideration is the um, objective on showcasing good practices. And although there were a lot of issues, challenges, barriers presented, we didn't hear a lot about um, the good practices. And I just want to say that I'm very, very proud that my, um, the head of my meteorological service is the president of our WMO. And uh, he would be extremely proud, as I am, to just say to you that we have very proudly, you know, put targets for uh, women in meteorology, in physical sciences, and we've exceeded those targets. So um, I want to just report a good news story to every one of you, and hopefully that will encourage people to set those targets and to leverage things like International Women's Day and use those as opportunities to celebrate what we have done already and to just focus on the, uh, the positive too. Thank you. Uh, my name is Agnes Kijasi from Tanzania Metrological Agents. Uh, one significant action that I will take when I go back, we have a three years strategy in, in our agents, and it is uh, reviewed after every three years. So I'll make sure that that strategy is uh, incorporating gender issues 
I mean gender mainstreaming in that uh, three years strategy. And every time we review it, I'll make sure that we see the progress and how we can incorporate the gaps. Uh, the purpose of this uh, action or the goal of this is to ensure the increase of women, participation of women in climate and uh, weather services in, the, in our agents. I understand by incorporating gender in that strategy, it is having so many activities ranging from staff of the agents and also the user of climate services. So by incorporating that gender in that strategy, I will ensure that we include more stakeholders who are women in, a, in our climate services. And looking at the last part where we is talking about the partners and the stakeholders that uh, uh, I'm going to work with, uh, all sectors that are climate sensitive in the country, I will ensure that I work with them during the review of that strategy to ensure that their need is incorporated in the strategy and it is going to be implemented. After that, the, we are going to have a, an implementation plan which we are going also to work with all these partners to ensure that during implementation, we touch all sectors in the country that are climate sensitive, but without forgetting the universities, because we want to also to enhance research, and the research is also part of that strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Anubha Kaushik. Uh, I'm from a university in Delhi, India. Basically, I'm an environmental scientist. And uh, one very significant action that I think we should take is that the research that we are doing at the university level, it should be made available in very simple language for the utility and uh, assistance to the local community. Ours is a very old civilization and there is a lot of traditional knowledge available there. But in the wake of the climate change, there needs to be some more integration of the modern research and the modern knowledge with that. So I intend to develop a sort of a synergistic model so that this type of the scientific information could be disseminated to the community for the welfare of all. Thank you so much. Bonjour, je me nomme Péa Nicole Steli, présidente de l'Organisation des femmes météorologistes et hydrologistes et des sciences connexes de la République centrafricaine. En ce qui concerne les actions concrètes à mener, à mon retour, j'aimerais organiser une rencontre pluridisciplinaire avec euh, tous les partenaires, ceux de l'université et des professionnels qui constituent cette organisation, afin que pour les professionnels en météorologie et hydrologie qui sont dans cette organisation, que nous puissions traduire en un, un langage simple nos connaissances techniques et professionnelles au profit de ceux qui sont dans les arrière pays. Et en ce qui concerne ceux qui sont de l'université avec qui on va collaborer ensemble, nous allons lancer une une large campagne de sensibilisation afin de faire la promotion du genre dans les domaines des sciences, de la physique, de la, des mathématiques, pour pouvoir donner la possibilité à plus de filles de pouvoir opter pour des carrières scientifiques. Je vous remercie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Chumak, and I'm from Ross Hydromet. And on behalf of our all Russian speaking group, I want to thank all the organizers of this fruitful work. So thank you. And uh, well, actually, the thing I've noticed that most of us are studying climate, atmosphere, and at the same time, we are creating atmosphere in this hall, and our atmosphere is warm, not due to greenhouse effect. So thank you all for your work and for your smiles. One significant action, well actually it's not the only one, which I will personally take is that we mustn't 
concentrate on our personal workplace, but look at the problems more widely and more deep, so to understand uh, what is happening around the world, especially in social studies, in meteorological studies we were speaking about. So we will continue this fruitful work with WMO, the UN structures, and uh, thank you once more. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, my name is Vilma Castro, and I am a retired fac faculty from the University of Costa Rica. Um, after this meeting, um, I feel more encouraged to continue uh, trying to create outreach courses at the University of Costa Rica to reach every level of uh, people who need training, people who are not enrolled at the university, just people who need who did uh, training in any subject, climate, climate change, uh, just meteorological instruments or dynamical meteorology. Um, and moreover, I am going to tr try to push uh, distance learning methods so people who cannot leave home can have access to this education. That's my commitment. Actually, I'm so enthusiastic to talk about uh, more than one action, <laughs> but I will, <coughs> I will talk uh, very quickly. Uh, I'm so enthusiastic to, because the Lebanon is, uh, had the intention and uh, get approved by the Union for Mediterranean, Mediterranean for building a regional uh, center of training and information. And I will integrate the gender issue in this because it will contain both uh, dealing about information and training. Another thing that uh, the draft law for water user association, I will, we will take it back and make sure that the uh, gender issue is in Involved because the Water User Association is very important. Every year, uh, the universities uh, come to the, universe, uh, to, to the ministry because they have researchers. I will encourage the, the students to uh, take part uh, of the uh, water and the climate uh, service, have uh, research and roles uh, uh, in the future. The last thing uh, that uh, uh, for the uh, I will push the politicians because we keep uh, uh, meeting with them uh, uh, twice or th three times uh, in the year because if we don't have the support of the politicians, we can't do anything. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tracy Kajumba. I work with the ACRA, ACRA not Ghana, but Africa Climate Change Resilience Alliance, which is a consortium of World Vision, K International, Oxfam, Save the Children, and Overseas Development Institutes. And we work in Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Uganda, and I'm based in Uganda. So this conference for me was very important because we are almost doing what we are discussing here. We have a partnership with the Uganda National Meteorology Authority. We support the development of advisories after the forecasts have been produced. We translate them in local languages, and we do the dissemination, and we already have the agenda component in it. We have documented the model. We have some books outside. Some of you have got them already. But what is important for me is that in this, we are discussing looking at different sectors, water, agriculture, blah, blah, blah. So we have documented everything, yes. <laughs> but how do we bring all these sectors together? So what is important now is that we are going to work with the, the existing structures, like the disaster management committees, which are looking at all areas, so that they are using this information for early warning in health, in agriculture, in education, and all sectors. But then the other thing is documenting the impact at community level. Because we're at these levels, we are talking of maybe WMO establishing a, a, a magazine or bulletin or whatever. We need to get the community voices to reach the national, regional, and global levels so that whatever decision we are doing is informed by the experiences of the communities. Thank you. All right. We heard a lot, and again, a lot of good ideas. 
Before we finally close, uh, Secretary General of WMO is here. He, he has um, remarks to make at the closing. Thank you. It will not take very long. All keen to, to go back home. But listening to, to the interventions, I wanted to make a few remarks. I'm coming from uh, my language, uh, my mother tongue, which is also my father tongue, if we want to be. <laughs> Every noun has a gender. And it is very interesting that uh, we discussed the gender of the names of hurricanes and cyclones earlier. Actually, what is very interesting is that the gender of most of the issues we are dealing with is feminine. The planet is feminine, the earth is feminine, the atmosphere is feminine, the water is feminine. And that's very interesting. Uh, so that's maybe a little question for, for you to reflect. And, um, but I think it may tell us, uh, it may tell us uh, something interesting. What I wanted to say is really to, um, uh, to thank all of you, because I'm always very impressed when after 5 p.m. on the last day of a conference, which is a Friday, the room is full. It's telling us something about your dedication, about the, uh, your passion and the importance of this, uh, of this subject. I was very impressed by uh, the spirit of the discussion, the constructive, the, uh, most of us, most of you, everyone trying to get out of our traditional box. And I'm very grateful for that, for all our partners who came, not only from our community. By the way, in my language, community is also feminine. In, <laughs> it's, it's coming from all our, all our partners and, uh, and try to think beyond the traditional mandate. You, you, you could see none of us was fighting for their own organization, for their own turf, but for the bigger picture. How can we address this, uh, this uh, bigger issue? And uh, for that, I'm also very, very encouraged by the outcome of this uh, conference. Now, let me be very provocative. S many people said we need to monitor what would be criteria of success. For me, the ultimate criteria for success is if in a few years from now, 10 years, 15 years, this conference becomes irrelevant. We don't need a conference because the problem is solved. That should be our ultimate goal, that gender equality, all the gender aspects are taken so well into account that ultimately we don't need to, to address the problem because the problem is gone. We are far from that. So, of course, there's still a long way. I believe we shall need uh, uh, probably another, another conference. But let's aim to the ultimate goal, which is to, uh, to achieve, um, to achieve full, uh, full success. Um, I just want to, to mention one thing in terms of cross-cutting issue. Um, and I mentioned many partners, but there's one which I would like to highlight because it was set up precisely to advance this goal for which we have met uh, all of us during these last three days, and that's UN Women. And UN Women was set up exactly for that in the UN system to promote that, to ensure that there is significant uh, progress on these things. The CB, the Chief Executive Board of the UN, will meet in a few uh, weeks from now. And, uh, and I'm, sh I'm sure because the gender uh, mainstreaming issue is always a very important issue, and I'm very grateful that this conference can definitely contribute to, uh, to that uh, progress. So, Elena, just uh, mention what uh, will be done on the uh, WMO side. Uh, she mentioned also the uh, IBCS meeting next week. Actually, we may consider talking about UN Women, getting UN Women as a member of the PAC, the Partner Advisory Committee, and that would ensure mainstreaming of that in the climate issue. By the way, this is done, in the, since some people mentioned I was also chairing UN Water, this is done in the water issue. It is already mainstreamed through this uh, participation. So, uh, f let me, uh, in conclusion, thank all of you uh, once again 
uh, let's make sure that we all deliver on the pledges, on the commitment on our side. Uh, the first uh, checkpoint will be definitely uh, Congress uh, next next year. And uh, on a very positive note, I don't know whether it's related to the conference or not, while we were meeting here, there were uh, two new women who became directors of med services in Africa. Now, <laughs> which means that Africa now is the WMO region where there is the biggest number of uh, women directors. Several of them are here. <laughs> And of course, I want to congratulate Africa, but that's what, not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say it should be the objective for the other regions to, to emulate, so that it's not only in Africa, it is in all, uh, in, in all regions. So, thank you. Bon voyage. Uh, bon voyage à toutes et à tous. Et puis, on espère uh, uh, que beaucoup d'entre vous, que de plus en plus d'entre vous participeront à toutes ces réunions importantes et à cet objectif commun. Merci. And on my side, I would like us to, to share, uh, join me to thank the uh, conference organizing team, Asa and Bonnie and Derezita and uh, Robin. Thank you. Join me to thank all the colleagues of WMO and our partner organizations who, who organize this conference. I have really more than 60 names. I will not read them. Thank you very much. All speakers, all moderators, all rapporteurs, all participants, you are all thanked and invited to the cocktail right now. Thank you. Well done.